good afternoon afternoon dr maninder yes good afternoon good afternoon good afternoon good afternoon everyone is everyone. for doctors only na not for public awareness no 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 this is for doctors for doctor. uh, our own people okay because i will more one minute to go live hi hi dr sima good afternoon Hello, everyone Nice seeing everyone. Hi Anjana. Yeah. Hello ma'am. Hello Shukya. Hi Shukya. Hi Melly. How are you? Hello Shukya. Fine. इतना अच्छा topic मेरे को लग रहा है मुझे time ही नहीं मिला बनाने का अच्छे से. No but आपको अच्छा अच्छा topic मिल गया आना. Yes, I am so thankful and this no, is an excellent initiative. Let me tell you. No, yes. we thought we thought that you I'm can do more no on exercise rather than the nutrition. Limited time, yeah. I love the topic, and today it is just a basic skeleton I'm presenting. In future, please include me, and I would love to speak on this. But yeah. ten minutes are yeah, just introduction. Two ten minutes, two, you cannot speak. All two. <laughs> ten minutes. Ten just minutes is only to introduce the subject. Ma'am, we are live. Please yes, start. Yes. Okay. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. I think uh, we have come today on for quest three for a very, very, very inter interesting topic about basic nutrition for better health goal twenty thirty. We all know the importance of SDG twenty thirty and nutrition. I think as the important place. nutrition has to play for uh, us to reach this sdg goal that's exactly the purpose of this quest uh, uh, theme today and for that we have very good uh, eminent speakers and chairpersons who are going to take us through this journey of uh, nutrition towards achieving our sdg goals i think that's the best part of this particular Uh, program today it's such a common topic and all of us need to know so much more about this uh, welcome to all of you for this uh, wonderful wonderful uh, cme today afternoon uh, for the first session i wouldn't uh, want to waste much time because it's a very fast track uh, sixer series that is going to come up first and for that we are going to start with none other than dr maninder rahuja who is opening batsman and we i before that before she starts a topic i would like to invite dr anjana saxena as a chairperson for this particular session can i have the cv of dr anjana saxena yes thank you so much grash is a graduate and post graduate both from the medical college of meerut and she has been doing private practice since the last 30 years founder secretary of hapur obstetric and gynec society she is a active member of hapur menopausal society which is involved in upliftment of health of menopausal women and specifically she is interested in high risk pregnancy and infertility and she does ngo uh, with the inner wheel club at hapur welcome to you dr anjana saxena it's a pleasure to take over the session thank you thank you ma'am Good afternoon and hello to all seniors and my dear friends. I am greatly honored to be a part of this prestigious webinar, Nutrition Demystified: Basic Nutrition for Better Health Goal 2030. Bone health and muscle health and menopause is an important topic for which we have our beautiful eminent Professor Maninder Rahuja, who will enlighten us. Ma'am is a thought-provoking leader, president. Society of Meaningful Life Management, Director of Ahuja Healthcare, Dental and Infertility, with forty years dedicated work for women from adolescence to menopause, SO, SAFOMS VP since two thousand eighteen, webinar in charge two thousand ten and two thousand fourteen, SAFOMS Secretary General two thousand fourteen two thousand eighteen, VP Foxy since two thousand thirteen fourteen. She has been president of Indian Menopausal Society 2014-15. She is affiliated affiliated with many bodies, Isar, Ispat, Narchi. Ma'am is author of many publications like Early Diagnosis and Management of Premenopausal Lesions, Step by Step Management of Menopause, Research Paper on Age of Menopause and Determinants of Age of Menopause, Associate Editor, JMH. 
she has won many awards and felicitations ma'am please the start the session yes. thank you ma'am i'm sharing my screen if you please yes uh, thank you very much dr archana dr krishna for the kind words and thanks to organizers for giving me this opportunity to talk on a topic which is very very close to my heart and perhaps i think i have been practicing this thing for a long long time now since the time i joined popchart before that when i realized that my musculoskeletal health was going down so that was the personal experience i had which started me into this field of science so nutrition and exercise basically i'll be talking about exercise also because nutrition without exercise does not have any role to play at all so if you are just adding nutrition to you and the calories and you are not converting them properly then it's of no use so the ic is only what the mind is prepared to comprehend so let's see what the mind is ready to comprehend we are living in aging uh, uh, population and considering that what is being robbed of is our independence so i'm just saying it yeah so uh, who also has dedicated the uh, um, decade of 2022 2030 as the healthy aging so that there is functional ability uh, of the individuals beyond 50 years and they are not a uh, burden on the society or the family or for themselves or the public health expenditure is not increase so yes so what are the four condition basically uh, chronic uh, condition which are robbing us of our independence are osteoporosis osteoarthritis sarcopenia and fragility and they are all correlated so what is happening in osteoporosis we low, know that there is a uh, bone mass low bone mass characterized by micro architectural changes and there is increase in fragility fracture so these fractures are one thing which are causing the uh, morbidity mortality and one in three women all over world they are getting at one time or the other an osteoporotic fracture so they can be hip spine uh, back vertebral fracture wrist fractures so they are uh, uh, dividing us up for uh, uh, quality of life issues and mortality is increasing this process starts from midlife it, uh, onwards about somewhere from the 30 35 years or mid 40 when we start losing our muscle mass and bone mass at the slow rate of 1.5 to 1% so we are not able to see it's like the skin changes are now on our face wrinkles and everything and near the age of menopause this increases to 4 to 5% even so that is what has but the thing is that this can be prevented same way sarcopenia is going that is also because of hypoestrogenic changes plus sedentary lifestyle plus some of the vitamins and proteins which are needed which we are not uh, replenishing in our diets so what is the bone bone is a living tissue it's going on remodeling and that the pro process of resorption and bone formation that is going on throughout life so when that process goes into positive the good bone is there bmd is increased but when we are into negative because of menopause because of um, uh, some uh, bedridden we are, are not doing activities or the demands are more like in the pregnancy and all that then we go into osteopenia or osteoporotic state so it's not the bone uh, osteopenia or osteoporosis which kills us but the fracture which causes because of that so we have to prevent that and we have to prevent sarcopenia now when the bone marrow this uh, uh, occurring uh, the um, um, remodeling is occurring so what are being added are mineral which are 65% so they are in the form of hydroxyapatite then matrix which are collagen and proteins all is that is needed so osteocalcin osteonectin these are the proteins needed so what you need for the bricks to be laid you need the matrix that matrix or uh, uh, cement that is required so that is what the calcium and vitamin d are going to do calcium especially that will be deposited in the collagen tissue make the bones stronger so we have to achieve that peak bone mass density that is very very important to in the adolescent itself because if we don't achieve that peak bone mass density we will enter menopause in an osteopenic state already and then it will be exacerbated by the low estrogens and low exercise low physical exercise everything 
So that is why we have to reach that peak bone mass density, which is there in 19 to 20 years of age. Now, at that time, our kids, they are doing more of a studies, indoor and sitting jobs only, because they have to clear their need and my God, but not examination. So where is the time for them? So they have to take out that time for them to achieve this peak bone mass density so that there's a high growth, there's a weight growth, there's a skeletal muscle growth. So they need vitamin D, they need calcium, they need diet, and they need exercise. Now, this is very important. The earlier we start the exercise, the more better uh, foundation is there. And there is always a banking of exercise. If you are doing half an hour morning, you can do half an hour in the evening. You can divide them into 10 or 15 sessions, but there is no excuse for not doing any exercise. So it has to be integrated into your lifestyle. And what are the type of exercises? What frequency, what duration should be done? That is very, very important. Like how much protein you should be taking, how much fat you should be taking, what is the vitamin D levels and all that. So it should be 3.5 times of your body weight and it should be jumping. Then only they are going to impact your joints and make them stronger and make your bones stronger. Because when we are walking, we are just taking 1.5 times of our body weight, which is not sufficient to build up new bones. And it has to be 100 impacts three times per week, more than seven months. Then you will be able to see these effects. And this has to be oddly applied, not regularly like this. So that is why control athletes have more bone mass density than others. This couple I've been seeing, they are just gaining weight over the years. And I don't know whether they have gained any bone mass density or not. But yeah, this child who will be doing 50 to 100 skippings per day, will be attaining good bone mass density. So please tell your good uh, kids, at least if they cannot move out of the homes and do anything, skipping, they should be taking and uh, charts, they should be taking two to three uh, glasses per day. That is going to replenish their calcium stores also. So when you are needed, as you grow old, you need stretching exercises because you are becomes sedentary and resistance and weight training. But for that, you don't have to go to the gyms. You can do all those exercises with your own weight, with simple elastic band, with simple dumbbells, with yoga, tai chi, everything. But you have to start it at your own level. Nobody is going to hold you by your finger and tell you, please come and in there, do it. Or please, Seema, you have to do it now while you are sitting all the day. So you don't have to be couch potatoes. What is killing you? It's us Indians is our extra salt. We add salt to everything. We want it spicy. We want it salty. And smoking, I think even our doctors, they are not stopping smoking. Alcohol is becoming very fashionable. You have to be become fashionable. Just take one or two units. And you have to know what makes it two units. A lighter beer, beer will be just one unit. But a strong beer is going to make it three units. Same way wine and same way uh, 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 whiskey is there. So please see to it how much you are taking alcohol. So now we come to the very important issue of calcium and vitamin D. Yeah, there has been some controversies. What should we be giving? Because we were giving first initially um, uh, 1,400 uh, uh, international units, but now we know that we require more. So it has been increased to 800 to 1,000, even 2,000 of uh, vitamin D can be given without any side effects. So that should be replenished if the patient is not able to, uh, uh, person is not able to take from their own diet. Same way, uh, calcium has to be given 2000 milligrams, especially those who are above 55 years of age. They can be taken from simple sources like milk. So skimmed milk should be taken or 60,000 per week of uh, supplements can be given uh, for eight weeks and then they can be put regular. 800 to 2000 milligram depending upon their diet. So we have to calculate from their uh, diet. These uh, green vegetables are full of calcium and iron and vitamin K. Please take them. Tell them to take seasonal vegetables. They are not costly, but supplements are costly. So please ask them to take. One thing very important, whenever we are doing giving them HRT, we have to add calcium because we are trying to build up new bowl. We, if we give calcium, the BMD accrual is much more, otherwise if we are doing without calcium add, uh, adding. So we have to add calcium and for what, uh, absorption, we have to give vitamin D. Vitamin D prevents the falls also and it uh, plays a role in normalizing parathyroid hormones also. So whenever uh, we are starting treatment for osteoporosis, we should be checking levels. 
in between after three months, we should be again checking level, whether vitamin D and calcium are uh, completed or not. Otherwise, osteoporotic therapies are not going to be effective at all. Osteoarthritis is the fastest cause of disability. Weight reduction is something which is required 10% of weight or one kg of weight gain will increase four kg of weight on your knees. So remember that omega-3 fatty acids are required to prevent degeneration and cholesterol has to be reduced to prevent degeneration of the joints. The source of omega-3 acids, we all of us know are flaxseed, walnut, kidney beans, soya beans, and for the uh, non-veg, they are the fatty fish. So ALA is the source for the uh, vegetarian, which is converted to then DHA or EPA and non veg get from that only. But you should be adding something to as you grow up these omega 3 fatty acids. Vitamin D and vitamin K deficiency is related to osteoarthritis, degeneration of the progression of the cartilage. So they have to be replenished. Role of proteins in a protein, this was the study which was done in 2017 only. And in a protein deplete cohort of adults, dietary protein is associated with appendicular lean mass and cordyceps strength increase, but not with the BMD. So what BMD requires is just your normal levels of proteins, whatever you are taking, that is 0.8 to 0.9 milligram per kg body weight. But when the athletes are building up their uh, muscles, then they are taking more 1.6 milligram per kg body weight also. These are the simple exercises which all of you can do at home, stretching exercises. Even when you get up in the morning, stretch up your hamstring, your quadriceps, your um, 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 uh, tibia, um, um, uh, back extensor muscles, and this is easy to do and add the uh, omega-3 fatty acids and D3 and calcium to your diet. So exercise is going to do a lot in enhancing bone turnover. How much time I have done? Two minutes? Uh, enhancing bone turnover, increasing functional joint stability, improving balance, reducing pain, decreasing health risks. It's a good way to socialize also if you are doing group activities like dancing. So improves your mood also. So there are long and short term effects of the, the exercise. So just two, three slides on prescription of exercise. So like you have to add uh, different types of nutrients, same way you have to add different type of exercises. Walking is not sufficient because that does not build up to your bones and the muscle mass. You have to build up those muscle mass. Aerobic is required. So walking is good for aerobic, for your cardiorespiratory endurance. Walking, cycling, dancing, treadmill, cross trainer, they are all aerobic exercises. Your cardiorespiratory endurance would be better. Range of human, you can do the yoga, you can do the different stretches of the shoulders and seated shoulder, butterfly, your abductor muscles, lunges and squats are very, very good for your knee joints and balance training for fall prevention and meditation for your peace of mind. That is much more required for strength training. You can do at home with your own body weight abdominal crunches, lunges, modified push-ups, squares, setup. And for resistance training, you can use simple tubing or weight at home. You have two exercise three days in a week only, and just uh, 30 minutes of exercise or 20 to 30 minutes will be more than sufficient. You have to do biceps and back muscles one day, triceps and chest one day, and one day you do your uh, lower back and your uh, limbs, lower limbs and all that. So all these are exercises, weight machine exercise. If you can easily go to a gym under a trainer, then that will be much better doing if you really want to do good workout. If you have to lose weight, then prevention of weight gain after weight loss, 225 to 420 minutes per week of your cardiorespiratory endurance. For prevention of weight gain, 200 to 300 minutes. For prevention of weight gain after uh, you don't want to gain now sitting like, like I am. So 150 to 250 minutes. If you feel whatever you are doing, exercise, you are okay, your weight is okay, your exercise is okay. Even then you have to do 150 minutes per day. So there's no, no to exercise at all. So it is needed for sarcopenia, stiffness, joint, ankylosing uh, 
uh, spondylitis and everything and balance exercises are needed for prevention of fractures. So it's a big public health problem or the musculoskeletal disorders start from early childhood at um, vitamin D exercise and fall intervention is very, very important. COVID has taught us the importance of the artificial intelligence to reach out to the light. Um, last mile, perhaps we have to use intelligence and artificial intelligence, various exercises, apps are available and diet and nutrition <coughs> can be selected. So challenges are creating awareness, implementation, multi-layered approach, family, schools, healthcare system. Thank you very much. I think it's time to adopt to artificial intelligence if you want to reach out to our patient because opportunistic uh, reaching out is not going to help us at all. And thank you very much for the time sharing. Thank you, ma'am, for such an informative, knowledgeable, and wonderful talk and the worthy, valuable advice that bone health and muscle health can be protected with proper nutrition, calcium intake, vitamin D3, as well as the main point is exercise, which you have to do with yoga and muscle training exercises, aerobic stretching, resistance and weight lift, weight bearing exercises. And we have to stop smoking and limit alcohol intake. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for such an informative talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Manindar, for a very quick review of what is... Uh, uh, can you please stop sharing? Uh, yeah, it's a wonderful presentation in the very limited time that you had. Thank you so much for taking it up. And thank you, Dr. Anjana, for chairing the session. We will now move on to the next session by Dr. Sima Pandey. And for that, I would like to request Dr. Aruna Chapria to come uh, for the, as a moderator. Can I have the CV of Dr. Arna? Yeah. She's a director of Chapadia Hospital. It's okay, Dr. Dr. Krishna. It's okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, so she's from Gorakhpur. Let's know that, that and she's been studying from BHU. Over to you, Dr. Arna. Uh, thank you, Dr. Krishna. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. At the outset, I would like to thank the organizers for making me a part of this prestigious webinar. Nutrition matters for overall health. Diet, which is rich in dietary fibers, omega-3 fatty acids, plant-based proteins, vitamins, and minerals is associated with favorable changes in insulin resistance, metabolic disturbances, and risk of obesity. Today, we have Dr. Seema Pandey to talk about a very interesting topic are there pro-fertility foods? It's, can I have the CV? It's my privilege to read about Dr. Seema, person with presence of dynamism. She is director of Seema Hospital Private Limited and Eva Fertility Clinic, president Ajamgarh Ops and Gaini Society. She has been National Executive Committee member, ISAR 2018 to 2022, ISPATH 2021 to 23. She has been co author and co auditor of books and publications like A to Z of PCOs, ART and Fertility Enhancing Surgeries. Foxy Handbook of Drugs in Infertility, Foxy Focus Preterm Labor. Her field of interest is infertility and reproductive endocrinologies, PCOS, adolescent health, and early pregnancy loss. Her significant contribution is spreading awareness about PCOS and adolescent health among rural women through health checkup camps and talks through NGO Surbhi. Welcome, Dr. Seema. Over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Aruna, for such a kind introduction. Let me tell you, we share two things. I'm also basically from Gorakhpur and I'm yeah, also from IMSBHU. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's a privilege having you as a
Maybe she she has has she rejoined? Coming switched off. Huh? Phone is phone is switched off. Or uh, shall we move on to the next? Yeah, because she is not uh, even. I uh, think she's she lost. Ah, yeah, she's yeah. lost. Yeah, yeah. Doctor Sima, you're muted. You're muted. Can you see my unmute yourself? Yeah, share share it, ma'am. Yeah, I lost the connectivity for a while. So I was just uh, telling, in spite of making all the advances in field of infantry treatment in terms of assisted reproductive technology and everything, incidence and prevalence of infertility remains same. It, it, in fact, it is increasing. So need of the hour is. to look for some modifiable things which you can do and evidences suggests that nutrition is one of that part which can modify our fertility outcome if taken seriously through my this talk on are there pro fertility foods i would like to convince and come to a consensus regarding the same this is an interconnection between dietary lifestyle socio demographic and psychosocial facts on fertility outcome i will not go into detail i am going to quote two very very key studies this is nurses health study 2 according to which people who were following pro fertility diet they had 66% lesser chances of getting ovulate and ovulatory infertility and overall infertility rate was 27% lower than the people who were not following this dietary population but well, this dietary modification so and mind it it was done after taking care of adjusting the bmi age alcohol caffeine smoking or contraceptive intake so it was found that diet was an independent risk factor to create infertility similarly another study which was done in spain and where they found people who are sticking to mediterranean diet they have 44% lower odds of seeking medical help for difficulty in get pregnant and mediterranean diet has effect on positive effect on both males and females this study published recently in february 2022 where they have seen that dietary patterns are associated with improved ovarian reserve in overweight and obese women it is a cross sectional study that that took 185 women and who were following western diet prudent diet fertility diet and pro fertility diet and main outcome measures were amh and afc what did they find after adjusting for bmi age smoking physical activity etc the patterns of dietary patterns were not associated with significant change in normal weight people but when it came to obese people adherence of this pro fertility diet made them richer in their amh and their enteral follicular count and they concluded that increased adherence to pro fertility diet is associated with increased marker of ovarian reserve male infertility same thing as we all understand that nutrition can both negatively and positively affect the quality of semen so your diet should include vegetables fruits fish seafood nuts seed fiber rich products poultry and low fat dairy products it was seen that low consumption of fruit and vegetables and products rich in antioxidants or having high caloric intake a diet rich in saturated fatty acids trans fats red meat all these they 
decrease the semen quality parameters in terms of quality, mobility, etc. Therefore, modification of lifestyle, particularly in terms of diet, was very important. So, does such kind of diet exist? Coming to this all time favorite Mediterranean diet, which is almost considered to be a dietary model as a pro fertility diet. Here we are. This is the food pyramid of the Mediterranean diet. A lot of green leafy vegetables and fruits are being consumed, unrefined carbohydrates, oily fish, low fat dairy, poultry, and red wine. And there is hardly any red meat and simple sugar. Positive effect of Mediterranean diet comes from its nature of tackling. It is a kind of anti-inflammatory diet, insulin resistance decreasing diet, and decrease lipid, improving your lipid profile kind of diet. And by tackling insulin resistance, metabolic disturbances, obesity, and overall mental and physical health improvement, it increases the live birth rate. So, pro fertility diet is a diet which makes your time to conceive shorter. It is based on Mediterranean diet. First of all, was given by Gaskins and colleagues. It is lot of sort of Mediterranean diet. The only difference is that vegetables and fruits these people are eating that is low pesticide residue. It is having along with that there is lot of plant source protein like soy. Mm -hmm using dairy but seafood and they are taking supplements mediterranean diet plus supplement makes pro fertility diet vitamin b12 folic acid and vitamin d and this pro fertility diet is having very very positive impact on male and female infertility both and basically third diet i am going to talk about which has become like a, this our india is young we are having a lot of younger population that is influenced by the west and we are following 24 into 7 kind of lifestyle and there we are talking about western style of life so is the diet and this western style of diet which is high caloric high fat high glycemic index with low consumption of dietary fiber and vitamin it is rich and refined and simple carbohydrates that and processed meat and there are hardly any vegetables all these things they create oxidative stress obesity intestinal dysbiosis we have been talking a lot about nowadays type 2 diabetes insulin resistance all these they increase the oxidative stress of oocyte and sperm and it results into infertility so how does it affect infertility in females by decreasing interleukin concentration at the cortisol cortisone ratio in follicular fluid, there is decreased number of blastocyst when you are going to do an ART and progesterone and AMH is decreased and all these together they lead to infertility along with PCOS kind of picture by increasing the antral follicular count and estradiol surge is delayed. There are specific food which we are talking about folic acid apart from mm -hmm. Preventing you from neural tube defect, it prevents your ovulatory dysfunction in many cases. And if you increase the intake from 400 microgram to 730 microgram, it has also been seen to decrease the chances of spontaneous abortion. So red meat is bad. And only thing it gives is heme iron that is required to maintain your hemoglobin, but it has been shown that consuming iron supplement from other sources, non-heme sources, improves your fertility outcome. Saturated fat content is bad, polyunsaturated is good, and cross-sectional study with omega-3 fatty acids, linoleic acid, omega-6, people who were consuming things containing food, containing these ingredients, they have better fertility outcome. Dairy. We have been talk, talking about skim milk, skim this, skim that. But when you're talking about fertility, just remember, remember full fat dairy products are better for fertility outcome, not the skim milk. So if your patient is going for infertility treatment, don't ask her to remove that malai from her milk or from her curd and let her take the full thing. 
very interesting news alcohol and caffeine inconclusive evidence and we just remember that mediterranean diet has one glass of wine every day and there there was positive impact of that diet shavero found that alcohol and caffeine does not interfere with semen number or oocyte numbers but overall if the increase of caffeine increases beyond 250 or alcohol intake after some limit it decreases the live birth rate but coffee does not have any negative impact taking soda three or more serving a day is deleterious for your health in review of literature, all these females who were following Mediterranean diet, they had better pregnancy outcome. Only Karmic and colleague found that these supplementation did not affect IVF outcome at cleavage stage. But it should be noted that a part of med that's what I was telling, there is a wine and it is alcohol. How much you can take, you have to keep a note of that. Because of time constraint, I'm just giving you the food sources for all these things, carbohydrate, fat, protein, dairy, iodine, folic acid, vitamin D, antioxidant, phytoestrogen, gluten, caffeine, alcohol, what you should be taking, what you should not. So any diet which is high, there is high intake of red and processed meat, sweet drinks and snakes, snacks, low intake of fiber, vitamin and mineral, and there is poor consumption of fruit, vegetables and fish and nuts and seeds, and increased intake of trans fat, omega-6 fatty acids and high energy density food, there is going to be fertility problem. So, if you just replace your diet with more whole grain products and fibers with high intake of fruits and vegetables and nuts and seeds, fish and seafood, more lean and dairy products and include good source of fat like shuddh ghee, even mustard oil and olive oil that is going to create a lot of difference. This initiative guest series I really loved and I must congratulate is a way to go ahead for our young India so that integration of nutritional counseling into fertility treatment should be must. Even if this patient is normal weight, her BMI is not high, she should be given proper nutritional counseling in terms of these dietary items she should be including her in her diet. Consideration of fertility when developing nutritional guidelines. As one example I gave, 400 microgram of folate is not sufficient. That should be increased when a woman is thinking about fertility and Nutrition and social demographic disparities and psychosocial impact should be looked into. It has been found that folate deficiency leads to depression, so does infertility. So if you just improve the diet, this lady can fight with these things in a better way. Folate has been found to decrease the depression as well. And it has been found that poor socioeconomic strata has larger chances of getting infertility. And the reason being they cannot include costlier fruits and vegetables in their diet. The need of our is their super hyper local food to be included in that their day-to-day -day dietary pattern and information and awareness is the key on which our societies, our government should take more initiative so that it can be improved. Technology should be taken help of, as Dr. Maninder was telling, artificial intelligence, these mobile, everybody is having, this is a, we could send messages across what to take, what not to take. And there should be some kind of this disparity of socioeconomic that is a long way to go should be done. Intervention should consider the unique barriers these groups are facing and we should try to lessen it by various program of producing this. So friends, does pro-fertility diet exist? According to me, it is inside your kitchen be it your fenugreek, your, what do you call methi? Fenugreek is methi, you know, your cumin, your nutmeg, and whatever, those all are pro fertility food. And so is pomegranate, apple, and so many things. So let food be the medicine and med medicine be the food. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Well done. Thank you, Dr. Seema, for such a marvelous talk and you gave clear message 
how diet can modify fertility. Pro-fertility diet, both have positive effect on male and female fertility. If trans fatty acids are decreased in the diet, a semen quality can be certainly improved. And in females uh, with pro-fertility diet, AMH level and antral follicle counts are also increased. The Western diet have oxidative stress and thus decreases our fertility. In the end, I would say that diet can certainly make a difference in fertility in conjunction with other mortalities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Seema, for convening. For, uh, we all agree with you that there are pro fertility foods. You have convincingly put it forth. Thank you so much for uh, uh, this wonderful presentation. And thank you, Dr. Aruna, for being with us today and having moderated the session. We'll Have move on to the definition? yeah yeah. Huh? We'll move on to the next session uh, by Dr. Ajay Mani on the nutritional needs in pregnant diabetic. And for that, we have uh, Dr. Rajkumari Paramesh Praneshwari Devi as a moderator. I, I, Dr. Rajkumari, is she there? Dr. Rajkumari. I don't see her here, ma'am. Yeah, I did. I didn't see her. You so go ahead and introduce Krishna, madam. Oh, yeah. okay. Ah. Okay, can you give me the... Yeah, can Ajay. I have the CV of Dr. Dr. Ajamani is well known to all of us. He has been a member of the National Inspection and Monitoring Committee, PCP and DT Wing, Government of India. And he has been a medical legal consultant since the last 18 years. And he has done... Krishna, ma'am. Krishna, yeah. ma'am, thank you. Thank you very much. It's enough. Oh, our pleasure. We are already lack of time, no? Yeah, please. Yeah, thank you. So thank you very you, much. <laughs> thank you, madam. Thank you. And he is going to talk on nutritional needs in pregnant diabetic. Yes. Is it seen? Full yeah, screen? But uh, you have to make it full screen, right? Yeah. Is it okay? Right. Yeah. Great. Thank you, madam. <clears throat> thank you very much. And uh, congratulations to Foxy for conducting such a a different topic because we always are running behind all medicines and medicines and medicine and now today we are again uh, revisiting the nutrition <coughs> demystified and uh, thank you shantakumari ma'am madhuri patel ma'am <coughs> so sorry dr archana varma ma'am basab bhai bipin sir facey bhai and uh, kavita ma'am uh, who are vice presidents then suvarna ma'am aruna suvarna ma'am parishit bhai and niranjan dada and uh, I welcome Miraginu Tremadam Kamira Madam as guest, uh, chief guest. And uh, I'm very much thankful to these two uh, conveners, uh, Dr. Krishna Kumari Madam and Dr. Kiran Mai Devinani Madam, who have given me the chance. So these are my references. I have uh, collected it from uh, various sources. And I'll be going uh, very fast through the slides because you all are expert in these things. And the diabetic diet is not much more different than the routine uh, diet of a pregnant woman, but some calorie difference is there and some uh, uh, nutritional uh, requirements are more so that i will be telling you uh, uh, the management of gdm depends on two things general management medical therapy we are not going into detail general management medical nutrition therapy and physical exercise both are important as these two opening batsmen they have done my job very easy they have uh, told about the all nutritional facts all nutritional uh, items where you get the nutrition so i'll be going very fast so what is the plan <clears throat> diabetes counsel uh, the patient and the relatives about the diabetes mellitus, role of exercise, role of nutrition, calorie requirement and food items. And why? Because uh, the implications of diabetes mellitus, the macrosomia and the infection, all the things has to be told to them. And the counseling about the height, weight, BMI, ideal BMI category. So why a uh, diet is important? It helps in managing blood sugar because blood sugar increases. It creates many problems, uh, including the uh, atherosclerosis. It provides all the nutrient required for the mother and the fetus and it, it helps in managing the appropriate weight care. Okay. Then what is the role of exercise? It is a calorie management basically and the second most important thing in diabetic is it is an insulin production increasing factor. If you do the regular exercises, it uh, produces, the, it stimulates, stimulates the beta cells of the uh, Langerhans and uh, it increases the insulin production and secondly, it uh, uh, decreases the insulin resistance which is produced by the body and having uh, the condition of diabetes mellitus in pregnancy uh, that tendency is decreased by uh, good uh, 
exercises. So, so it must be a mild to moderate, not a severe exercise in pregnant condition. <clears throat> Role of nutrition uh, that these two great fellows have told you about, I am not going to uh, tell you. A uh, role of diet planning, it helps managing blood sugar, it provides all nutrients and it helps in managing uh, that. Calculate BMI, you know, weight upon heights in square meters, obese woman more than 24 kg, uh, uh, 24 is the BMI limit and non obese is less than 24, it is a general category for this and calculate the ideal height, that is a uh, height in centimeter minus 100 is ideal height. Expected weight gain. Uh, if the pre-pregnancy BMI is less than uh, 18.5, then recommended is for 12 to 18. Then if it is 18 to 24, means uh, non-obese, normal weight 11 to 16, and she is obese 50, 25 to 29, then it must be 7 to 11 kg, not 18 kg. Okay. Blood glucose levels. So I have kept this slide here because normal weight we have given here. And what is the ideal blood glucose level before breakfast 69 to 90? Before uh, 69, it considered as a 70 because less than 60, you start hypoglycemic symptoms, sweating and all the things. <clears throat> Before lunch and dinner, 60 to 105. After meals, uh, less than 120, the American uh, Association of Diabetes, they uh, uh, tells usually it is uh, less than 140. And <clears throat> 2 a.m. to 6 a.m., it, it must be uh, more than 60 or else uh, the patient may have the hypoglycemic symptoms. Okay, uh, what is the basically nutritional needs during pregnancy, non-diabetic? First trimester, 85 calories. Second trimester, 285 calories. Third trimester, 475 calories. And the diabetic, obese woman needs 25 to 30 kilo calories per kg. Say uh, for uh, 50 kg, 5.3 uh, is the uh, 1,500 kgs. And non-obese woman, 35 to 40 kilo calories per uh, kg of the ideal body weight. Okay, based on trimesters, second trimester add 150 kilocalories total, not per kg, total, and third trimester add 350 kilocalories total. <clears throat> How we calculate? We ask them uh, what food items they ate in last three days. We take a chart, and uh, in our uh, hospital and in our Garbhasanstar class, we do that regularly. Uh, they uh, write the one wati uh, dal, uh, two chapati. Uh, one wati or one katori of the rice and then we calculate accordingly how much carbohydrate they are eating how much is the requirement if is it deficiency or it is a overeating so we reduce that no? uh, it is uh, done uh, for protein it is done for fat and all the things and the calculation is done and given to the patients ideal requirement in uh, uh, pregnant diabetic carbohydrate from uh, routine is the same like that Carbohydrate must be 50%, protein must be 25%, and fat must be 20%. Uh, glucose conversion, that is a glycemic index. What is the glycemic index? Conversion of the uh, food item into glucose is a glycemic index. And carbohydrate is having uh, in 15 to 2 hours 100% uh, conversion. And <clears throat> protein, 3 to 5 hours 50-60%. And fat is less than 10%. Uh, it takes much more time. So, a low glycemic index, legume, lentil, dried beans, peas that uh, Madam told you, medium uh, uh, glycemic index, all fruits basically, uh, leafy vegetables rather, and high GI index, all cereals like rice, wheat, bread, uh, whatever carbohydrates, chapati and uh, rice, everything. And uh, root vegetables, that is potato, carrot and candy bars and etc. They are uh, high GI index. What are the fruits to be accepted? Apple, pear, orange, apricot, strawberries, peaches, vitamin C rich, vitamin A rich, and what is to be avoided or rather less uh, eaten, mango, banana, chiku, and kiwi, high calories, fruits, okay. <clears throat> Carbohydrates, 40 to 45% of the calories, about 2 to 50, uh, minimum 175 grams per day is the requirement. Carbohydrate counting, uh, bread slice is equal to one uh, apple is equal to one sweet corn. So uh, it is a 15 gram carb. Then uh, it is 15 gram carb, it is 15 gram carb. It is comparative statement basically. So, three idlis, one dal is uh, four mandra chok, sat uh, kilocalories. Then uh, one idli is reduced here. So, we can add one apple plus this egg or half of the teaspoon of butter. Okay. Likewise, we can uh, calculate it and give it less carbohydrate, more protein, and uh, moderate fat is the ideal. Uh, plan. Protein 0.8 grams per kg per day preconception and first half of the pregnancy and 1.1 gram per kg per day in second half of pregnancy. These are the protein items and fat encourage 
uh, the monosaturated fats less than 7% of the total calorie saturated fats less than 1% of the calorie from the trans fat and kindly kindly tell them to use the kachi ghani uh, oil or the pure ghee what madam said uh, pandey ma'am uh, so uh, pure ghee of uh, maybe a cow preferably cow not of buffalo it is a uh, less in calorie and uh, rich in uh, mono unsaturated fats that is accepted and uh, second one that don't use refined oil because in refined oil it is mixed with the palm oil which is a hazardous we uh, don't want that palm oil uh, the um, uh, groundnut oil or uh, the routine oil which we indians eat is accepted and they are benefited fat requirement these are the high fiber diet is very much accepted and uh, rather uh, required because uh, <clears throat> all fruits and non starchy vegetables nuts like almonds seeds and fenugreek it increases your um, uh, gut motility and the digestion and the digestion is improved every uh, item are the micronutrients is absorbed in the body and it is used by the body so it is a very much important so this is very important chart basically stay healthy uh, in, uh, what it says basically ki uh, signal system healthy versus unhealthy uh, green is healthy going towards right is unhealthy steam brown rice is good one because it is unpolished rice white rice is polished rice uh, the all uh, nutrients has gone and only uh, buskot is remaining there which is non <laughs> nutritional and biryani is much more hazardous because all the oil and uh, everything is mixed whole grain bread white bread cakes and cookies to be avoided whole wheat roti maida is not to be eaten because maida uh, creates decreasing the uh, gut motility then paratha puri is very dangerous then steam grill fish is good stir fish fry because oil is added and deep fry it is dipped in the oil green salad is better salad with the mayonnaise because mayonnaise uh, is having uh, much more calories and salad with the cream and cheese is very uh, uh, to be avoided basically fresh fruit is always there as uh, maninder madam said seasonal fruits because nature is very clever it creates the things which you require in that season because mangoes are available in march april may not available in november december and january okay that fresh fruits must be taken and not the frozen fruit or the not the can uh, juices because the can juices are kept in aluminum and the aluminum and the juice the vitamin c the uh, citric acid in that juice uh, they react and creates uh, anything and that is dangerous and that is a carcinogen so don't use the can juice use fresh juice and don't uh, drink juices don't make your patient drink juices make them uh, eat the fruit because it carries the fibers and fibers again neutralizes everything then unsweetened food and everything okay this is a thing uh, then my ideal plate uh, half plate is vegetable one fourth is protein and one fourth is starch okay not going into detail a uh, small frequent diet they uh, have given the chart and vitamins and mineral requirement in pregnancy iron increases to 27 from 18 folate increases to 0.6 calcium increases uh, from 1000 to 1.5 grams and magnesium increases to 360 vitamin c increases to 85 okay and uh, these are the uh, calorie requirement then now i'm going to show you only pictures Uh, not detail calcium resources iron in pregnancy iron sources resources of iron omega 3 fatty acid because everything is told by these two great uh, batsmen before me omega 3 fatty acid um, flax seed there was alsi what you call it the alsi chutney and alsi oil is very much rich in omega 3 fatty acid it is needed uh, for everything dha is needed then uh, b12 cyanocobalamin then uh, d3 sources apart from sunlight and all the things uh, zinc rich food then food right in phosphorus then iodine then uh, selenium then uh, selenium again and then vitamin a then thiamine b1 b2 b3 b6 then b9 c all the uh, uh, that uh, amber fruit what you call it Uh, these are uh, vitamin C rich foods. Source of vitamin E. It is good for your uh, skin. And what is the take home message? A diabetic pregnant woman should eat plenty of whole fruits and vegetables, not the juices. Whole fruit. Moderate amount of lean proteins and healthy fats. A moderate amount of whole grains such as bread, cereal, pasta, uh, rice, plus starchy vegetables such as corn and peas, and fewer foods that have a lot of sugar such as soft drink, fruit juices, and pastries. And diabetic pregnant women should avoid this last category, this sweet category, to be avoided because less calories to be taken. But the nutrition must go inside. And uh, 
this is women empowerment in india this is woman, woman empowerment in india uh, that was in israel and this is, she is carrying gun for the nation and state for her unit dr captain deepishika chitri salute to the army and the women these are the women of uh, lowermost chain of the health category salute to them they have done a good job and this is my request to all of you to kindly vote for me for the post of vice president foxy west zone thank you and thank you uh, again foxy for giving me the chance to share my uh, thoughts on the nutrition here thank you thank you very much thank you thank you so much dr ajay it was a very quick review of all the uh, the necessary things that has to be done for gdm in pregnancy and i think uh, it was a very quick and good review of all that is required thank you so much for being with us today and we wish you all the best in your endeavors thank you good luck to you we move on thank to you. the uh, next uh, talk of the day it is by dr kiran pandey and to chair the session i request dr lata gupta do we have dr lata gupta with yes. us yes yeah. thank you so much dr lata for joining us a very good afternoon to you and she is a consultant at lata nursing home and she is a founder secretary of sita mari foxy society i have been to sita mari dr lata i didn't know you were there chairperson at aicog presented papers at bhuvaneshwar and she has received many awards for her social activities from the local society she has been the past president of the lioness club sita mari life member of ima red cross isopap and believes in women empowerment thank you so much dr lata for being with us over to you for going ahead with the next talk krishna ma'am we are running 10 minutes 10 to 15 minutes late yeah good afternoon everyone uh, thank you um, dr krishna kumari for giving me for a nice introduction and for giving me an opportunity to be here with all of you i have got the opportunity on behalf of sitamadi society to chair this session and i will request prof kiran pande she is a professor and head of department a department of obg gsvm medical college kanpur and she has actively participated in all the activities of foxy from 1986 and has more than 36 years of teaching experience and contributed chapters in various books she has organized many workshops conferences and seminars she has got many awards 15 national 10 state level and 10 district level awards and more than 40 awards by ima and rotary club and she has also received the best teacher award she has thank received you, the president uh, uh, so we thank have thank you dr okay, lata thank you yes please i think uh, we'll be learning a lot from you madam please go ahead with your talk thank you very much dr lata for the kind words actually as as it was told that the time is already running late so let's go for the talk immediately i'm very thankful to the organizers and uh, uh, i will share my screen uh, am i visible hello Yes, yes ma'am. Ma yes, ma'am. We are visible. Okay, okay. So my topic, as of all, you know, vitamin D, wonder pill, or overkill. So at the outset, I would like to thank uh, Professor Shanta Kumari, our resident, Dr. Madhuri Patel, Vice President, Dr. Archana, Dr. Basab, Dr. Bipin, Dr. Fessy, Dr. Kavita, our organizers, Suvarna, Aruna, Dr. Parikshit, Dr. Niranjan, and our guests who will be joining soon. Dr. Meera Nuthri, ma'am, and Pandji, Dr. Kam Kamini Rao, and lots of lots of thanks to Dr. Kiran May and Dr. Krishna Kumari. Let's come to the topic. Although Dr. Maninder has made it my job very uh, easy about talk. She talked about vitamin D, and as all of you know, it is a sunshine vitamin, pet soluble, can be present in the form of vitamin D. Two that is algo argo calciferol and which is derived from the plants. Vitamin D three coli calciferol which is produced photochemically by the action of sunlight. So if we see it has a uh, let's see with this this is produced into this in the presence of sunlight into the skin. Vitamin D three which is stored into the liver in the form of twenty five. hydroxy vitamin and then in kidney it comes becomes in the active form of vitamin d 125 dihydroxy vitamin d and later on if it is 
25 hydro hydroxylase is added, then it becomes an inactive form. Just to give you a little idea, so the basic action of this calcitriol or the vitamin D3 are that it helps into the calcium homeostasis, which is very important for the bones, as already told to you. It increases the absorption of calcium phosphate from the intestine, resorption from the kidney, and in bone it is metabolized so that their levels into the blood is maintained. That is the, basically it has both anabolic and catabolic role on the bones. That's the most important. The sources are of course plant-based, milk products, oily fish, egg yolk, cod liver oil. But the important thing, if you would see this graph, that sunshine gives the 2000 international of vitamin D in 20 minutes or in the 10 beds only in five to seven minutes. Whereas to get this much amount of vitamin D, one would have to eat 100 eggs per day or 170 cubes of cheese per day, which is not possible for anybody. So that the message is the sunshine exposure is very, very important for all of us. And that's where even doctors are suffering because for the deficiency. Now, this is how much vitamin D to we need. Let's see the adults in 18 to 75 years, almost 1,000 to 200 milligram international unit is needed. And you can see as the age is advancing, the requirement is increasing. And when we go more than 75, it almost doubles. So that's what the importance we have to understand. We have to take more. Now, the biological function of vitamin D, basically, it has receptors in almost every tissue of our body. And if you see in the kidneys, it impacts, there is impact is on the calcium homeostasis, homeostasis, which helps into the blood pressure regulation, bone formation, cardiovascular health, neurodevelopment everywhere. In the pancreas, it is facilitates the insulin secretion. In placenta, it influences the fetal programming and placental development. It helps into the lung, uh, affects lung, colon, skin, prostate, and other where it probably regulates the cell cycle. And later on, you will see its effect there also. On the macrophages, this helps into the uh, immunomodulation into the body. So bone, on bone, it has a very important role. And basically, low blood calcium or high blood calcium, both have the basic thing is normal blood calcium has to be maintained. If it will be low, the <coughs> calcium and phosphorus will be released from the bone and then uh, it will be loss of bone, uh, bone strength. And if it is a high calcium into the liver, uh, blood is there, then through by increasing the calcitonin synthesis, the increased deposition of calcium will be in the bone, maintaining the normal blood calcium. So that's how it becomes very important in bone metabolism. Now, deficiency. See, the normal optimal levels are 100 to 150 nanomol per liter. And I'm sure if we all get our vitamin D level checked, it, we are all deficient. And that was found in one study in the doctors also. So the deficiencies are more, but sometimes <coughs> even overdose or intoxication can also be there. And the, basically, the community-based study has shown the incidence to be 50 to 94 Percent and it is almost like a pandemic now. Either it is an underdiagnosed or an undertreated neutral deficiency, even in the world when so much is being talked about. Now, recommended daily doses basically, we see the in adults is almost 6,000 international unit per daily for three months have to be given. Are the therapeutic doses required? If we are giving in the weekly, then we can give 50,000 international units per week for two months. So that is how whenever we detect the deficiency, we should treat for it. Now, basically deficiency, if it occurs, it will have a lots of effects, non-communicable diseases like hypertension, osteoporosis, PCO, falls, muscle weakness, heart disease, type two diabetes, all can be there because of this. Autoimmune diseases, graves, lupus, multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, diabetes, everywhere, it has a role. Even in the cancers, it is a very important role. And specifically in female like cancers of uterus, cancer of ovary, breast, all can be affected. So we do know it's so much a role as this. All of you have seen this picture, can identify rickets, bowed leg picture, and insufficient level of vitamin D 
in breastfeeding mothers unknowingly can lead to these things and supplementation is or has to be optimal for this if this osteopathy uh breakage in the adult if it present then it is known as osteomalacia osteoporosis where the bone loss is progressive and which can be associated with fractures with a small fall they the bones break and that is very much as be serious for the geriatric patients now this is i mean the certain studies which i would like to show who has defined the osteoporosis when a decrease of bone mass is 50% and bone quality 50% a study was done the inference of it is this this article basically emphasizes the role of nutritional vitamin d replacement in high or low bone turnover disorders of osteoporosis even with when the anti resorptive drugs are being used and still the osteoporosis persists and that was also emphasized by dr menender also that with this we have to use it now role of vitamin d in preventing the cancers as i told you very much important and this here the some to summarize i would say vitamin d is the most potent hormone for regulating the cell growth it was discovered that many cell types It contains vitamin D receptors, and it is present in various tissues and inhibits the proliferation, invasiveness, angiogenesis, and metastatic potential. And so, it helps into the cancer prevention. Another studies on this with the on a hypertension. Well, I'm not going into the details because of the paucity of the time, but to emphasize that vitamin D may protect from preeclampsia also through the influences on immune modulation and vascular functions, which we have discussed. And this study showed its effect, and its deficiency is correctable basically. Cheap and safe prevention is there, and which can affect the health of both mother and offspring in various ways. now in pcos all of you guys know now that it has a very important contribution there is and just to summarize i can say vitamin d supplementation at high doses for a period of 12 weeks may lead to improvement in terms of glucose level insulin sensitivity hyperlipidemia and hormonal functionality in pcos women so friends you can see how much effect it has now there is also important uh, evidence that it has important role in modifying the risk of diabetes also and most of uh, these studies have shown an inverse association between vitamin d station status and prevalence or incidence of type 2 diabetes well hypervitaminosis because we have been talking of deficiency a word about hypervitaminosis friends it is extremely rare why because the vitamin for the to intoxication the vitamin d requirement is 50000 international unit per day which is much much higher than the rda and therefore if in increased levels if you had overdose and intoxications are rare but if it happens they are very toxic why because just a one minute one minute only yes, yes, yes. calcito calcification of soft tissue occurs <laughs> and then the lung heart blood vessels and hardening of arteries or stain formation in kidney occurs so that way it becomes a very important so finally as a toic homose message i would say vitamin d tens is not a vitamin only it's a hormone because almost every tissue has its receptor another thing it is produced into the body so that's why we call it as a hormone prevalence of vitamin deficiency varies from 50 to 90% all over the india its role in immunomodulation cancer prevention various non communicable disorders as well as autoimmune disorders i have already discussed in detail and in my opinion and i think you will also agree with it that is definitely a wonder drug till <coughs> its deficiency persists so friends but you if you expect that vitamin d is a miracle dose and that if we all take it in mega doses it will solve our problems no that's not the fact the reality is that only a judicious use and vigilant use of vitamin d can cure many of the diseases as well as prevent the toxicity so thank you very much for the uh giving me this opportunity organizers and dr kiran may again and dr shanta kumari dr 
uh, Madhuri Patel. And once again, I would also, with my folded hands, request you all to uh, vote for me for the uh, Chairperson Medical Education Committee. I have been in this profession for last 35, more than 36 years almost. So I think I will do justice with this um, society. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, very nice presentation, Professor Kiran Pandey. Uh, you have covered everything uh, about the vitamin D and we have learned that it is a wonderful pill, but it has to be used judiciously. And nowadays, uh, according to your talk, we have learned that it has indicated in each and every almost, you know, as an immunomodulator in infertility in prevention of cancer in preeclampsia. A very wonderful talk by you, madam, and I wish you all the best for your coming elections. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Lata, for your very kind words. I can see Dr. Meera Agnyoti, ma'am. Namaste, madam. <clears throat> I can see Shodhra and all the organizers. And hello to everybody. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lata and Dr. Kiran. You have gone for the kill. Welcome, Thank Dr. You. Meera Agnyotri, madam, and Dr. Yashodhra. For the, uh, we are going ahead with the next program, uh, next you. session. Uh, yeah, yeah. Kiran, you are taking over. Yes, yes. Uh, now, uh, I invite uh, Dr. Lalita Shukla, uh, Dr. Lalita Shukla, madam, for, to chair the next talk, which is by none other than our Dr. Krishna Kumari, madam. Uh, Dr. Alita Shukla is a senior <coughs> obstetrician and gynecologist, and she's the president of Allahabad Ops Gyni Society. She comes across as a very warm and uh, very pleasant personality. Uh, I had the opportunity to speak to you, madam. And she's also ex chairperson, AMA Women. Uh, so I request you to introduce uh, Dr. Krishna Kumari for her talk. Uh, uh, good evening and greetings from Allahabad Society. My sincere thanks to Dr. Kiran Mai and her team for this opportunity. Vaginal microbiomes, as we all know, play an important role in the vaginal health and disease. It is my pleasure to introduce Professor Krishna Krumari, who is going to enlighten us on the role of diet in, on vaginal microbiomes. Professor Krishna Kumari is a gold medalist in MD. She has 30 years of clinical practice experience 25 years of teaching experience. She has served as governing council member in ICOG 2018 to 2021. She is the national corresponding editor, Jogi, 221 to 223, national coordinator, Medha, 221 to 223. She has been treasurer, secretary, and president of OGHS. She has been vice president of TCOG. She has a decade of experience as a scientific chair for OGHS conferences, local, national and international. She has contributed to textbooks, Folks He Focus, ICOG Campus and journals. She has been a faculty at local, national and FIGO conference and PG programs. Welcome ma'am and we are thank you. Thank you so much on this topic. Uh, can I share my screen? Right. Can is my screen is visible? Yeah. Uh, make it. Yeah. Yeah, I made it. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lalita, for your kind introduction. At the outset, I would like to thank uh, uh, Shanta and the whole uh, team for uh, make, making this quest in this time when we suddenly had a dearth of conferences when the uh, third wave hit us. So she wanted us to do the first series in the, to fill in the gaps and nutrition is one very such important topic which uh, has been chosen to go ahead. And my topic today is diet and vaginal microbiome. Uh, it's a little uh, difficult to the pot because of the not only paucity of time, but also paucity of materials, uh, evidences available. We'll just go through a, a few thoughts which we might, uh, it's an opportunity for all of us to develop further in the coming times. So we all know that the body is loaded, our whole body is loaded with the, a trillion microbiomes which can constitute all the bacteria, the archaea, the protists, the fungi and viruses. 
And of the bacterial phyla, different parts of our body have different uh, distributions. The uh, predominance of the particular type, for example, in the vagina, it is uh, predominantly the firmicutes. Then we have a, a bit of uh, bacteroids and acnobacteria are predominant. Whereas in the gut, which is more important for us, we do have in the colon predominantly the firmicutes and the bacteroids. So the phyla keep changing in the different uh, places where they are uh, present. And what is a microbe it is? It is nothing but a living thing, which is invisible to the human eye, which is less than 0.2 mm. And they can do anything like eating, uh, even eating rocks, breathing metals, anything can be done by these microbes. And this is possible by what we call as a bucket brigade. What we mean by the bucket brigade is the first microbe does its own task and the end product becomes the starting fuel for the neighbor. That is, that is why there is a continuity of work and that is known as a bucket brigade. So usually for complex uh, transformations, it can't be a single microbe, but they usually do it as a community. And that is why now we call them as community state types. And some there are certain these uh, CSTs which are having poor reproductive outcomes and uh, are associated with STIs. And those which are dominated by the lactobacillus species are related to vaginal health. The predominant ones are usually of five categories, and these type one, two, three, and five are dominated by the good, good uh, lactobacilli, that the lactobacillus crispatus, gasserine, inos, and gensini. And the four is the one which has diverse, which is very diverse in nature, associated with higher abundance of anaerobic bacteria and causes dysbiosis in the vaginal uh, lining. So the composition of the vaginal microbiome is influenced by various factors, out of which diet could be one of the factors. Not only diet, it's anthropetric parameters like the BMI, which can also impact the bacterial composition of the vaginal environment. So when then increased dietary fat intake, energy intake, and glycemic load have been shown to be associated with the higher risk of bacterial vaginosis, Whereas when there is an increased intake of folate, vitamin A and calcium, they seem to be protective against bacterial vaginosis in a few studies which have been done. I already told you the evidence is very, very much limited. Originally, the vaginal microbiome was uh, identified by doing the, we all do by the Nugent scoring system. But then we have to remember that identifying by the Nugent scoring system is more subjective in nature. And then in the what we pursue as a particular type of uh, uh, organism may not be the, may be a little different from what it actually is. So now we do have the metabolomic analysis where newer molecular techniques and statistical methods are used by using the high performance DNA and RNA sequencing technology. So they can identify the very specifically the different microbiomes that are surviving. So when we are talking about uh, the different influences of different factors, we have non-modifiable factors and as well as the modifiable factors. And the modifiable factors which maintain the vaginal homeostasis are diets, which we already seen based on increased vitamin A, C, D, E, beta carotene, folate, calcium, iron, and zinc, and minerals. And the query is about oral intake of probiotics, which we will be coming later. And what causes dysbiosis are increased fatty acid-based diets, tabaquism or smoking and stress. And of course, the hygienic practices, use of antibiotics and sexual habits are also modifiable factors which contribute to vaginal dysbiosis. It was the human microbiome project, which was the one which gave us an insight into the human microbiomes, which included 600 subjects, which included as dentists, gynees, everybody, 18 to 40 years of healthy subjects recruited and uh, swabs were taken from the skin, tonsils and nasal cavities. They were neither too thin nor too fat. And 242 subjects, 15 samples from men, 18 from women, Thrice resampled, totally they have a collection of 11,174 sa samples. And these were categorized after studying the DNA with a specific gene, that is 16S RRNA, which is a marker for bacteria, and easily it can differentiate between the different species. The, this study has given us, uh, uh, has suggested that 
There can be highly differentiated bacterial communities, which can be relatively stable in a human adult. And in healthy uh, reproductive aged women, it is a lactobacillus inus and crispatus, which maintain with low, the low vaginal pH and in pregnancy, the community shifts in its structure with respect to diversity as well as richness. And the results show that the healthy human body is habited by a large, large diverse microbiota and their genetic material is 10 times that of the host itself. And they have a great influence on our metabolic homeostasis, nutrients acquisition, programmed acquisition of immunity and protection against pathogens among others. So the microbes have an important role in maintaining vaginal eubiosis and protect women from several infections, affect local immunity development and have an impact on maternal fetal health. Normally, the microbiota maintain an immunologic equilibrium between the mutualists and the pathobionts and the symbionts. Whereas sometimes in disease conditions, the lactobacilli species being the most predominant organism can lead to uh, when there is a dysbiosis, urogenital diseases such as bacterial vaginosis, yeast infections, STIs, urinary tract infections, HIVs. So also the high inusion score is again associated with not only these post-abortion sepsis, early, late and recurrent abortions, adverse perinatal uh, outcomes, or chorea amnionitis, postpartum endometritis, and the pre-pregnancy BMI was negatively related to vaginal health status, that women who begin pregnancy with the being overweight or who are obese have a greater occurrence of vaginal dysbiosis during pregnancy. So when there is a dysbiosis, it is the pathogenesis, which is the pathobionts, which are high, which increase in number leading to the pathogenesis. So the shift in bacterial communities is associated with the differential uh, vaginal metabolic profiles and the uh, high concentration of biogenic amines, short chain fatty acids with low level of some of the amino acids like tyrosine and glutamate are the most common metabolic fingerprints of bacterial vaginosis. So the subclinical iron and vitamin D deficiencies during pregnancy have been shown to be related with the bacterial vaginosis as studied by Neggers and Westerlin. Lesser serum concentrations of A, C, E, and beta carotene were again associated with vaginosis, and lower iron status was related with increased prevalence of candida, also with, uh, especially in those with already pre-existent HIV, and higher serum zinc concentrations were related with a minor risk of HPV. Minor vitamin D maternal status can increase the infection risk across gestation, Inverse associations between D and IL-6 and human necrosis factor alpha in the mother at delivery and vitamin D and IL-6 and hepcidin in the neonate at birth were also found by a co -et -on. Then there has been an association between the increase of fat in the diet, a higher glycemic load and lower nutritional density with bacterial vaginosis and a contrary relationship between bacterial vaginosis and folate E and calcium intake. So higher levels of tryptophan, phenylpropionate, leucine, isoleucine, phenylalanine, acetylcholine, sarcosine characterize the vaginal metabolome when there was a lower nutrient score. And the other ones were uh, the reverse when they were higher nutrient scores, there were others dominating. So when we're looking even at the endometrium for nearly 15 years, all of us thought that human endometrium is uh, not having any microbes in it. But then when they started sequencing them, they realized that they are too uh, yeah, got it, Kiran. Uh, yes. They were uh, both the lactobacillus dominant and the NLD communities. That is a non-lactobacillus dominant communities were there. And whenever there is an NLD endometrial fluid, there was diminished implantation rates and increased miscarriage in women who undergo IVF. And there has been association between dietary micronutrient intake and molecular uh, bacterial vaginosis. And there are substances known as betaine, which was there in uh, seafood, beet germ or bran and spinach has been obtained. And this, these uh, are supposed to be protective against bacterial vaginosis. So the, a, a word about probiotics in non-pregnant women, yes, there have been studies which have shown that probiotics added to, uh, gave a slight 
improvement or the, you can say a small edge than using only the antibiotic when you are treating a bacterial vaginosis. In pregnant women, the, although we are not very sure of the, uh, I mean, I do not have adequate evidence, they are found to be associated with increased risk of PPROM, GDM, and also PTP and preeclampsia, as well as the bacterial vaginosis. We also have to understand that biofilms as well drug resistance and probiotic effects are strain specific and dose dependent. So we have to be careful in what we are giving and we have to be very selective in the type of lactobacillus which we are giving as even if we are giving it as a probiotic. Thank you all so much and I hope uh, Kiran, I kept my time and I seek your valuable support and vote as COG Vice Chairperson elect. Thank you all so much for your patient hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kiran. And the, your talk on this difficult topic was indeed an eye-opener. Importance of bucket brigade was highlighted very beautifully. The importance of diet on vaginal microbiomes gave us food for thought, thought regarding advice given to our patients during pregnancy and in other infections. We have been become wiser now, and I think it will be an advantage to our patients when we advise them regarding diet, thanks to your, your talk which we have heard very properly and we have imbibed. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Lalita. Thank you, Dr. Lalita Shukla, madam. Thanks, Krishna, ma'am. That was very, very innovative, fresh and very new concept, I think. Uh, and you have put it across very beautifully. Now we have another very interesting and enigmatic topic. Uh, Dr. Chandri, by Dr. Chandrika Anand. Uh, to chair this session, I invite Dr. Anushri Pandey. Uh, That's okay, ma'am. Uh, 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 let me introduce one line. She is uh, very young, dynamic, and uh, she's the secretary of Saranpur uh, Obigayan Society. Dr. Anushree, uh, yes, please introduce Dr. Chandrika, and her topic is uh, cardio obesity. Yes, yeah. A very good afternoon to all my seniors. Greetings from Saranpur Obigayan Society. I am hugely honored to be a part of this virtual CME on nutrition demystified. Obesity is a growing health problem worldwide. Obesity is a strong independent predictor of cardiovascular disease, even in the absence of other risk factors. Today, I had the pleasure to introduce Dr. Chandrika Anand Ma'am to give a talk on cardio obesity. Dr. Chandrika Anand Ma'am is a senior consultant in o OBS and Gyne PCOS Center, Bangalore. She is a South Zone Coordinator Endocrinology Committee, FOXI 2021. Graduated from KMC Mangalore and MD OBGYN from Bangalore Medical College with almost eight gold medals. She has worked as associate professor in OBGYN and emergency medicine at PESIMSR Medical College Kupam and has authored and presented many research papers in national conferences. I welcome you and her special interest is in PCOS and high risk pregnancy. Um, I request Chandrika Man to kindly take over. Thank you so much for your kind words. Uh, um, greetings from Endocrine Committee, Foxy. Uh, namaste to all the seniors. Uh, I think I've been listening to all the talks and then uh, I think almost all the aspects of nutrition is covered. So like, which are these set of patients whom we are going to give all this advice? Okay. So like uh, Madam spoke about vitamin D and then uh, gut microbiome and then uh, bone health, exercises, nutrition, uh, uh, everything. Uh, but then, which are these? So, today's my topic is very interesting. Andrika, ma'am, uh, may I interrupt? It is about CBD and obesity in women, the gynecologist and prevention of the same. Yes, yeah, sure. Yeah, uh, the voice is a little breaking, ma'am. If you can switch off the video, I think some uh, internet yeah, issue. I'll do that. Okay, one second. Stop sharing. Sure. I'll do that, yeah. Okay. Yeah, is it better now? Yes, yes. Yeah, okay, sorry. Uh, so, um, what is the global burden of cardiovascular disease in women? Almost 35% deaths of all women, all deaths in women worldwide are caused by cardiovascular disease. In postmenopausal women or uh, old age, 70% of deaths are by cardiovascular disease. 
next followed by breast cancer and its and other causes okay what is a global uh, what is a burden in india cvd in women in india cardiovascular diseases have emerged as the leading cause of death in all parts of india including the poorer states and rural areas and it is a significant cause of morbidity and mortality in women overall the cvd contributes to 28% of the total deaths and 14% of the total dalis that is the disability adjusted life years in india in, in 2016 its prevalence has doubled in the last 25 years and very high in kerala punjab and tamil nadu now what is special or what is different in cvd in women there is a increasing trend of cardiovascular disease and heart attacks in women cardiovascular disease comprises of the ischemic heart disease congestive cardiac failure arrhythmias congenital heart disease and hypertensive coronary artery disease so that is increasing in trend in now in women they present the cvd presents 10 year later compared to men thanks to the protective cardio protective effect of the estrogen so the cvd presents more after menopause more severe disease compared to men more first time mortalities in women see women we don't hear 35 year old Olds or 25 year old men having a people dying because of heart attack. So uh, the first time mortality is more common in women. The first attack will be the most severe attack, and they are often under diagnosed and under treated in women. And they need specific pharmacological intervention in the childbearing age itself. Now, what is the female protection or the estrogen protection? So this is a graph to show that you know in the infancy till the puberty there is very low risk, and the female protection happens till the menopause. Once the menopause starts. the aging starts the increased risk of cvd why after menopause because there is weight gain there is decreased physical activity sleep disturbances abnormal metabolism or metabolic syndrome is more after menopause and then the depression part that also increases the stress and the diet faulty diet all these can lead to menopause in with increased cardiovascular risk now again coming to the gender differences in a metabolic disease the women are more prone to have abdominal obesity the extreme obesity is more in women and increased waist circumference of the abdominal obesity increases the metabolic syndrome compared to men and dyslipidemia again women with having abnormal lipid profiles they are known to cause more cvd risk than compared to men hypertension again congestive cardiac failure is more common in women and white coat hypertension or anxiety related hypertension is more common in women and hyperglycemia glycemia particularly the fasting glucose causes more damage in women now also apart from the disease pattern or apart from the disease pathology there are gender difference in the management of cvd in women what happens to women females are this is global female females are less likely to be taken serious when they talk about their cardiac symptoms 45% less likely to receive statins beta blockers and they 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 their presentation of gas, gastritis chest pains fatigue they they take it more likely so they don't go to the emergency room as easy or as frequently as men so they are less likely to receive treatment from a heart specialist pacemaker angiogram angioplasty even the coronary bypass the women are less likely to re- likely to receive maybe because the women do not approach the doctors maybe the resource allocation it is more allotted money is more allotted to men in the family than in the women or it's simply lack of awareness so as such all these impact the health outcomes for females leading to increased risk of mortality now this is men and women compared as we can see all the risk there is cardiovascular mortality diabetes obesity everything causes more risk in women than in men maybe that is a nature's way of compensating the protection given during the reproductive years after menopause the disease is hard on the women now there are the cvd risk factors apart from the routine risk factors all of us know there are this uh, cvd risk factors unique to women which we as gynecologists can catch and try to modify uh, the overall cvd morbidity and mortality that is the premature menopause gestational diabetes hypertensive disorders of pregnancy preterm delivery low birth weight pcod and autoimmune disorders all these we can catch them at that point whenever they come and try to give all the advice whatever the five speakers spoke to me before me whatever advice they have given we have to give every day in the opd to all these people 
now this is a relative risk compared to these this factor is three clamps yeah three to six fold increase pcos 50% increase in cvd you see very very alarming adolescent young girls so catch them early and give them lifestyle and coc that is combined oral contra six fold increase menopause low birth weight sle rheumatoid arthritis functional hypothalamic amenorrhea obesity premature menopause all these women are at risk of developing cvd so these are the women we see every day in our practice so this is where we need to intervene so what is the role of obgyn in women's cardiac health many women see their obgyn as their sole physician and this presents a unique opportunity to, for us to leverage this relationship to optimize the risk reduction initiatives reduce the long term healthcare costs and provide comprehensive well woman care obgyns are a major gateway into women's care and can positively influence a woman's life and health how do we do it routinely any patient with any complaint they come we need to take a thorough family history obstetric history screen for the targeted review of the cvd risk factors like you know premature menopause you know check her bp weight every check up we need to check the weight calculate the bmi and then check her bp you know ask about stress mental health we need to inquire into the mental health of every woman who comes see this are this is actually little impossible in our daily practice but then we need to make it a habit so that we have to care for these women all these uh, risk factors which happen during the reproductive age group can have a bearing even after menopause and uh, so that is why we have a very important role and then we need to treat any woman with a 140 or 90 more than 140 or more than 90 we need to treat more than 105 fasting sugar we need to treat high cholesterols we need to treat because or maybe refer to the physician because all these uh, factors they affect women more than men and also the patient education we need to edu educate the patient about all the diet and you know sleep and stress management meditation and then uh, exercise madam told in detail about the exercise how they have to daily exercise you know all the uh, all the things we need to talk to them and that's all so hypertension gdm screening ocp checklist whenever we are prescribing a oral contraceptive please default follow the checklist so that you know we don't ignore hypertension or smoking and then contribute more to the visit assess the diet assess the physical activity assess stress so the association so all well woman visit including the postpartum visit should be considered an opportunity to focus on the lifestyle choices that optimize the cardiac health this four behavioral choices and three metabolic parameters that is uh, we need to score them there is a bmi the physical activity smoking and diet we have to ask in each visit monitor their blood pressure and cholesterol and the fasting glucose in high risk women that is how we can uh, contribute then how do we prevent uh, cvd again this is been covered eating a balanced diet more fibers less uh, in fat and less in sodium and high in vitamin d give us smoking and limit alcohol monitor bp reduce stress and manage any other health conditions such as diabetes hypertension and sleep apnea mental health and stress reduction are imperative at all stages of life but more so in a woman's life that are influenced by the hormonal environmental particularly postpartum and menopausal stage so there are data to suggest that programs for mindful their lifestyle this can be done one to one through the uh, opd or through the doctors or we have to develop some kind of a technology or a app where the women can monitor uh, they get educated about the cardiovascular risk and then they can monitor their uh, uh, you know analyze their data about their exercise and diet and all those things and then screening aggressive screening for cardiovascular disease and risk factors and then obgyns and cardiology we need to be uh, we need to improve our uh, you know we have to enhance our collaboration we need to stay together we need to educate each other because this becomes you know the obgyns play a very important role in preventing cardiovascular disease and reducing the risk of cardiovascular mortality when we start early in a woman's uh, life's life that is starting from the pcod adolescent pcod turner syndrome primary uh, ovarian agenesis 
or gestational diabetes catch her and ask her to follow a good lifestyle later also when while prescribing the ocp so there are many ways where we can contribute to the cardiovascular uh, health of the woman thank you thank you very much chandrika ma'am for a very crisp and informative talk on cardio obesity we as obgyns are actually the key people the sole physicians and the major gateway to the women's health and it's very important that we pay attention to their diet exercise tell them about meditation and the life simple seven uh, whenever they come to our opd calculate their bmi talk about their physical activity inquire about smoking their diet cholesterol bp and the glucose levels and we should start an early screening for them thank you very much for the talk nice presentation chandrika it was a very good presentation and doctors thank are you, not madam, an, namaste <laughs> and doctors are not an exception to it namaste namaste definitely thank you thank you so much uh, dr anushi yes. and dr chandrika i think we have been seeing uh, very young uh, gynecologists our own colleagues uh, succumbing to sudden massive uh, mis and uh, I think the risk is quite underestimated. Thank you for focusing on that. I think we are uh, little we are overshot our time. Without further delay, uh, I request I hand over to Dr. Krishna Kumari, Madam, to take ahead the proceedings for inauguration. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Kiran. I would like to thank all the chairpersons and the speakers for that uh, wonderful sixer we had in the fast track. Uh, session today there was i uh, only wish we had more time we could concentrate only on this uh, those topics we have done would have done a one, much 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 more knowledgeable job i presume thank you all so much i wish, i welcome all our faculty and uh, all the delegates for this uh, inaugural session which we are moving ahead with and uh, for uh, dr bipin sir are you here Do we have Dr. Bipin? Ah, uh, sir is having uh, internet issues, but I saw him. Yeah, I am. I have logged in. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you so much, sir. So over to you for welcoming the audience, all all the faculty, the guests of honor, and the delegates. Over to you, Dr. Bipin. Yeah, thank you very much for uh, uh, giving me this opportunity. I'm sorry that there was a geo crash here of fiber. so there was no internet in mumbai which is very rare but still yes nevertheless uh, last two talks i enjoyed them and very informative and very good and uh, it's a very important topic which we neglect compared to other clinical topics like endometriosis and fibroids and so many of them but zindagi mile no dobara so we have to take care of our health take care of our nutrition exercise and keep our good health then only we can achieve further things thank you uh, krishna kumari and kiran mai and uh, of course madam shanta kumari uh, excellent topic and good speakers thank you very much thank you very much uh, dr bipin uh, we move on with the next uh, item on the agenda that is invocation can we have uh, the invocation please Krishna Thank ma'am, Shanta madam joined. Yeah. yeah. Oh, welcome Shanta. Welcome Shanta ma'am. Welcome, Dr. Shanta Kumari, President uh, Foxy and uh, Treasurer Figo. Welcome, Mira Grigothri, Madam, and Kamli Rao, Madam, our guests of honor for today. And I would like to welcome the uh, Secretary General, Dr. Madhuri Patel, and of course all the other faculty, Dr. Udayta Nawala, the ICOG Vice Chair, and all the delegates today for this uh, inaugural session. Uh, can we go ahead with the President's message, please?
Dear friends, Foxians and women of my country, I am Dr. Shanta Kumari, President of the Federation of Obstetrics and Gynecological Societies of India. As a little girl, I told myself that I have to become something to make a difference. I always believe that if I desire something wholeheartedly, there is a positive force which makes it happen. And here I am friends, standing in front of you as the 60th President of Foxy. The 38,000 strong committed body of ob taking care of women's health in our country. As a young girl, I realized that women play a key role in this world. Just like Mother Nature or Sri Shakti as we revere it. It is a guiding force behind all forms of God's creation. And it's only a woman who can actually create a new life. Hi, I'm Karina Kapoor Khan and I'm so happy to be here with you, if only on video. Pregnancy is a beautiful experience and I have loved having my baby. I congratulate Dr. Shanta Kumari as taking over the 60th president of this eminent organization. Sri Shakti is the embodiment of five elements. The sky, the air, the water, the earth and the fire. Any imbalance in any of these five elements creates chaos and calamities. Similarly, when a woman's health is neglected, it disrupts the universal equilibrium. The intimate link between environment and human well-being is very well known. With increasing awareness of the need for clean water, pollution-free air and pesticide-free food. Hi, I'm P.V. Sindhu. Well, it's such a beautiful feeling for me to be an empowered girl. To be a girl in a nurtured and a safe environment. Protecting health by preserving nature and its ecosystem is easier than curing any disease. So we have taken up the concept of minimizing the female morbidity and mortality and fetal effects by mitigating the adverse impact of environment. My theme this year goes beyond Foxy's commitment towards women's health care. Venkat, you can stop it, uh, Venkat. Yes, stop it. Uh, it's stuck in the middle. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Venkat. And uh, we now have our guests of honor, Dr. Meera Agnihotri and Dr. Kamni Rao, Madam, are going to address us. Uh, I would like to welcome Dr. Meera Agnihotri for her guest of honor address. Can I have her CV, please? Yeah, I think she doesn't need any introduction. We all know her as the professor head of the department of OBGYN, GSBM uh, Medical College, Kanpur. Uh, she has been the chairman of Ethics and Research State Medical College. She has been the president of WWW Foundation. She's advisor for Women's Health Cell Ministry of Health, Government of India. Shepherd 1000 for National Health Program launched on 24 January 2021. She has organized the international WWWCon inaugurated by the President of India and Union Health Minister. Successfully, she has led collaborative group of 13 organizations supporting proxy position statement to Ministry of Health, Government of India for COVID vaccination to lactating and pregnant women. And we have seen how successful this particular campaign has been in for our practicing, for us uh, practicing obstetricians. And Thank internationally, you, Thank yeah. you, that's all, Krishna. Thank you very much for uh, your loving words. Uh, uh, very passionate and uh, humbled. And uh, you see, uh, I, at the outset, extend my heartfelt uh, gratitude uh, to our dynamic president of FOPSI, uh, Dr. Shanta Kumari. Uh, you have seen the start, and we all know what all is going to happen in the country for women. I've got great hopes, not only in the zonal conferences, but at the national level, she's definitely going to make an impact to our prime minister and the Department of Health in very many ways, because uh, she's going to give a huge turn to the existing drawbacks in to coming them from. So I've got great hope for uh, Shanta, our secretary, Dr. Madhuri Patel, 
and uh, uh, my very, very good old friend, Kamini, sitting over here. I don't think that any meeting, any conference, whether it is a small one or a big one, is complete at Kanpur without Kamini. Uh, starting from the 39th ICOG to the uh, President of India, uh, she's sitting by my side, uh, so Kamini I cannot uh, spell. Uh, every time she's an advisor to me. And now Shanta on the board, uh, I know that my all the activities will be sponsored, helped and supported by her so that I can reach my goals. Uh, dignitaries to that Thanewala, I can see. I can see my friend Yashodra sitting over there, uh, Madhuri uh, and everybody, Dr. Mani is there, uh, Dr. Devrani is there, Krishna, uh, uh, so many people. Yes, uh, Rosa is also there. Uh, please uh, accept my regards and uh, uh, I really want to uh, congratulate the uh, present team uh, for getting the things done like this. The academic activities are at the climax in spite of so many drawbacks. Uh, we are not able to meet physically most of the time. Yet the topics taken today by Dr. Shanta Kumari and Dr. Patel are very, very good, uh, especially the uh, this part because we are losing our young, dynamic girls uh, just like that. They are coming to the hospital, sitting over there, doing something, and uh, you are made to rush um, and do something. Uh, I want to share one thing over here. We have lost a very dynamic uh, uh, husband of one of our girls who has attended uh, last meeting uh, at Meerut. Uh, nothing doing. He was just sitting in the um, uh, hotel and a call came that uh, he's gasping and we lost him. A very young, must be hardly 45, Shanta knows it. So, uh, so these are the things which are happening. So we must take care. Uh, we have to take care of the patients, agreed. But we must also take care of ourselves because sometimes when we are working very hard, we are neglecting ourselves. So Shanta, thank you very much for uh, making me a part of this prestigious meeting and sharing the dais with the uh, lovely dignitaries. Uh, thank you very much. I just extend my heartfelt good wishes for the wonderful and success of this meeting and onwards. We will be meeting again. Uh, we believe in Indore. So thank you very much. Now, Kamni, please, uh, the dice is yours. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Meera, Madam. And uh, we, our, we extend our heartfelt uh, condolences uh, to our colleague for her loss. Uh, we move on to the next uh, guest of honor today. And it is none other than Dr. Kamni A. Rao, and who also doesn't need any introduction. We all know her as a pioneer in the field of Western reproduction in India. She has specialized in reproductive endocrinology, ovarian physiology, and abstract reproductive uh, techniques. She is a medical director at Milan Center for Reproductive Medicine. And she has, has many awards to her credit, with the Padma Shri Award, the Karnataka State Award, the Vidya Ratan Award, the Lifetime Achievement Honors Tribute Award, uh, for Aryabhatta Award, BC Roy District Award from Shimoga District, Lifetime Achievement Award from Bangalore Society, Lifetime Achievement Award from Foxy, and she has been an elected fellowship of the National Academy of Medical Sciences. And she has many publications. We all know, Madam, uh, I think my first book on lactation, I still remember, was presented to me, uh, written by you, and it was in the very beginning, quite a long time back, but I still hold it close to my heart till now. Thank you so much for gracing the occasion today. And please say a few words. Thank you. Over to you, madam. You're muted, madam. Please unmute yourself. Thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, function, which is extremely close to my heart because uh, all the dignitaries on the dais, and particularly Shanta Kumari here, because I see her as a little girl walking like as she's in that video, walking across and dreaming big and actually making it happen. You know, many of us dream big and become armchair politicians, but she's one that has dreamt big and has actually walked the talk. And this is what I like. She's a doer. 
and she's an administrator. And I think that this is the type of people we need today. You know, beyond the Vindhyas in Foxy, it was almost like, you know, a club of people. And I felt that, you know, beyond that Deccan plateau below, Foxy was never heard of that anyone would come up. And I think from the south and from, uh, you know, from uh, Hyderabad and from Andhra Pradesh, so she's the first president of Foxy. And I'm very happy to say that uh, she's very young and she's a president of Foxy. And I think this is some kind of uh, vision she had when she saw me coming into Manipal. And she was wondering, why couldn't she be like me? I think, you know, I should say that she should become even bigger and better than me. And this is what I see in people. See, we should create leaders and not followers. And I think that that is what uh, Shanta has done ably and now has gone into Figo as a treasurer. She's the first treasurer from India. And that is something very, very, a great achievement. And uh, I want more people from India to occupy positions in Figo, which will show the world I, that India yeah, is a superpower. I think that is very good. And of course, oh, my dear yeah. friend. Uh, Mr. Meeting. No. Dr. Bina. Dr. Bina, can you please Bina, mute Dr. yourself? Please. Dr. Bina. Online, yes, sure, sure, sure. sure. Welcome to mute Dr. Bina. Sure, sure, sure. Sorry, madam, please cut it. That's all right. And of course, uh, Meera Agnihotri has always been the doyen. Huh? Uh, and Patna ki, uh, almost uh, the queen. And uh, over there, all politicians take her blessings before they stand for elections as well. So it is not only one person. And uh, I remember when going there as a young person and standing there for my lecture for um, uh, the president of uh, Foxy, she, she was the one who said, what? You're coming for Foxy this thing election and you're not asking for vote. And I said, when I come to my own... Um, mother's house, so why will I ask for any votes? And then that really pleased her like Matt, you know, because they are very large hearted people and they are very fun loving people. And I remembered in that particular conference that she had got Hema Malini to come and dance over there. So that was such a the thing. She would just make one phone call and you'll have all the police officers coming. She'd get one phone call and she'd have, you know, Shatrugan Sina or anybody else coming there. So that was her power. And you know, I was always wondering, this is what is important. So Bihar is not something that you can say easily that uh, you can thrive there. And this was the lady who reigns there and everyone takes blessings before they do anything. And thank you, Mira Agnihotri for you know rem remembering me. And now as far as the uh, organizers are concerned, Kiran May as well as of course, uh, we have the entire team here Lalita Shukla, as well as Ajay Mani, as well as the rest of the crowd. I'm happy to say that I'm part of this team of Nutrition Demystified. And I'll tell you a story. When I was given this uh, uh, particular position of guest of honor, the first thing that I sat in the clinic some 30 years ago, I told one patient that you must have a balanced diet. So she was a clever lady and she asked me, doctor, can you give me a balanced diet? Morning, what shall I take? Afternoon, what shall I take? And evening. So I was stumped. So she said she was actually from the West, from Gujarat. And she said, in my diet, I want you to include okras and you should be doklas and you should this. And I was wondering, now, how can I actually make a diet? And she brought a paper and pen and she sat before me. So I told myself, am I practicing obstetrics and gynecology or am I doing nutrition? But it was a very simple question this lady asked me. And as a result of that, it changed my mindset. And nine textbooks of nutrition came out of my pen only because of that, because we all sit in our consulting rooms and advise patients, take a balanced diet. Do we know what do you uh, mean when you tell the patient take a balanced diet? Because when she goes home, she doesn't understand what a balanced diet is. So if we are going to talk to people and say that this is what is a balanced diet, we must actually tell them, what do you do? Suppose there is no beans. If you take eggplant, how much of eggplant do you do? How do you cook it? How, what is the calories? 
and if you are going to you know replace it with another vegetable or how much of proteins what are the things that will have proteins in a vegetarian diet in a non vegetarian diet and these are some things which you should have in a kind of a leaflet or in a kind of a booklet and you must hand it over to your patients because then only patients will follow if you tell the patient you go to the dietitian more than 80% of your patients will not go to the dietitian because they believe you they don't believe the dietitian but if you say you take this and then go to the dietitian then perhaps they will go to the dietitian because the patients even if you say you take horlicks the patients will listen to you but you can't write a prescription of horlicks and give it but if you talk to them certainly they will so therefore when that lady told me many many years ago gsk with me we uh, uh, did this eight books on nutrition and i think one of this what krishna kumari was talking about is not only on uh, lactation it was on maternal nutrition it was postpartum weight loss what the doctor needs to know before she gets pregnant and so on and so forth so therefore they became extremely popular and more than 50000 copies were given across the country therefore when i see this entire program on nutrition demystified and so much of an effort put into a big webinar like this kudos to all of you i think this must be done in every nook and corner of the country nutrition is so oh, ma'am unmute madam you are accidentally muted no, accidentally muted yes you are uh, the nutrition is so important that it can replace a lot of pills and tablets that you're taking so much in terms of lifestyle modification and nutrition plays plays a pivotal role in how you actually modify your healthy living so this kind of uh, work uh, the, the kind of seminar and webinar that you're doing is excellent i cannot in fact emphasize more please go ahead have the seminars more and more because we have to get back to basics back to nature nutraceuticals are more important than getting pharmaceuticals because i think what we need to look at is our very own home grown vegetables and cereals and see that they are in the right proportions obesity is a very big burden today and if we can actually advise our patients on eating the right kind of diet and maintaining the right kind of health i think we would have actually solved a lot of problems as well so with these few words believe me i wish this webinar all success and i have uh, sometimes people in the last um, decade were considering me to be a nutritionist rather than a gynecologist because the everyone associated me with nutrition thank you very much for inviting me here and thanks all the dignitaries and the attendees please attend more such uh, webinars and believe me i have learned from it thanks a lot thank you thank you so much madam i think we have to thank both our guests of honor for their wonderful uh, for making their presence felt with their wonderful pearls of uh, uh, what their experiences and their uh, what should be done for the betterment of our uh, patients thank you both so much and now i invite dr shanta kumari our president foxy and figo treasurer for Thank her uh, i don't want to introduce you because i know you Thank won't you. like it uh, good evening uh, everyone sure, yeah. remove the slide uh, so i have uh, good evening to our uh, uh, guests dr meera agniyotri madam and dr kamini rao madam and thank you dr krishna kiran mai aruna and all the faculty for uh, being so very proactive in rolling out this webinar for foxy uh, we we agree with uh, dr meera agnihotri madam about how very important it is that we gynecologists play a role in the lives of our women whom we treat but at the same time i think she is very true in her saying that we need to take care of ourselves though i really wonder what is it that we can take care of our, ourselves to prevent the unpreventable so it's so very difficult actually we think that 
we can prevent but uh, ideally i really don't know because we have seen the best of it uh, people also succumbing we have seen and we have seen the people not so fit have also been uh, leading and happy go lucky right so it, to strike the right balance is very difficult we have just seen about in our own this thing we have lost very seniors like for example dr rakesh sinha sir who was an absolute fit person marathon runner everything possible and we see we saw just recently the shane won okay he is he is an athlete fitness freak but there was a very uh, nice video which was uh, actually going around in my classmates group uh, madam kamni rao kamni rao madam as uh, rakli said you know madam has been though she is an infertility specialist padma shri she is the ivf uh, Uh, specialist and all but it is so very uh, i mean simple to identify her as a person who has propagated nutrition so today we have ha- had the opportunity to hear from you about nutrition and the importance of nutrition and the importance of every obstetrician gynecologist to actually sit and think what is it about the nutrition we need to explain to our patients that is so very important and dr madri patel my secretary general will agree with me that we are very one minute i'm sorry for the sounds and uh, uh, nobody can actually not agree with the fact that if we take a little time to advise our patients about the nutrition probably life would be much different and you know in that video which i saw they were mentioning about the lifestyles and what is like you know somebody you have a liquid diet for 5 6 days then you have a binge eating on the two days and then you have a nice uh, solid meal and then you just keep your thing with a green tea or this thing so you know she that uh, uh, anchor was actually questioning herself and everyone like her it was it was like you know it was every individual can ask themselves what is it that we are doing but it's so very difficult to cut a balance and it's easy for us to say okay change in lifestyle make and make it your uh, life scenario and all but how much me of us can actually do it but that should not deter us from doing it nor making a patient do it i hope all of you go for your walks every day or if you, if not the walk i think any bit of exercise which is as important as the nutrition you take whether it is going to really put away the inevitable but still it it will actually maybe lead us to have a more healthier life and kamni rao madam is so very right you know the patients ask us simple questions and what they want are simple answers they don't want your phd answers they want simple advice what to eat in for the breakfast what to eat for lunch or dinner sometimes you know it gets so uh, i think monotonous or something we may say you know and we in your busy opd you really don't have time you say okay go to the dietitian but really how many patients really go to the dietitian so probably some corporate hospital or nursing homes which are lucky to have a nutrition department a dietitian on board then it's okay but i think otherwise they generally lean on the advice which obstetrician given the, and of course now the google uncle and google auntie is there to make them more aware but uh, madam you have, as rightly put i think every one of us have to have a basic idea about what we can advise to our patients so i hope that uh, this uh, webinar is going to be that uh, bit of uh, importance to our patients so that it can help them to have a better uh, better pregnancy for our obstetric patients or a better lifestyle for the general patients so thank you very much our guests of honor for joining us and i i have lot of friends whom i can see i can see dr ajay mane bipin sir is of course there dr pardesi dr Bas- varsha vidya tobi supriya and so many others i hope uh, all of you are uh, enjoying the the webinar and all the best to everyone thank you very much for being with us today thank you thank you shanta thank you very much uh, we all understand that i think the the basic message that we got from all the guests of honor and you is that genetics it is what is what we can't do anything about we have it in our genes we can't help it but epigenetics yes what influences the genes is what is in our hands and let's hope that all of us will take it seriously and uh, not only we our patients take it seriously and uh, uh, learn from the others mistakes not from our own mistakes thank you all so much for honoring us uh, by your presence today 
I now request our Deputy Secretary General, Dr. Madhuri Patel, Secretary. to uh, say a few words Secretary and General. give a word of thanks. Thank you so much. Madhuri is our Secretary General. Yeah, yeah, no problem, no problem. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I've been used to <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. No problem, Krishna. But thank you for your kind and generous words. Uh, honorable dignitaries on dais and of the dais, very good evening to all of you. On behalf of Foxy, it is my great, uh, it is a great honor for me to propose a vote of thanks for today's most important, you know, CME on, you know, nutrition demystified. And for that, I would like to thank our most dynamic president, Dr. S. Shanta Kumari for conceptualizing and supporting wholeheartedly mm. today's program. And I must admit that as Madam uh, Meera Agnodhatri has said and uh, Dr. Kamini Rao has said, that Shanta is a great administrator and whatever she decides, she will implement for the well-being of her women. And then I would also like to express my sincere gratitude to our guest of honor, Madam Meera Agnodhatri, teachers of teachers and Thank always you. Happy, you know, always happy to greet you, always happy to advise. And, you know, she's such a kind-hearted person. And, you know, she was professor. And she, I think, madam, you're professor in HOD or GS, BM Medical College, Kanpur. And you must have trained and you must have given so much of blessing to all your students, including me and Shanta. So we are really grateful to you, madam. And, of course, um, madam Kamini Rao, she's also our teachers of teachers. You know, she must have also trained so many people. And she happens to be past president of Foxy. And I really thank you, Dr. Meera Agnihotri and Dr. Kamini now for sparing your valuable time with us and giving invaluable inputs. I would like to thank our uh, and appreciation to our vice president, Dr. Bipin Pandey, Dr. Pesi Lewis, Dr. Basab Mukherjee, Dr. Archana Verma, Dr. Kavita Bapad, our deputy secretary, General Suvarnan, Yes, then Suman, Dr. Suman joins the secretary and Shanta is making her work like anything. And she always smiles and do the work, does the work. Then Dr. Parishit Tang, our treasurer, Dr. Niranjan Chavan, joint treasurer, for their continuous support for this, all the program. We would like to also thank our esteemed you know, experts, speakers, and chairperson for expertise, their expertization and their sharing their experience and expertise which will really help us, all the obstetrician and gynecologists in their day-to-day -day practice, what is a balanced diet, and which will definitely help our woman. And secondly, with balanced diet only, if we can remove anemia part also, I, that will you know, prevent so much morbidity and mortality of the uh, uh, women, mothers. At the same time, yeah, IUGR, you know, preterm labor, abortion can be prevented, you know, with only the nutrition if you give a balanced diet. So this is very, very important part. And our experts and our speakers and our chairperson really go, have enlightened us and going to enlighten us more on this part to achieve our SDG goal of reducing MMR less than 70 per 100,000 live births by 2030. We would like to also thank our conveners, Dr. Krishna Kumar and Dr. Kiran Mai. They are really working hard. I have seen, you know, with Aruna, Krishna Kumar, and you know, Krishna Kumari, and uh, Dr. De, um, Kiran Mai. They are in all the programs with Shanta, and I've seen them working day and night, and you know, they are working tirelessly to make this all virtual CME and some of the physical you know, conferences successful and memorable. We would like to thank our esteemed delegates who have joined with us virtually with great enthusiasm to make this program a grand success. Special thanks to Mr. Tilupati and his team for the technical support and for managing the event flawlessly. And Tilupati, I must uh, you know, appreciate you that every time whenever you are there as a technical person and you are doing so well, you know, that we don't find any problem even on our when we access on our mobile. So thank you very much. And my thank sincere you, thanks to Dr. Shanta Kumari and team for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Madhuri Patel, uh, Secretary General. Thank you so much. And uh, it is uh, thank you all uh, the invitees, uh, guests of honor and our faculty and uh, uh, the delegates. Uh, we move on to the scientific session.
and i hand over to dr kiran mai for taking it further over to you kiran thank you krishna ma'am uh, i think that was an excellent inspirational inauguration session we had uh, with real pearls of wisdom from both our guests of honor meera madam and kamini madam kamini rao madam and shanta madam and madhuri madam also so we go move on to the next uh, session of uh, three very important talks for this i would like to invite uh, our chairpersons dr varsha baste and dr anju soni uh, can i have uh, their cvs please so dr varsha baste we all know madam is the chairperson of oxy international academic exchange committee and she is a practicing gynecologist in nashik very senior person and a director of uh, pushpa fertility center ceo founder of cell gen anti aging center first adult stem cell therapy center in western india first icsi pgd baby in northern maharashtra and past president of obi gyn society of nashik uh, welcome you ma'am can i have uh, dr anju sonis uh, cv please you know madam is uh, chairperson of hiv aids committee of foxy 2022 and uh, secretary general elect of ims president of jogs president of uh, jaipur menopause society and lot more things her special interest is high risk pregnancy critical care gynae minimal invasive surgery urogynecology uh, welcome you ma'am i would now request you to introduce our speaker dr parikshit tank and his talk which is on fetal pro uh, metabolic programming early origins of disease over to you chairperson Varsha Basti was here a minute ago. Uh, uh, Anju ma'am, you can. Kiran, yeah, Varsha can I is there for some time. Kiran. Yeah, yeah. Varsha is there. Varsha, you do the introduction, please. Network was not good. Anju ma'am, ha, but you can. Yes, yes, I will. May I have the slide of Dr. Parichit Tank? <laughs> Dr. Prashant Dhan is practicing in uh, Mumbai, and he is a consultant in Ashwini Maternity and Surgical Hospitals for endoscopy and assisted reproduction. Consultant Jupiter Hospital Thani, another professor, Pacific Medical College, Udaipur. Consultant for assisted reproduction for. thank you thank you ma'am uh, i mean uh, this is a very formal introduction and uh, i mean i would perfectly all right to cut it short varsha ma'am uh, yeah very very important and new subject and uh, eagerly awaiting your talk dr parishit tang the screen is yours thank you thank you uh, varsha ma'am uh, i would request uh, the yeah okay i can share thank you right uh, i hope my slides are visible yes yes and are they on full screen no not yet no okay no. let me stop sharing and do it again not yet no not yet Is visible now. Okay. How about now? No, 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 no. Yes. Ah, uh, you yes. you have to go first to uh, slide share. Now we can see. We can see. So no. you have to go to slide show and then just say yeah, from the beginning. I know. Ah, uh, it's on my end. It is slide show, but for some. But we can see. Just click, Doctor Parikshit. Please click outside your this thing and then again come back to slide show. It will. Work. Yeah, that's what I did. That's what I did. Uh, what can we see now? Again. Is it the normal window no. or? No, no, no. It is. Uh, you are still not on uh, slide share. So uh, it is seen actually, but not in the slide show mode. Uh, yes, we are seeing that standard format of. Uh, okay. PPT. Uh, maybe I should just continue. Uh, yeah, yeah. Do do do. Sir. Yeah, once more. Try once more. Parikshit sir. Okay. Yeah. just stop sharing and then come back and 
uh, if too many windows are open then you will have problem also yeah no there's nothing else okay how about now yeah yes yeah. yes fine, okay. fine. right so sometimes you know zoom just acts yes. up <laughs> so uh, first of all my uh, sincere thanks to dr kiran mai and dr krishna kumari who are the conveners for today's program in organizing this very very important uh, subject that we are discussing today and of course my thanks to all the senior foxy leaders uh, some very very prominent people are a part of today's proceedings and uh, i must say uh, thanks to dr shantha kumari dr madhuri patel uh, for this opportunity and for allowing me to be a part of today's uh, event so what i am supposed to speak about is the fetal origins of adult disease or the developmental origins of adult disease as professor <coughs> amartya sen is a nobel laureate said amongst the most important freedoms that we can have is the freedom from avoidable ill health and escapable mortality and as science is evolving on this subject we are realizing that a number of so called uh, non preventable health conditions or chronic conditions have their origins in utero and there could be some potential preventability which comes into the picture when we understand how they originate so why are we talking about this subject because it's an underlying factor for a number of adult non communicable diseases and ncds are set to become or probably if we leave covid aside they've already become the major cause of morbidity loss of function and mortality for all human kind it's not only for a particular nation or a particular type of population it's across the globe the magnitude of non communicable diseases is huge and it's rising i mean if we look at statistics uh, from 1990 and compare it to projections what are expected by another 5 6 years nearly three quarters of morbidity and mortality are going to be because of ncds so there are a huge chunk of suffering what humanity has and let's understand that non communicable diseases are not confined to only the developed nations in fact developing countries is the place where there is the highest increase in the incidence of ncds and more than half of all mortality due to say ischemic heart disease is going to be in developing countries india is popularly known as the diabetic capital of the world and unfortunately this is a crown that should not rest very easily on our heads but it's unfortunately true and this is the fact of the matter today so the question when we talk about this fetal origins is you know the same one what came first is it the chicken or the egg and we know that there is no perfect answer but we know that the chicken and the egg they do come from one another so there is a interrelationship of the in utero milieu that is the environment and what happens many years later in adult life in the beginning there was a concept that yes uh, adult life could be influenced by what happens very very early in childhood but the person who formulated this concept of fetal origins was professor don barker and that's the name of the hypothesis ben. that we have today that is the barker's hypothesis very commonly said that the prenatal yeah. events influence adult mortality from cardiovascular disease and this is a science which started in the late 80s and bloomed in the 90s what does this hypothesis essentially want to convey that the origin of ncds ischemic heart disease cerebrovascular diabetes they originate because of adaptations which a fetus has to make when it is in utero and it is undernourished so you know we all have to adapt to our environment which is fine but when that adaptation becomes a mal adaptation 
and it causes a permanent biological change or a switch to a new metabolic paradigm that's where the problem start and once those metabolic shifts have happened and there is a reprogramming then it leads to further epigenetic events and therefore if it happens at that critical period of development it has a much more sustained and a long term impact on that particular individual so we are all children of a thrifty phenotype the undernourished baby has to conserve whatever it gets it doesn't have whatever it needs it's just making do with whatever it gets in utero and to maintain that condition it pushes the nutrients the blood supply to the vital organs that is the heart and the brain and there is less sugar and storage in the muscles so muscle growth gets traded off and the brain gets protected we are all familiar with this concept of the brain sparing effect that we see in growth restriction and combined with childhood obesity this leads to an early onset of insulin resistance and by the time that individual is in the late 30s early 40s they are on the way to type 2 diabetes so this is a diagrammatic representation of the same thing it leads to a pathophysiology maladaptations and therefore all sorts of metabolic syndromes typically what is called as syndrome x and there is a very very strong base of evidence that we have today in terms of cardiovascular disease stroke diabetes obesity cancer and a number of other chronic conditions so if we look at cardiovascular disease which is really the biggest ncd of them all low birth weight has been linked to adult cardiovascular disease in a large number of cohort studies in the caucasian world and that has been replicated in asians also and as it is the asian population is already disadvantaged in terms of in utero nutrition and therefore this whole thing gets much more magnified when it comes to our populations the same is true for type 2 diabetes as well there is a decreasing when the birth weight is lower and the ponderal index is lower you get more of insulin resistance and you have an earlier onset of type 2 diabetes than other populations all the preclinical events also like insulin resistance plasminogen activator factors the whole gamut of abnormal biochemistry is much more marked when the fetus has been deprived of nutrition in utero the same thing holds for obesity for cancer even because eventually what happens is that this metabolic syndrome leads to a hormonal environment which is hyper estrogenic there is more adipose tissue which will drive the estrogen levels and consequently you are going to have a higher chance of breast cancer in these women who have had malnutrition in utero there is a good amount of work which has linked it to other chronic diseases including impaired endocrine function macular degeneration schizophrenia autism and for the interest of the gynecologist the moment metabolic syndrome comes into the picture pcos is also going to follow so now the later uh, you know reviews and the literature is focusing on the early impact means not the 40s and the 50s we are looking at impact in the 20s and 30s to women who have been subjected to malnutrition when they were in utero the indian scenario has been very uh, extensively studied by professor yajnik and his group from pune and they have found that urban indian parents they have a higher risk of being obese 8 years after delivery so the mother is going to suffer and this findings are at odds as compared to the caucasian population so the changing concept now is of the developmental origins of adult disease where maternal nutrition and going right back to 
the impact on oocyte quality all that is being linked to something which is going to happen 35 40 years later and this is how the entire concept has evolved so the present status is that fetal Let's adult health connection the, has been quite video, well Parishit. sorry Oh, Bina, no. your uh, you bandwidth was becoming dead. Dr. Bina, you need to mute yourself. Oh, okay, okay, sorry. I thought somebody was saying. No, no, no. no, no. And there are over a hundred papers, epidemiological studies, uh, and cohorts which have gone on to prove this hypothesis, and it's becoming a central part of our public health and preventive medicine focus. So we've got to protect this fetus in utero so that we have. a healthy adult population and the implications are that women's health which is always a pressing issue has become in the forefront adaptive responses made by women before and during pregnancy are transmitted to the children what i was mentioning the epigenetic impact and the effects of environmental and dietary influences which are working in one generation are being passed on are being grandfathered into the next generation so they are also going through the same cycle what can we do about all this is uh, is it useful to change maternal factors is there a diet for pregnant women which will solve this problem would public health policy help and would fetal nutrition in some way improve the long term outcomes these are the questions in front of us I know Dr. Uday Thanawala and Ritu are going to speak on some of the aspects. I please excuse me for any overlap, but I'll be brief in this segment. Now there are certain maternal factors which are not modifiable, and there's nothing much we can do about it. For example, there's nothing you can do about the fetal genome or gender, placental disorders or parity. Uh, and then there are some like plasma volume and hormonal milieu which are impractical to try to manipulate but what can we do is look at things which can be modified so uh, smoking alcohol use an optimal diet and avoidance of an excessively hard physical workload these are some things what can be done on a public health setting the maternal diet has a strong linkage and we are very certain now that interventions to the maternal diet like manipulations and correction of the rate limiting nutrient intake that means supplementation will have some impact on maternal health as well as fetal health of course uh, animal experimentations have been done but they are not physiological at all can't be applied to human subjects but to a certain extent we can learn from these experiments and do something which gives women a balanced energy protein supplementation which can have a positive effect on birth weight and neonatal mortality improving maternal fat intake green leafy vegetable consumption and micronutrients will also correlate well with the fetal size at birth will nourishing the fetus make a difference well maternal nutrition is only the first step the ultimately the fetus has to have a good supply of the substrates that is oxygen water energy substrate and cofactors to realize its entire growth potential and only when it does so it will change the outlook from one generation to another so longitudinal studies have until now focused on epidemiology and phenomenology in the future what we'll be looking at is interventions and seeing what their long term impact is but of course the long term data on this is uh, something that we'll have to wait for food policy is very important when we talk about political determination so an individual's nutrition status is not only influenced by what he or she eats it's also the availability access absorption so many things and we know that there is a growing feminization of poverty and malnutrition so you're going to have a disparity a gap between the malnutrition status uh, between men and women and it starts very early in childhood even the under fives will show that kind of disparity so this is something which as gynecologists we need to look at now food policies 
are something which need to be adopted in a life cycle approach and it's the pregnant women and young children who have to be prioritized and local communities will have to make their own you know kind of uh, what is optimal for that particular population they'll have to formulate that at a local level in order to achieve this so this is like the life cycle approach if you see the downward spiral there's poverty and illness which leads to inadequate diets malnutrition sickness and ultimately death but if we break this it can actually go the other way and better nutrition will ultimately lead to a better generation of adults who are going to reproduce uh, and they are going to produce children who are going to be fitter and will break away from that thrifty phenotype that we are suffering from one of the examples of food policy has been iodine and uh, spectacular success on that front ever since it has become mandatory to iodize salt uh, the incidence of goiter cretinism mental retardation has been massively increased so yes i mean you know if there is a political will it is possible to do these things but where's the political will so as they say to awaken people it's the woman who must be awakened and once she is on the move the family moves village moves and the nation moves in much the same way once we nourish the woman we are going to nourish not only her but her offsprings and consequently the future generations which will make an impact on the fetal origins of adult disease thank you very much once again and uh, i'll be open to questions or if you plan to take them in the end that's perfectly fine thank you so much for this elaborate well study so minutely detailed uh, observation of yours and uh, the fetal origin is so important to get a healthy baby and healthy nation and healthy person and the next generation should be parichit for uterus so i am hand over the mic to dr um, uh, anju soni to talk over about his uh, talk thank you so much thank you dr kiran mai and the organizers krishna kumari for um, inviting me to be part of this very nice very 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 well organized nutrition uh, demasified uh, and i enjoyed thoroughly the leaders dr um, uh, meera ji and dr kamini devs and dr shanta kumari talk lovely lovely being here thank you thank you for having me thank you dr varsha Uh, at the offset i would like to congratulate uh, dr shanta kumari dr madhvi patel and the conveners of this program uh, dr kiran mai and dr krishna and of course all our dynamic vice president dr archana varma dr basav dr bipin pandit dr fesi and dr kavita who have uh, been doing a great job uh, as far as academics is concerned and we are all Uh, you know um, uh, talking about we have all been talking about the uh, diseases like uh, diabetes pregnant women and everything but this concept of nutrition is a beautiful uh, concept which has been you know which is going to bring uh, not only this generation but future generation also and uh, uh, i'm i'm very very honored that uh, today we have uh, had a chance of listening to our guest of honors dr veera as well as dr kamini's thoughts which was great and also dr i can see dr uday is there and we i am eager to listen to him also and dr parikshit you have really you know the uh, time was short and the topic was so big you know when i was going through it uh, earlier also because this topic i was i read earlier also it's a huge huge topic and you know you have covered so much in such a short time and we you know this concept though it's more than 3 decades old uh, as you said it is it was proposed by dr baker and hills in 1998 so it's more than 3 decades but still we have you know we are not still able, able to reach this area and this th is theory of programming of fetus where you know the fetus is uh, having the adverse effect in the utero that needs to be prevented so this is very very important concept and this concept has to go to each and every gynecologist per se and wherein the you know your concept of uh, uh, how it changes everything and how uh, we can what interventions we should do and how we can help this has to go to each and every member of our society 
and i feel that will create a lot of uh, you know thought process in everybody of us and to create a good future generation giving a good atmosphere to the fetus in the utero by nutrition is a great concept and you very well covered and very well enumerated very well researched and taken lots of pain to create such a huge thing in a small time congratulations to you sir thank you both thank you dr son thanks thank you thank you dr parikshit that was very lucid elaborate and i don't think we have any uh, queries right now so we move on to the next again another very important talk uh, about uh, the impact of nutrition on the obese pregnant women again day in day out uh, affair for us for this uh, i invite the chairpersons none other than our uh, vice pers- vice uh, president who is in charge of this program dr bipin pandit sir is the current vice president is the practicing gynecologist and obstetrician at uh, director of mukun hospital uh, honorary under, gynecologist at lh hiranandani hospital and sir is uh, so many things vice president foxy past president of mumbai ops and gyne past joint secretary foxy treasurer aicog 2013 mumbai chairman Viol- violence against doctors cell foxy uh, with special interest in laparoscopic surgery high risk pregnancy and singing of course we have heard sir sing so well so many times and sir published a book docu smart on ideal documentation welcome you sir and also i welcome another chairperson today uh, dr rosa olai who is director olai hospital and uh, research center she was the uh, chairperson of the adolescent health committee i do remember and madam is very much uh, passionate about all the social issues regarding girls and women and she was awarded the prestigious dc datta uh, prize for foxy best publication uh, book title recent advances in adolescent health awarded the prestigious mehrudara hansotia prize foxy best committee chairperson activities award for the year 2010 and 11 and authored four books and co-authored eight books in obstetrics and gynecology over to you chairpersons to introduce dr uday thanawala sir and his talk well thank you so much uh, dr kiran mai for the kind introduction and at the outset i want to congratulate you and dr krishna kumari for coordinating such an important topic um i've been hearing most of the talks though my fast is going on but i was nice to sit through i'll be breaking it at 6:30 today after your talk so uh, you know getting together and talking about nutrition is so very important it'll be nice to have one on adolescent diet as well because i feel that that is a topic which is most wanted especially when you talk about obesity and pcod amongst uh, teenagers now coming to talk about the topic which we are going to discuss with dear oday none other than our very dear dr uday tanawala a close friend of mine um i've been knowing him since long but for those are new pg young gynecologists who are here right now he is a consultant obstetrician gynecologist at navi mumbai he is at present the chairperson of the indian college of obstetrics and gynecology a very dynamic work that he is doing right now he has been the vice president of foxy treasurer of pcod society of india chair person of the medical disorders of committee foxy 2006 2000 that's the time i've been knowing uday since then founder secretary and past president of navi mumbai navi mumbai obstetric gynecology society joint secretary fox in 2005 gold medal in fc ps exam and a lot of awards and you know best dr dk award for best journal publication of fox in 2005 and i think i should also remind all of you that uh, he's been one person who's been Uh, you know long back in foxy when i think dr shirish dafari was there to talk about the painless delivery uh, i think that is something most of us were familiar yeah. with dr oday and the wonderful work that he's been doing the topic Thank that we're talking is impact of nutrition on pregnancy with obesity i think this is something very important importantly it is when uh, before they become pregnant we must check their bmis because most often if the bmi is high they land up in abortions however if they are pregnant now what to do So they over to you. I'm sure you're going to guide us more on that. Thank you so much. Stage is yours. Thank you, Rosa. It, it's absolutely nice to be having you, a lovely Rosa Olai, as a chairperson. Of course, uh, if Bipin is there, and thank you so much, uh, Dr. Krishna Kumari and uh, uh, the team for having me here for this uh, wonderful thing. Kiran, Kiran May, and uh, Anju Soni was there. Dr. Yashodra is there. Supriya is here, and, and uh, it's it's so nice to have you. Ajay is here. and i will take it off where uh, 
where uh, what what Rosa said and what what Shanta said in her speech. Ultimately, we are gynecologists, and and what do we tell the patient when when we are faced with that knowing that the patient has uh, nutritional issues? So that's where I'll start from. It's wonderful uh, to be here in this seminar because uh, it, it's different and it's it's been so well crafted. So <clears throat> this is it: the impact of uh, nutrition on the management of pregnancy with obesity and you know maybe GBM. So you know even when when the when the woman is heavy to start with, obviously you have heavier babies, and if you have GDM, of course you've got macrosomia. So the the, the problem comes: uh, you're sitting in a consulting room and you have this woman who is definitely obese or maybe even grossly obese and. When she walks into your consulting room, how do you broach the topic? You know, you can't be blunt as a doctor and tell her that you know what have you done to your weight? Why are you so obese? What do you think you're going to do about it? So you know, it, it, you have to you have to be a little cautious in not hurting their feelings. Of course, I, I'm somewhat blunt at times, and I and I just go ahead and tell them what I feel. But but basically, what I generally do is I tell them that okay, uh, you know, uh, what is your weight, and then what is your height, and and then I have this nice uh, uh, thing here, or you can calculate the BMI calculator, and this I think Maninder had given all of us, you know, long back. So calculate the BMI, and then you tell, then you point out to them that listen, uh, you know what, you're you're a little, you're you're overweight, or you're you you have you're obese, class one, class two, or you are extremely obese, and that is one way to bring in the subject of obesity into the patient who has just visited you, um, maybe for the first time uh, when she is pregnant, and then and then that is from where you have to take it up and tell them that look, now you are obese. You are pregnant, and this is what you need to be careful about. So, does obesity have an effect on pregnancy? Yes, all obese patients are more prone to complications, and as uh, uh, Rosa said, they are more prone to abortions. They are also prone to high blood pressure in pregnancy. They are prone to diabetes in pregnancy, and of course, they have more difficult deliveries. They have more chance of landing up with a cesarean section. The cesarean section itself is a little difficult. They can have complications of anesthesia. They can have complications of surgery. They can have post-operative complications like the wounds getting decent, or they are landing up with DVT. So when obesity is there in this woman who has become pregnant, she is prone to a lot of problems. So what are the goals of nutrition in pregnancy? In pregnancy, the goals of nutrition is to provide ad adequate nutrition for the mother and the fetus, as uh, Parikshit has just told us in his very beautiful lecture. to provide sufficient calories for appropriate maternal weight gain to help to maintain a normal bsl and prevent complications we have to avoid ketosis we have to minimize insulin requirement if the patient <clears throat> is a diabetic and in short it is an excellent glucose control has to be maintained with appropriate weight gain and adequate nutrient intake for an optimal outcome because we have said that the outcome which we want is a baby weight from 2.5 to 3.5 kilograms and not, not nothing much higher or nothing much lower and <clears throat> the woman needs to know about all this so what do you counsel a woman about nutrition so basically the principles are that you need to put on 10 to 12 kg weight gain in in the pregnancy uh, calorie counting has to be done and you have to distribute the calories in the diet and a dietitian chart and a planned diet according to body weight is crafted for this woman where you make sure that the obese woman is getting 25 to 30 kilocalories calories per kilogram and a non obese woman is getting 35 to 40 kilocalories uh, per kilogram and diet dietary compliance is evaluated and reinforced during hospital visits so basically one has to first make them aware that they are overweight and then of course you try and put them in touch with a dietitian and tell them that you know they need to have a very strict diet chart and a exercise regime to make sure that they don't put on too much weight so some of the do's and don'ts now if you don't have a dietitian in in, in your uh, setup and many setups do not have them now especially in uh, uh, mufasal areas etc so what you can tell them is that you know uh, eat small meals throughout the day plenty of green leafy vegetables rich uh, fiber uh, rich fruits and vegetables whole cereals like bajra and ragi and whole pulses like rajma and soya bean etc fat free or low fat milk tea and coffee you can have without sugar 8 to 10 glasses of water daily 
and a light exercise or a brisk walk for 30 minutes. You know, it's, it's, it's difficult to get these obese women moving because, but so they have to start slow, but they have to start definitely doing some exercise because most of them feel that if pregnancy, hai, to, you know, kuch, kuch nahi karna hai. They, they, that we need to, we did not do any exercise because they are pregnant. But for obese pregnant women, replace one any big meal with recipes such as jawar, chana pulao, vegetable sevenya, soya paua, soya uttapam, dalia pulao, or paustic roti. And replace any two small meals with nutritious snack like chas, vegetable soup, fruit, raita, vegetable itli, chana dal kebab, ankurit chana, hariyali khaman dhokla, or murmura chaat. So we as gynecs, at least can give this much information to the woman. Let's start doing this. If you have a dietitian, great. But if not, at least this much, I think everyone has to take out the time and tell them in the consulting that, look, you need to have a healthier diet and not put on too much of weight and not have too much of fatty stuff. So don't eat fried and sweetened items like chips, pakoda, sweets, and cold drinks. Consume and or don't consume refined wheat flour burger, cake, bakery items, avoid eating outside food items, avoid excessive use of oil ghee while cooking with meals. And when, and uh, you know, regular blood sugar needs to be examined, blood pressure and gestational weight gain has to be kept in, uh, in check and diabetes, high blood pressure and complication, uh, you know, these complications can occur. So make the woman aware that if you don't take care now, these are the problems you can land up with. And you know, once you tell them that they're doing it for themselves and the baby at a healthy pregnancy, they generally follow your advice. So, you know, it is, it is important to let them know and do a proper counseling. So this is a chart which you can have in your consulting or in your waiting room, etc. That if the patient is overweight, she can easily look at these things, you know, green leafy vegetables, pulses, etc. is important. While, um, you know, what, you sh- what she should avoid and, you know, what all she should be taking care of. Her blood pressure and the blood sugar needs to be uh, monitored regularly, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So all the, the, these sort of charts are now available, and one can put them up or make the patient aware about these uh, uh, simple things. And how do you manage <clears throat> the, uh, uh, especially if the woman is a GDM? Basically, we all know we first and the foremost, and ninety percent of the GDMs can be controlled on medical nutritional therapy and physical exercise. Very few of them now go on to hold like uh, hypoglycemics, and very very few. Uh, require insulin, insulin therapy when if they become GDM. <clears throat> so in nutrition during pregnancy, some myths are there, you know, like we just had a patient who said that, oh, you know, you know my mother is saying that don't, don't go from here to your office walking or, or you know, don't, don't climb up two floors if you are staying. I mean, and, and there are some, some things which are very uh, undoable. Like if, if a patient has a house on the second floor, what do you expect the husband to do? Just change the house because she's pregnant? You know, these sort of advices and these sort of things are given by so many women. And an obese pregnant woman getting pregnant, they also get the same advice what, what is given to a normal woman. So like, you know, pregnant women uh, eat for two. So we have to tell them that, you know, you do not need, you do not need to eat for two. The total energy requirements for pregnant women is only 10% more than the maintenance. The first In first trimester, there should be no weight gain and the weight gain should start from the second or third trimester and uh, low GI carbs and essential fatty acids should be a part of the macronutrient intake. So because once you tell them this and once it comes from a doctor and a gynecologist and obstetrician, then they say, okay, no, this is right. You know, otherwise they get 10 uh, different viewpoints from many different things. Now, this was a very study, a very important study done in Raipur. And they said that the percentage of women gaining more than the recommended gain was very high in the obese women. And uh, the prevalence of GDM and hyperglycemia in pregnancy also was very high. And that is why it is, the, we have to make them aware of the food treatment. And, uh, and to tell them that this is what you have to follow. The vegetables and fruit should be maximum. And as you go up the pyramid, all those products should be less and less. A simple ways of telling them how to uh, have a healthier diet. And the expected weight gain, yes, another big myth. They do not have to put on too much weight. Obese women need to gain just about 6 to 11 kgs throughout pregnancy, not more than that. 
and over and you know so or even four to eight kgs or four to nine kgs is enough for obese women because we do not need want them to put on too much weight. So that is about the weight gain. And this is what we can ourselves counsel the about medical nutritional therapy and sample diet chart can be recommended. Uh, 50 to 60 percent of calories from carbohydrates, 10 to 20 percent from protein, and 25 to 30 percent from fat. And the important tips which you can give the woman that all uh, groups of food uh, should be included in the diet, and uh, non vegetarian women can include uh, eggs, low fat meat, etc. And meal plan should be divided into three major meals breakfast, lunch, dinner, and two or three snacks in between. So that is how one tells them the diet chart. And this is what we have in general, what we have in our consulting also. And we tell them that this is the plate sort of, which we tell them, which is represented here, where, where half the portion of the thali should contain vegetables cooked as well as in form of salad, uh, guava, uh, apple and fruits, and one serving of fruit in a day. Basically, this is more important for the diabetic women. The women who are not a diabetic can have more fruit in the day because it is more fiber and uh, it is important that they, they, they take it. One fourth of the thali should contain cereals like chapati, brown rice, bread or, and other cereals. Protein and dal uh, should be there in at least one serving or, uh, of protein or dal should be there. Dairy is one serving of dairy product. And of course, you have to um, uh, in, uh, include uh, vegetables like lettuce, broccoli, spinach, etc. So it, it's, it's, you all know this, but how do you convey to the woman? So this is a simple way of telling the woman what her thali should have, you know, what her thali should have to, to have a healthy diet during pregnancy. And each region is different. Uh, in the South, it is different where you have Italy's, etc., which, which have to be consumed. And so you have to tailor make this to the region where you are practicing and tell them and then, you know, give them the options of what they can have in their food. So carbohydrates are a um, uh, problem and they should be made aware of the glycemic index of food that what will raise their sugar, what will give them uh, more of a uh, carbohydrates. So the extent of rise in blood sugar in response to a food in comparison indicates the response to an equivalent amount of glucose. And the carbohydrate that produces only a small fluctuation in blood glucose and insulin levels are called low glycemic foods and are recommended for obese women and for GDM women. And we should help them in choosing the uh, foods with low glycemic index. And this low glycemic index means less than 55%. And legumes, lentils, dried bean, peas, green gram, bengal gram, etc. all have low glycemic index, while fruits have higher uh, medium glycemic index. Another simple way of doing this, and this idea was propagated quite some time back, that even when, when we go to a hotel for a buffet lunch or something, this is the sort of uh, labeling which should be there, you know, instead of the regular written, you know, biryani or rice, there should be, there should be color code that the red ones are definitely to be avoided. The white ones are okay. You can have uh, 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 servings of them. Uh, the white, the red one is very little serving. Uh, white, the yellow ones is moderate, but the the green ones are safe. You know, when that that they can have, uh, the, they can be had. You can have repeated servings of this. So this is the this is especially important when you uh, as as remembering as the labeling that okay, this is green, this is yellow, and this is red. So be aware of the red things. Choice of a diet, always carbohydrate with a low glycemic index, lean proteins, and a, a balance of poly and mono, uh, unsaturated foils, and avoid uh, eating for two, fast and peace, and avoid healthy drinks. So in general trip dips, this uh, we all know that fried food should be avoided. Uh, whole fruit should be preferred over juices. Very important because many, many women think juices are very healthy. And we have to break this myth that no, uh, whole fruits are better than juices. Uh, prefer uh, f uh, fish or chicken over red or organ meat. Fiber should be increased in the diet by including salad, beans, non-starchy, vegetable, whole grain, cereal, pulses. Women must drink uh, water, buttermilk, soup, soya milk, and other things to, ma to maintain a healthy thing. And how do you achieve compliance? Okay, you have told the woman everything. But how do you achieve compliance? 
you have to explain her the relevance of proper diet that it's going to help her and the baby to have a smooth pregnancy make the choice through every day give them that local regional uh, things what they can do culturally accepted diet signaling system like i told you is very important and you can quantify these foods in a very um, healthy way so this is what what we can do to you know for a, a gdm specially she has to even monitor her sugar and she has to you know make sure that the sugar is normal and gdms and or our diabetics who have become pregnant because many of these obese women are diabetics once you tell them that the high sugar works in programming the fetus and this baby will become a diabetic in future like what parikshit has just said then they follow your advice to the t they will make sure that the value remains between 90 fasting and 120 post uh, uh, post meal you know so if you tell them that they will do that and they will make sure and they come up even the women who are not very um, uh, well educated or from a low social economic level they maintain the diet the sugar charts very well so it it is easy to counsel a gdm once uh, easy to follow up a gdm once you explain to them what the sugar will do um, uh, to the baby and of course role of exercise in maintaining blood sugar because it improves insulin sensitivity it also improves uh, increases insulin product by the pancreas and uh, 30 minutes of moderate to intensive activity is recommended and it could be aerobic or low resistance ex- exercise start slow 50 to 20 minute and then uh, increase it further because these women obese women sometimes take it uh, difficult to do and these are the small ex- these are the exercises which you can tell them push ups etc weight trimming which you can do at home because believe me in the in the lockdown it was a very very big problem to guide them about exercises and hip and exercises etc are very important in fact on our um, website we have some exercises which are told by the physiotherapist and they start you know start with 20 minutes a day and increase to 45 to 60 minutes a day of course make sure that they do not get hurt while exercising so basically you know this is a continuum like it has been stressed before and and rosa also brought it out and an adolescent pci who is basically uh, overweight but bothered about uh, now her weight etc we give her metformin and you know uh, she's at that time willing for a birth uh, weight loss program she gets married and then when she becomes pregnant early pregnancy there is no problem but then she starts eating and has uh, and you know eat for two cow because you have become pregnant they uh, she gained a lot of weight between in the mid pregnancy and then she get develops high blood pressure high blood sugar and you know suddenly you advise dietary restriction okay now you now no, 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 stop eating so then you, that patient may need insulin etc baby has microsomia polyhydramnia cesarean section then you know breastfeeding so and so this can be avoided like rosa said in the adolescent stage make them aware that this is a lifestyle change for you and so many young girls come that i have put on weight after getting married before that i was thin as if it's the husband is responsible for that no you yourself are responsible for your body you are the ones who put in weight you are the ones who have um, become obese so i think we have to take it up like you know in the adolescent stage and counsel all, all these uh, girls so basically once the obese woman comes to you keep them motivated give them choices of diet and exercise be supportive and not critical you know and keep their management goals in focus and that is what we can do and the this is the five ways approach approach you know to a pregnant woman who's obese you know ask and assess current lifestyle behaviors and body mass and their comorbidities and other factors related to the health risk because you have to assess her health you have to see whether she has blood pressure whether she has any other problem advise promote the benefits of a healthy lifestyle and explain the benefits of weight management assist develop a weight management program that includes lifestyle interventions tailored to the individual's uh, needs on severity of obesity risk factors comorbidities and plan and renew and monitoring and arrange a regular follow up referrals as required to a dietitian to an exercise physiotherapist or psychologist and support for long term weight management so these five a's we have to remember when we deal with a woman who is obese and has become pregnant thank you very much thank you dear ode as always very in depth and i'm so glad that you uh, brought the points which are very important at the beginning that is the first visit which is very important and that's the time you calculate this is something that most of us don't do and we yes. come directly be judgmental that you're fat you're obese 
But if that's the time you tell her that this is a BMI and look, see where the chart shows, I think that's a very good concept we all have learned from you today. And the five A's that you at the end summarize everything in it. I'm so glad you taught about the, you tell, told us about GDM, medical nutrition therapy for these uh, you know, patients who land up into complications of pregnancy. And I think to have a dietitian is excellent, yes, but the charts that you showed us, I think each gynecologist should have this colorful charts of, you know, yellow, green, red in the clinic and try to, you know, explain to the patient because whatever the gynecologist says, they pick up. The nutritionist would also help, but I wonder how many of them would go or how many of us have got a nutritionist at our clinic. Ode, thank you so much for the lovely, lovely talk, brought the good memories of you taking us, to, you know, about um, painless deliveries and diabetes. That's what your really work is. You've done excellent work in that sense. And I'm so glad that you spoke about this issue as well. Thank you so Thank much. You. And uh, at the out end, again, we have seen a lot of friends who are here, Supriya, Dr. Yashodra, Ajay, all of you. So nice to see everyone on Zoom. And again, congratulations, Dr. Krishna Kumari and Kiran. Uh, Kiran Mai about the wonderful work you're doing. Best of luck to all those who are appearing for elections. Dr. Krishna Kumari, you too as well. I can see you and I think uh, Vidya, you also there. Good to see you after a very long time. Oh, they're lovely. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Rosa. Thank you, Krishna Kumari. And thank you, Dr. Kiran Mai and, and the whole team. Thank you very much. That was wonderful, sir. I have, uh, I know we are, we are losing time, but still I have to have uh, one question. Uh, the resources, the charts that you have shown, they were they were so wonderful. Uh, if you can tell us the resources. Yeah, even Maninder like the charts. Maninder, yeah. thank you very much. I read your comment. We are you. moving to a new MCH building. So, absolutely beautiful charts. Very self-explanatory, sir. These yeah, are I very think self explanatory I think. Yeah. Very yeah. good. Yeah, yeah, many of them, I think, also on the FIGO website. Which you have shown. The plate. But, the plate. Yeah, the plate. Okay, let me. Plate is WHO. This plate was made by the PCA Society of India, and uh, uh, what what we have in our consulting. But a similar plate right now has been released by Dr. Hema on yeah, the GDM yes. day on the tenth of March. I think Vidya was there at yeah, that yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, I was. Vidya, there. I think it was originally by WHO. Yeah, I suppose so. I mean, ah, but, but originally it's a very it was by WHO. You know, patients yeah. actually look at it when you tell them that, "Arey, abhi aisa, you know, tumara thali aisa change karo." They actually look at it and then they say, okay, at least something goes here. Goes <laughs> here. <laughs> uh, Dr. Uday, I, I, I want to say that uh, in my food, drugs and medical surgical equipment committee workshop, I may yeah. distribute some of the plates if possible. Uh, that's a great workshop. idea, ma'am. Uh, we can yeah. give it to our pregnant woman whenever we are having yes, So I'll be planning to distribute these plates in my workshop. Please do come for my workshop at Indore. Yeah. Great, great Vidya will be there. And we'll get up in having your consulting because it makes your job so much yeah, easier. Very you know, easy, you, very easy, very easy. You just show them this plate and BMI is an icebreaker. You know, you tell the woman, okay, this is your yeah. BMI. What have you been doing with <laughs> you your still have this, this video, yeah, I still have. Yeah. <laughs> having said that, uh, psychosocial issues, sir, again on women are too much i think now you become thin now you eat now you don't eat now you are lactating you eat and all this kind of also adds to the oh yeah i've that... had women who have actually cried over here that it is so easy for you people to say okay. but yes. it is so difficult for us to do and, so and I, it becomes I've been, it, I've been put on oc pills etc but nobody told me it is directly related to diet you know people just treat but you, you have to tell them the pathophysiology of PCOS, you know, why they need to lose weight. And then it then it gets over there and then they without do it. Blaming, without blaming and uh, in a supportive way. Thank, thank you, sir. You. That was thank you so much. Thank this you. is the most difficult, not hurting them. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Especially adolescents. Yes. yes. So we move yeah, on to... Very much. Uh, yeah. Krishna, ma'am? Yeah. You wanted to say something. Please go ahead. Please go ahead. So another uh, very important talk, Dr. Kamini Rao, ma'am, and uh, me and Krishna, madam, also were uh, wishing to have this uh, in a, you know, nutraceuticals in uh, gynec disorders, but we had to uh, alter this a bit. And again, uh, PCOS, the role of nutraceuticals rather than the medications and all. So we have uh, our chairpersons, uh, Dr. Rajinder Singh Pardesi, sir, had, uh, had an emergency surgery. So he had to leave uh, because he had to attend to his patient. So, nevertheless, let me introduce, sir. 
sir is the was the chairperson of food and drugs committee and he is presently a very very important leader of amox he presented many papers was faculty and uh, he is now vp of amox and he was vp of foxy and president of amox uh, 2022 24 Uh, and uh, next chairperson is Dr. Yashodara Pradeep, ma'am. Uh, can I have next uh, CV? Madam is Vice President Elect of Foxy 2022 and Professor at ELMCH, Ex Professor and Head OB Gyn, Dr. R M L I M S Lucknow, and she is very senior member who had been president, who is president of Lucknow OB Gyn Society, president of Lucknow Menopause Society, Vice President of IMS, Chairperson of Family Welfare Committee. She had received many awards. And a founder member of ISOPA, PCOS, LMS, and this part at Lucknow. And uh, I welcome you, ma'am. Uh, Yashodra, ma'am, you have to do the honors of introducing the speaker and also concluding the talk. We have Dr. Ritu Hinduja who will be speaking on the topic. Thank you, Dr. Kiran Mai, for kind introduction. May I have a, may I have a slide of Dr. Ritu Hinduja? uh uh have you shared this uh, your screen share dr ritu ma'am do you do you yes. want me to share my screen because the uh, slide is there after, after this uh, you yes yes yes, yes. so it's my privilege to introduce a very young obstetrician and gynecologist dr ritu hinduja uh, you are working very well in the pco society i remember because i have heard many talks of you in the pco society on nutrition thank you yeah so she is a senior consultant in reproductive medicine at nova ivf and member of managing committee iesar 2020-22 and member of managing committee maharashtra chapter 2123 and she is having so many awards like mox uh, shatan bai gulabchand traveling fellowship uh, cg saraiya traveling fellowship banu bhan nanavati traveling fellow you have so many fellowships of traveling fellowships so really well traveled from the foxy <laughs> dr pramila bhatia wrote for the ma'am yeah uh, let me just finish and yes, rd pandit sa award h palip award for the best research in recurrent pregnancy loss and she has authored many chapters and also has her credit many publication index journals and she is the editor of nova handbook of infertility abnormalities of the pelvis and editor of the nova textbook on infertility so uh, ritu uh, i am really glad to introduce you and now the screen is yours so you can share your screen thank and, you ma'am uh, talk about it uh, and thank the topic you. is your topic is uh, coq in the pcos coq 10 in pcos yes ma'am can you see my screen yes you have to do a uh, slide show yes ma'am i'll do it am i in slide show mode for of everyone course, of course yes. you are in the, and you are well yes. audible thank you ma'am thank you so much so uh, my topic today is the role of uh, coenzyme q10 in i'm not able to change the slide okay yeah in uh, pco management uh, so i'm not going to talk about pcos uh, as a disease uh, of course uh, Uh, I'm sorry. In the rush of doing the talk and uh, finishing it on time, I have, I have to thank uh, Foxy. I have to thank Shanta Kumari, Madam, Dr. Kirnay, Madam, and Dr. Uh, Kumari, Madam, for having me here for the talk. Uh, so uh, again, I'll go back to my talk. Uh, that polycystic ovarian syndrome we all know. I'm not going to be talking much about it. I'll just go on to the next slides. Why we are talking about, uh, you know, the role of uh, coenzyme Q10 in PCOS. Uh, patients with pcos are at a lifelong risk of metabolic abnormalities like how we all know uh, like this glycemia this lipidemia visceral obesity hypertension and cardiovascular diseases for time unknown we have actually blamed insulin resistance for this because this is our main villain and that is how we think that you know this woman goes into this vicious cycle where there's hyperinsulinemia there's hyperandrogenism and then the entire uh you know everything goes for a toss there are things that happen in the liver the brain everything just goes for a toss what have we discovered recently is that in the polycystic ovary it is basically the mrna which is responsible so if there is a degeneration or if there is abnormality of the mrna and uh, there is 
uh, there's a target to PTN to down-regulate PTN, which activates the MAPK ERK pathway and then aggravates the insulin resistance in uh, PCO women. So if you go to see, it is all related to the mRNA. Now, coming to this slide, we understand that uh, mitochondrial da damage actually takes place because of oxidative stress. And that reduces mitochondrial function, which reduces the ATP availability, lowers the antioxidant capacity, and then in turn increases the reactive oxygen species, which in turn causes oxidative stress and then leads to more mitochondrial damage. So if you can see, it's a loop we are stuck in, in these patients. So there's, uh, there's a reverse, you know, there's oxidative stress causes central obesity, it causes increased LHFSH ratio, it causes insulin resistance and hyperandrogenism, which can lead to various, uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, picture that a woman of PCOS expresses. We, it is a well-known and established fact that women with PCO exhibit mitochondrial ultrastructure damage and there is an increase in the reactive oxygen species production. So when we are managing PCOS, are we like Alice in Wonderland and we missed, uh, missed the wisdom of the Cheshire cat? We are just hustling. I really think we just hustle between lean PCOS, obese PCOS. We're just trying to figure out what to give them to control their symptoms. We are just trying to give them symptomatic relief, that we're trying to get them out of the loop of uh, you know, uh, the entire hyperandrogenism, insulin resistance. We just are struggling. We are hustling to get them out of the loop. And we have an entire battery of, uh, you know, drugs available for us to kind of help us achieve that. So there comes the role of antioxidants. Now we are talking about antioxidants. So just a little bit of brief about what are antioxidants. Antioxidants is a molecule capable of inhibiting the oxidation of other molecules. Oxidation reaction can form free radicals and these start chain reactions that damage cells. Antioxidants terminate these chain reactions by removing free radical intermediates and inhibit other oxidation reactions. They neutralize the substances that can cause damage uh, to the genetic material by oxidation. So we saw in the previous slide that it is all about oxidative stress and that is where the role of antioxidants come in a PCO woman. So coenzyme Q10, basically the name uh, for coenzyme Q10, which is an alternate name, is ubiquinone. And ubiquinone comes from the word ubiquitous, which means it is found everywhere. So these days, coenzyme Q10 is used for millions of indications, even for people with heart disease. So there's a beautiful study where it was conducted in Japan, where they were using it in patients with heart disease to reduce their um, you know, oxidative stress. Coenzyme Q10 might help increase energy. This is because coenzyme Q10 has a role in production, AT, producing ATP, a molecule in body cells that functions like a rechargeable battery in the transfer of energy. So we all need energy for it's every fine. process that happens uh, in our body and so on ovulation, so on reproduction, so on you know menstruation, everything requires energy. This is a structure of coenzyme Q10. We're not going to get into the details of that. Coenzyme Q10 is an effective antioxidant that can protect ovaries from oxidative damage. Studies have shown that dietary supplementation of coenzyme Q10 can improve the metabolic and endocrine indices of PCO patients, as well as insulin resistance and endothelial cell function. Ramani et al. in a beautiful study found that 12 weeks of oral administration, and we will see it in my uh, coming upcoming slides as well, that this period of 12 weeks is very important. If you give it for less than 12 weeks, it actually has, you know, they've seen no effect of coenzyme Q10 uh, if you've given it for less than two, 12 weeks. So 12 weeks is a very beautiful period that they have described. 12 weeks of oral administration of uh, 100 milligrams of coenzyme Q10 per day. The serum fasting plasma glucose, the fasting insulin levels, and the HOMA IR levels of PCO patients were significantly reduced. Similarly, a meta-analysis reported that coenzyme Q10 could even reduce HbA1c in patients. Coenzyme Q10 can improve glucose metabolism indicators in patients with different pathophysiological conditions uh, like non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, diabetes mellitus, and metabolic syndromes. So there was a study done by Shoda et al. that suggested that interleukin-1 inhibits the glycemic release of insulin while coenzyme Q10 blocks the inhibition of interleukin-1 thereby you know, helping us achieve glycemic uh, 
control. Low dose of coenzyme Q10 can promote the differentiation of islet of progenitor cells. Coenzyme Q10 is an effective antioxidant which has has been proven to prevent lipid and protein peroxidation and scavenging free radicals in the body and cells. If coenzyme Q10 is deficient, the above process will be abnormal, free radicals will get accumulated, and oxidative stress damage will occur. Coenzyme Q10 can regulate the amount and function of inflammatory factors, insulin re receptors, adamonectin receptors, glucose transporters, and so on and so forth and so as to regulate the glycolipid uh, metabolism and improve insulin resistance. This was a study which was done in 2006, where they studied the ROS-induced oxidative stress in the development of insulin resistance and hyperandrogenism in PCO women. And they concluded that ROS generate generation for mononuclear cells in response to hyperglycemia is increased in PCOs, independent of obesity. The resultant oxidative stress may contribute to a pro-inflammatory state that induces insulin resistance and hyperandrogenism in women with this disorder. There was another study that studied the plasmatic and intracellular markers of oxidative stress in normal weight and obese patient in PCOS, and they found that there was no difference whether the woman was obese or whether she was lean. Then there was another study which studied the independent and additive effect of coenzyme Q10 and vitamin E on cardiometabolic outcomes and visceral adiposity in women with PCOS. And this was a study which was published in 2018. And this study concluded that coenzyme Q10 and vitamin A alone or in co combination has beneficial effects on the cardiometabolic outcomes among women with PCOS. Then there was another study, which uh, was a double-blinded and placebo-controlled trial, uh, which uh, again concluded that the overall coenzyme Q10 supplementation for 12 weeks among subjects with PCOS has beneficial effects on glucose metabolism, serum total, and LDL cholesterol levels. I'm sorry. Huh. The effect of coenzyme Q10 supplementation on metabolic profiles and parameters of mental health in women with polycystic ovarian syndrome was also studied. And this study was published in very recently in 2021, where they concluded that 12 weeks of supplementation of coenzyme Q10 in PCO women showed beneficial impact on a lot of parameters like total testosterone, DHEAs, hirsutism, sex hormone binding globulin, and a lot of other levels. So as a fertility specialist, I got around thinking that are we only having cardioprotective uh, effect of giving coenzyme Q10 in PCO women or are we only achieving uh, a good glycemic control, uh, you know, in these women? Are we not getting any kind of effect on the oocyte quality and in turn the embryo quality? And the answer that I found while researching was yes, by giving coenzyme Q10, in women with PCOS, we are actually also getting better quality oocytes and in turn resulting in better quality embryos and better implantation and clinical pregnancy rates. So this was a study which was done uh, again very recently in 2021, which studied the effect of coenzyme Q10 supplementation to improve the human oocyte quality. And it concluded that coenzyme Q10 constitute a safe, well-tolerated therapy capable of improving oocyte quality through oxidative stress counteraction and mitochondrial function enhancement. In humans, oral coenzyme Q10 supplementation appears to exert positive effects, particularly at the follicular level by creating a more favorable environment for competent follicle development. So yes, we get a better oocyte and we get more better follicular uh, environment. Uh, so antioxidants are essential for protecting cells from damage in PCO patient. Coenzyme Q10 acts on an antioxidants and reduces the oxidative stress by increasing the production of cellular energy. Coenzyme Q10 recycles vitamin E and prevents its pro-oxidant activity and it helps in ovulation induction as well. So uh, the, it has been published in a lot of repute journals that the intake of 12 weeks of coenzyme Q10 can have a positive effect on glucose metabolism, on serum total LDL, uh, serum total and LDL cholesterol levels. It can improve the gene expression of LDLR, interleukins, uh, tumor necrosing factors, and can also have positive effects on ovulation and clinical pregnancy rates. 
Then uh, this was a study which was done again in 2020, where they studied the association of polycystic ovarian syndrome or annual ability infertility with offsprings, psychiatric and mild neurodevelopmental disorders. So you have to understand that PCO only does not affect the woman who is having PCOS, but it also affects the next generation. So if you go to see, there was this study which said that uh, for the first time that maternal androgen exposure but not obesity, is the main cause for the observed transgenerational effect of androgen exposure that are passed on for up to not one, not two, but three generations. So if you go to see my initial slide, I had said that hyperandrogenism is also related to reactive oxygen species and oxidative stress and mitochondrial damage. So we all can now go back to it. Uh, at the end, I would like to say sometimes the questions are complicated, but the answers are really, really simple. Maybe coenzyme Q10 is a part of the answer that we are looking for, for controlling some kind of, uh, you know, getting gly glycemic control, cardioprotective effect, improving the oocyte quality and protecting the next generations that are coming for women with PCOS. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ritu, for finishing in time first. <clears throat> And before that, I would like to say my sincere thanks to all the Foxy office bearers, Dr. Shanta, Dr. Madhuri, Dr. Vice President, Dr. Arjuna, Dr. Basab, Dr. Vipin Pandit, Dr. Pressi, and Dr. Kavita Bapat, Dr. Suvarna, Dr. Aruna, Dr. Parikshit Tang, and Dr. Niranjan for giving me this opportunity and making me a part of this very, very important topic, which is really very close to my heart, that Foxy Quest series on nutrition on nutrition demystified. Uh, Ritu, you have talked very well. There's no doubt about it. I have joined from a beginning and I have seen that we have seen that nutrition plays a part from in utero to the geriatric. So womb to tomb, you can say. The nutrition is very important. And oxidative stress is one of the important factors for many, many diseases, whether it is a cardiovascular, whether it is a PCOS, whether it is an infertility, so many things. And we can say that this oxidative stress, because ROC, we are uh, studying and we are listening this word and we are using this since long from the oligospermia and all those has come, uh, this ROS. So oxidative stress, ROS is very, very closely knit to each other. So my point is, as we have seen other faculty has talked, other speakers were there. So good nutrition is a very important factor for reducing the oxidative stress and ROS both. So it is a good nutrition and good nutrition means you should have lots of fruits and vegetables because they are the one, the carotene they have got and they reduces the oxidative stress. So we know that PCOS has got a both genetic and environmental factor. And as you have said that it is a uh, lean and it is a obese PCOS both. And lean are very difficult. Obese is still, we can manage very well. But I just want to say that, that COQ10 is not a medicine. It is just a nutritional supplement. Although it has been said that it reduces the, it gives a cardio protection, it reduces your blood pressure, it has a positive effect on your blood sugar and so many things. But the studies do not say that it is really there. So, it, they, But statins, those women who are on the statins, it has got an important role to play because statins are associated with the myopathies and also with some of the problems of um, malabsorption also. So I believe that because COQ is not a cheap drug, it is an expensive drug. So it can be given to certain a group of the patients as in fertility, you said, because it's an expensive treatment or to other people. But for common people, I say, still I'll say, I'll say and I learned from Dr. Kamni Pandit because I know first book I have read of her pregnancy and nutrition. And from there, I started my passion in the nutrition and I always say three or four lines for the nutrition in pregnancy. So this PCOS is very, very important thing and COQ, we know that it starts, PCO may start from the in utero genetic factor and develop uh, phenotypes develop later on. 
so it's an important thing is a dietary supplement it can be given to a certain group of the patients uh, especially the infertility because it's expensive management uh, treatment and very very needed management also for a woman the infertility treatment but overall i would still like to emphasize that diet is the most important thing and the bmi as dr uday thanawala has said only by saying that your bmi is this you should try to do this and there's certain there's so many ways you can explain you reduce that like this you do this you do this there's so many prescriptions are there you can adopt any of them whatever your uh, woman is going to choose girl or the woman is going to choose about it so thank you so much uh, kiran and dr krishna kumari for giving me this uh, because kiran is probably talked to me i was in us at that moment but today only i landed but i could not say no to kiran uh, for this uh, i you can imagine i am such a jet lag but still i said no no today only i landed in the early morning 11 o'clock or something so i said no i will join so thank you so much krishna and kiran thank for, you for joining us yeah and, and with for you really you. wonderful uh, cme on the nutritional dismystified I, I never thought of that it can have so much in a four five hour CME. It could be. I just could never imagine it because I heard in it um, various platforms. Yeah. But you. today it was really everything was concise, and the PCO has also been taken into it. Yeah. Um, not only the pregnancy, it is the PCO also. So it has got a everything has got its own role. Like those who cannot afford uh, the diet, uh, good diet. they can have the supplements supplements are really important sometimes so thank you so much thank you ashodhra ma'am for joining uh, dr you, you have done a wonderful job yeah that rosa was fasting you are in us still you all made it to the webinar and uh, really all of you the nutrition is uh, something which everybody likes fortunately yeah. you are so senior so i left before i left for my travel because it took nearly quite a lot time because of this ukraine business and all those things yeah thank you ma'am so now without further delay we are still again every time we make an attempt uh, not to overshoot the time but it does happen but again we are awaiting a very very interesting uh, panel with uh, again two seasoned uh, foxians who are the present chairpersons both again very apt i should say one is the one was the food and drugs committee chairperson and the other one is presently the medical uh, disorders chairperson so who else but the two of them so dr vidya tobi and dr komal chavan come together for this moderating this panel we have restricted this to nutritional anemia with only iron b12 and folic acid i think i hope they have a very interesting case scenarios uh, and we also have pan india uh, panelists who are really wonderful uh, uh, you know clinicians academicians practitioners uh, can we have the series quickly please it's 19 hours yeah dr komal uh, as i have told is the chairperson of oxy medical disorders and pregnancy committee she holds uh, a diploma in reproductive medicine she is the medical director of chavan maternity and nursing home and senior consultant at bn desai hospital mumbai honorary professor at arin cooper hospital and hpt medical college uh, she has lot of awards and prizes which i am not going to list out now because we all know her so very well next cv dr vidya madam so dr vidya tobi madam is uh, a very senior person uh, professor and junior unit head department of obg al amin medical college vijayapur karnataka She was the chairperson of Food, Drug, and Medical Surgical Equipment Committee for Oxy 2018-2020. She backed the Best Committee for Oxy Award, Dr. Mehru Dara Hansotia, and she is <coughs> ICOG Governing Council member for Oxy Champion Award, National Corresponding Editor, Jogi, and Organizing Chairperson of Kasoga 2016, yes, yes. and so many more. Welcome you both. Uh, can I have the panelists' uh, CVs projected, please? Yeah. Uh, we have Dr. Supriya Jaiswal, who is the Secretary of Patna OB/GYN, and uh, she is at works at a government hospital and uh, she is the ezone coordinator for the adolescent health committee excellent work in this field and member of adolescent health committee foxy next cv 
next panelist we have dr bina singh uh, she is uh, from the from meerut and she did her md gyni ops from uh, meerut and in which she was awarded gold medal and uh, presently dr bina uh, also uh, is the secretary of uh, bijnor obigain society and uh, she has pres- main uh, field of interest is infertility and she has many uh, academic achievements to her credit and many memberships and a faculty at various uh, national and international uh, cmes and conferences next next cv dr ruchi shrivastava is from uh, greater noida she is the founder secretary of the greater noida society and she is a senior faculty and additional ms at sharda hospital and professor in school of medical sciences and research center at greater noida Uh, welcome you dr ruchi can i have the next uh, cv slide please dr shobha is from karnataka she is from bagalkot she is the secretary of the bagalkot society she is again very academic and very active in the karnataka chapter i have seen her uh, participating in many cnes and her areas of interest is non descent vaginal hysterectomy vaginal delivery next Uh, Dr. Priyanka Agrawal, uh, she is a consultant and infertility specialist at Dr. M. C. Agrawal Hospital and Research Center, and Dr. Prerna Agrawal, IVF and Test Tube Baby Center. Again, field of infertility. She received an award for poster presentation in AMPOX 2014. She is presently secretary of Firozabad Ops and Gynae Society. Welcome you, Dr. Priyanka. Next, yeah, and uh, again we have Dr. Renu Chuk, who is. Uh, consultant again ivf specialist at chub multi specialty hospital bhivani and uh, she is the president of uh, bhivani obigain society and she had been the president of haryana isr recipient of rashtriya gaurav award and golden aim awards uh, welcome you all uh, esteemed panelists i now hand over uh, to dr vidya madam and dr komal chavan to take it further mm, thank you thank you dr kiran and at the outset i thank uh, dr shanta kumari and uh, dr madhuri patel and all the foxy organizing team of this uh, very important uh, webinar on nutrition and as a food drugs and medico surgical equipment committee i really as a past chairperson i congratulate them for having such a uh, good interactions and good speakers on dais so let me share my screen and i really thank uh, dr krishna kumari and dr kiran mai for choosing me and komal for this uh, uh, very ma'am uh, vidya ma'am if i may interrupt uh, uh, 40 yeah. 40 minutes is uh, that all depends on my uh, panelist <laughs> we will uh, try to restrict very well and the senior panelist yeah, yeah. hope my uh, slides are moving and uh, they are on slide show just make it full screen yeah full, i have made it uh, full screen no it is not now just no. just press from beginning i think slide show you have yeah mm, again i'll share yes okay click so from hope... beginning that's it you have clicked slide show just press from beginning okay i don't know something is wrong with my slide show i think yes uh hope my slides are moving and it is in slide show yes komal i can't see i can see the slide but it is not yeah. on the slide show it's not full screen it's not full screen ma'am full screen yeah, it's not full screen yeah, can we yeah. do it from here Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. I have, yeah, yeah. I have told uh, Doctor uh, Mr. Venkat he's sharing now. Yeah, let let him share. Yeah. Sometimes uh, though we try this Zoom kind of, uh, you know. Yeah, yeah. So I think uh, now they are moving. No, yes. ma'am. So you just they press from moving. beginning. I think there is no problem. There is a slide show you have clicked. 
just press from the current slide or beginning then it will happen no venkat has uh, that uh, ma'am yeah you can share now i'll i'll uh, Yeah. yeah 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 i have shared now uh give me yeah click that so uh, venkat i have approved uh, permission to you you can control my screen or uh, i'm just moving the screen uh, i welcome all the panelists who are there dr reenu dr supriya dr shobha dr ruchi dr priyanka dr beena so welcome for the this important panel um it's not moving actually oh uh, so you only share the screen i don't mind but uh, that will be difficult for us because we want to move as fast as possible um, uh, uh, you want me to share the screen yeah uh, yeah you can share but i have to move how i will move i'll try okay. once more some zoom problems yeah. i think some zoom problems yeah Mm. Komal, can you start from the beginning? Yeah, I'll start from. The It was not giving me option to start from the beginning. But yours are seen as a slide show, right? Chalo, chalo. As I go on speaking, I hope uh, Komal, you will change. Yeah, yeah, I will change. <laughs> so today we are discussing something uh, about the nutritional deficiencies and anemia and i welcome all the panelists i welcome my co moderator dr komal also uh, because she has authored a very nice book on hematological disorders and as well uh, many disorders and uh, we have learned many things today how the disorders and the nutrition are interconnected so welcome all the panelists uh, uh, i welcome you to this important discussions Uh, next slide yeah so always we talk of uh, nutrition in life cycle and the balanced diet so there are various critical period for the development uh, of embryo fetal organs and tissues and most important uh, the whatever uh, things we discuss about the micronutrients are iron b12 vitamin d folate and iodine as well as uh, these occur in throughout the Uh, all the trimesters not only all the trimester postpartum during best breast feeding and all those things and there are various issues also like age at conception energy balance we discussed about obesity various chronic diseases and various infectious diseases risk management also we talk of immunity and various micronutrients so think nutrition first that's what our fibo says so today something about nutritional anemia this nutritional anemia occurs due to deficiency of, of various hematopoietic micronutrients which leads to inadequate erythropoiesis and reduced hemoglobin concentration yes and uh, we know that more than a quarter of world's population is anemic with about half of the burden from iron deficiency you can see here uh, india we have 74% Uh, of the population less than 11 gram percent and see the sri lanka it is only 30 percent so this is up from the who global database on anemia so anemia mukta bharat that's what is our uh, whatever slogan and uh, we know various uh, hemoglobin concentration levels to diagnose anemia I'll, we will not go into the details of that but everybody should know what is mild moderate and severe anemia Uh, these are various international and indian goals and uh, in the second uh, of the six global goals aims for the 50% of the reduction of anemia in women of reproductive age and uh, there are various sdg goals also according to second goal on it, uh, ending hunger and target 2.2 which aims to end all forms of malnutrition by 2030 
and we know recently portion abhiyan 2 also where the government uh, targets reducing stunting underweight and low birth weight by 2% a year and anemia prevalence by 3% a year overall india plans to reduce anemia levels to one third of what was recorded in the fourth national family health survey by 2020 so this is the year which is going on and we have to end this uh, and we have to strive hard to have anemia mukt bharat yes next komal can you change again it is not moving venkat uh, what can be done one second just check yeah so uh, i'll just talk about uh, the nutritional uh, deficiency anemia the intake of protein and iron rich food Uh, which is very low amongst indians which is coupled with the poor absorption which is a major cause of anemia and underweight so poor iron intake and compromised iron absorption these are the two things we also remember should remember about uh, nutritional deficiency anemia and this nutritional anemia it contributes to about 24% of the maternal deaths every year and is one of the important cause of low birth weight uh so anemia in pregnancy is uh, global health ma'am no slides are there right now there are no slides but i am speaking to okay, save okay. the time because the okay, questions okay. will start this is just a introductory slides sure, sure, uh, sure. once the slides will come now i'll just move those slides okay sure, sure. okay yeah. so i was talking about the anemia in pregnancy which is a very global health problem and uh, we have to differentiate that is a dilutional anemia which is a part of normal pregnancy physiology so we have to differentiate about the anemia what are the various uh, different causes of anemia dilutional uh, physiological anemia iron deficiency anemia anemia of the chronic infections all these things we have to differentiate by clinical examination as well as we have to have a support of uh, various investigations thus it is very critical to distinguish iron deficiency anemia from physiological anemia and other less common causes of anemia also should be known that may require the treatment so can i ask uh, dr renu chu about uh, what is what are the uh, etiological factors about this various deficiency anemias factors which are required for the erythropoiesis uh, in a very short and crisp answer she can explain uh, to us hello good evening everyone good evening, good evening. Uh, yeah thanks dr vidya for inviting me at the outset i want to thank everyone dr kiran as well for inviting me for this panel so without wasting any time i just want to come to the point the main factors which are in the required for erythropoiesis they are the proteins the minerals the trace elements vitamins and of course few hormones as well yes and the <clears throat> main reason for uh, this uh, anemia during pregnancy it is the uh, deficiency of these micronutrients yes which are required for erythropoiesis so as we have been listening so far diet diet and diet so the dietary intake is the most important if there is less dietary intake it is not proper of course it will lead to the anemia and the various factors which uh, which hamper the absorption of diet patient is taking good diet but still she is anemic because there are certain factors which will hamper the absorption uh, in her body so these are like malabsorption syndrome certain food certain drugs like alcohol and uh, calcium and certain things eggs they hamper the absorption so it it is one of the causes of anemia then third is increased iron demands in the body patient is taking good diet there is no malabsorption but still she is anemic because the body wants more and more iron so this happens in patients uh, uh, like uh, pregnancy like patients having infections 
tubercular infections, parasitic infections, and many other infective diseases. And in the last, there is no infection, but still patient is anemic. We think, what is the cause? Maybe she is losing blood somewhere uh, from the body. So maybe then we have to think about various things like she is bleeding from piles, she is bleeding from genitourinary tract, or she is having some hookworm infection, or some infections like malaria, trauma, surgery. I mean, so many causes are there. So all these causes clubbed together will give us the conclusion to reach, to find out the final cause of the patient, why she is anemic. So only then we can treat, because always we should not think that diet is the reason. Diet is one of the causes, but many patients, they belong to well-to-do families and they are taking good diet. I mean, they don't have any uh, monetary problem. They don't have any lack of knowledge, but still they are anemic. So in such patients, we have to think about other causes as well to reach to the conclusion so that we can treat the patient in a better way. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Renu. And as you told, there are so many factors involved for this erythropoiesis. So mainly we talk of uh, proteins, minerals, various trace in elements and vitamins and hormones. And uh, we also know about the various, the four things you told about the inadequate diet, increased demand, the blood loss or uh, any infection, focus of infection. And uh, these are the very important causes and they have uh, very disastrous consequences also. So these things one should always remember whenever we are talking with the patient, there is a fault, whether it is a faulty diet or whether she is bleeding from somewhere. These are the main important things during pregnancy. So whenever uh, we talk of iron deficiency anemia, it is just a tip of iceberg. That is one eight. And the unseen under the sea is around seven, eight cases. Uh, we cannot have the cause. We cannot find out the cause means uh, we have to find out what are the reasons for this iron deficiency anemia. So that's why we talk of latest catch at its inception. So we talk bara, bara, bara by bara. And uh, we always tackle the adolescent uh, population and uh, find out the cause of their anemia. So we know adolescent uh, for their dietary ha uh, habits and all those things. And these are the common symptoms and signs of anemia. All of us know patient can come with these symptoms like just a pallor and splenomegaly in, uh, if the patient has uh, comes from the endemic area of malaria. So all those signs and symptoms we know, but we have to find out what is the cause. So what are the complications? Why we are worried about this iron deficiency anemia, which can lead to a severe anemia during pregnancy, Dr. Ruchi? I, uh, whether Dr. Ruchi had joined? She's there, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for the question. Uh, it's not just about the severe anemia. It is related to its complications and not only complications in the mother, the complications are also attached to the fetus as well. So the, if we talk about the mother or the maternal side, so the complication can occur at three levels during the antenatal period, during the delivery, that is the labor time and after the delivery. So once the patient is pregnant and uh, she has severe anemia, there is always a poor weight gain and it is obviously associated with with other malnutrition and also by hypoproteinemia. There is a diminished immune response that leads to intercurrent infection. And this is a, the infection is not just the recent one. It can also flare up the pre-existing lesions and the infections. What happens in anemia in a severe case is that once the infection has occurred, there is going to be decreased erythropoiesis. This is going to lead again to anemia. So it's a vicious cycle between the infection and the anemia. More the anemia, infection, then again the anemia. So preterm labor is very common because of uh, low birth weight and multiparity and associated anemia. Uh, the very high risk problem is the congestive heart failure at 30 to 32 weeks of pregnancy. The patient becomes lethargic, weak, tired, so that leads to decreased work capacity. During labor, there is uterine inertia, though, as I said, uh, there can be a short, uh, uh, the 
the, the labor can be shortened because of the prematurity and the multiparity, but inertia is most commonly seen in these patients. Again, during labor, there can be uh, congestive heart failure. There is a, the patient cannot tolerate even the mild form of PP, yes. the postpartum hemorrhage. Postpartum hemorrhage. Yeah. So that leads to shock in these patients and uh, intolerability is there in these patients. Even a minor hypoxia can lead to shock and can be fatal if the patient has received anesthesia during cesarean section. The cesarean section rate is also high in anemic patients because for one kind of thing, whenever there's a severe anemia, it is seen that in later lab in the labor, there is non-reassuring fetal heart rate. The recent studies have shown up these things and it is also associated with other things. Uh, there's a decrease in Neotic fluid volume, so that leads to high risk of uh, cesarean section and interventions. In pupurium, there is pupural sepsis, uh, definitely the subinvolution. Then uh, the patient, it has to be monitored for uh, seven to ten days after the delivery has taken place because the high risk period. There are four high risk conditions associated with severe anemia. It is first at thirty to thirty two weeks, then at labor just after the delivery. And at, uh, in the pupillum period, up to seven to 10 weeks, actually congestive heart failure and sudden deaths have been reported during these particular times. And seven to eight, 10 days, the patient can also have pulmonary embolism. Uh, in fetus, fetal growth restriction, poor EBGAR score, recent studies have shown that we have, we talk about autistic spectrum disorders yeah. yes. so yes. associated with the uh, severe anemia, hyperactivity disorders or uh, deficit, uh, the attention deficit disorders of these children. Yeah. So uh, in a nutshell, these are the various complications we find uh, from anemia. And this, uh, we talked about erythropoiesis and for erythropoiesis, uh, we know that the iron is very important mineral for the hemoglobin, means heme and globin. So globin is a protein and heme. Uh, we are bothered about this iron deficiency. Why this iron is important? Dr. Supriya? Yeah, good evening, ma'am. And I really thank Dr. Krishna, madam, and Dr. Kiranamai, ma'am. Uh, for inviting me for this uh, wonderful webinar. Thank you very much. And I bring greetings to you all from Patna. So iron is one of the most important um, uh, nutrition. So, so it, uh, it usually we have, we have seen many cases of iron deficiency anemia because more, more than 50% you can uh, get in the uh, population, especially in India. And iron is very important because it has so many work to do. There are important functions that it performs in the body. It's a part of the hemoglobin and myoglobin. Then for the brain development and function, iron is required very much. It regulates the body temperature and muscle activity. Uh, it's a very good carrier or transport system for oxygen and cellular respiration. So iron has got many things to do in the body. So it is a very important part of uh, nutrition. So there are many sources of iron. We have got heme iron, non-heme iron. So iron is very important for the synthesis and um, for our nutrition. Yeah. Yes, Supri. And uh, there is a new revelation at role of hepcidin mediated regulation of iron uh, homeostasis. I'll not go into the detail of iron yeah. metabolism, yeah. Uh, yeah. but I, everyone knows this iron metabolism and how it uh, has got in circulation. And many things are required whenever we talk of erythropoiesis, not only iron, but there are various regulatory uh, molecules which are required, including vitamin B12, folic acid, okay. proteins, and all those things. So, mm -hmm. hepcidin is, again, a hormone which is released from the liver mm -hmm. that suppresses, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. these uh, these things, and th that's why we have, uh, again and again, realized what things go wrong, okay? Yes. So, this is very important, one should know. So, Dr. Bina, can you tell something about the iron requirements and what are the factors for its absorption? As we were discussing that many women, they tell that our diet is, we are eating so well. In spite of okay. that, we, uh, we see that a very obese uh, women, they are very anemic. Uh, they eat a lot, but uh, they are very anemic. So, what are the factors for this iron absorption? What are the iron requirements? 
these things can be highlighted means uh, one should know what should we eat and how and how and when we should eat yes now to meena you have to unmute yourself and uh, answer yeah are you able to hear Yes. Yeah, yeah, we are able to hear. Yeah. Thank you, Doctor Vidya. And uh, first, please accept my warm regards to all this packed team, Foxy, and very big thanks to Doctor Kenamai, who just made me the part of this virtual CME. Now I'll answer for your questions. The ideal dose of the iron, which required in the pregnancy, in the early pregnancy up to the twenty weeks, this is about two point five milligram per day. And twenty weeks to thirty-two weeks, it's about five point five milligram per day. And thirty-two to forty weeks, it's around six point eight milligram per day. Usually, what we recommended in our practice, we give the oral doses in the form of the two milligram of elemental iron to the patient. And usually the patients who are not uh, tolerate, not able to tolerate the iron, in those cases we also recommend the uh, IV iron. And the commonly used iron salts are the ferrous sulfate and ferrous fumarate, ferric salt, iron polymaltose complex, and carbonyl iron and colloidal ferric hydroxide. now the one thing is very important every patient we are recommended iron for anemia or for prophylactic we are giving the iron but the some of the patients they are not responding at all there are certain factors which actually the iron the loss of voice is there are you we can hear you dr bina Ah, yes. okay. There are certain factors which are the iron absorption enhancer, and the certain factors which are the inhibitors. Now I am talking about the enhancer, the heme form of the iron. This is the maximum absorbable uh, thing. The heme form of the iron is the better bioavailability, and it is absorbed in the ferrous form. Ascorbic acid is very very important. what we can do the patient when we are prescribing iron we can say just take the iron uh, half an hour to one hour before meal and she can take from the little bit of the orange juice or whatever that will be the much better option for the patient and fermented food it really enhances the iron absorption gastric acidity the patient who are having the very low level of the gastric acid they are or who are just very used to of uh, having the these uh, antacid in all that in those cases they are the very poor they are very uh, hard uh, chances to absorb uh, hard and difficulties in the absorption of the iron if iron absorption is very good if the iron stores are very low and the increase erythropoietic activity now i am talking about the certain inhibitors phytates is a very 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 uh, thing which is a uh, great inhibitor of the mineral absorption calcium tea and coffee and the certain other factors usually what we say jab bhi patient aata hai apan bolte hain aap doodh dahi mattha paneer sab kuch khao we never used to say don't take the paneer or dahi or doodh with the meal morning may we just prescribe the protein powder take the sprouts and the protein powder with the milk that should not be done that should not be done yes what do you say oh just take nuts khaiye aap khoob akrot badam ye have you ever thought the covering of the nuts is having the lots of phytates yes yes the yes. people now are they saying chia seed ye fancy food omega 3 but the consumption of chia seed and the phytates they are so horrible for the mineral absorption not only for iron for everything for zinc for everything so we should have we should take care of those things when yeah. we are prescribing the things we should tell the proper timing of the taking iron capsule what to have what to what is the combination of food that is most important yes the law yes. in this webinar we discuss all the things uh, i think the little little things are very applicable very. the patient ever yeah, yes yeah. the other doctor uh, dr mane told no no uh, dr tank bachcha pet mein se hi seekhta hai 
हम हर हर लेडी को बोलते हैं आप रामायण पढ़िए ब्ला 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 ये पढ़िए पर yes. हमने कभी ये नहीं बोला आप ये खाइए इसके खाने से बच्चे को ये असर होगा या थैंक यू डॉक्टर बीना इट इज जैसा तन वैसा मन वैसे ही जैसा अन्न वैसे ही मन सो इट इज ऑलवेज वॉट एवर वी ईट अन्न हे पूर्ण ब्रह्म वॉट एवर वी ईट या सो अन्न हे पूर्ण ब्रह्म बट दैट अन्न शुड बी फ्रेश एंड एज यू टोल्ड वेरियस कॉम्बिनेशन आर वेरी डेट्रीमेंटल फॉर द आयन एब्सॉर्शन दिस इज अ रूटीन वन केस वी हैव जस्ट put that any woman this woman uh, mrs and she has conceived following the treatment of primary infertility and she comes to you her hemoglobin is 4.8 and hematocrit was 18% okay she is in uh, her first trimester she has conceived so in first trimester hemoglobin is 4.8 uh, we will definitely supplement or you will decide for any uh, iron uh, supplementation but definitely you have to guide for her uh, nutrition as well so as you have told this animal origin whatever the heme iron is directly absorbed and non heme iron which is a vegetable origin it is absorption through various other factors uh, which you told about vitamin a uh, carotene or vitamin c so these are the various factors also uh, which uh, hinders the absorption so you told everything about the diet nutrition how uh, the combinations uh, we can have uh, for increase absorption so any if every panelist i want their contribution about the strategies to prevent anemia we are not going to discuss here about the diagnosis of anemia complications of anemia various iron salt but we are just concentrating about the nutrition part here today so i want the strategies to prevent anemia there was lot of uh, things discussed from the government policies but uh, what about uh, whenever the patient enters and patient is anemic uh, what advice you will give to her each one teach one so i want the uh, you all panelists to teach us uh, what all policies you take in your clinic and that advice we want to have to everyone yes madam i would uh, th- uh, say preconceptional treatment is very very important every woman who wants to get pregnant should come to doctor get her hb checked if yes. it is less than 12 we should yes. see what is the ca- what is causing her anemia and we should treat her accordingly whatever is deficiency is there we have to treat it and give her dietary suggestions if there is aub treat aub and yes. if there is helminthic infection give her anti helminthic treatment yes. if she has bleeding pile treat that so treating is very important and yes. uh, there are many stages in a woman's life when she needs extra nutrition like when she attains teen um, puberty that is the period she needs extra nutrition we have to give extra nutrition at that time and before thank pregnancy you. we have to give thank you thank yeah. you very much for uh-huh. your suggestions yeah anybody yeah, else i always in my practice whenever the patient comes the first thing i always tell them is the dietary uh, advices are given to them and uh, what to eat what not to eat and what to combine uh, with which food actually avoid tannins phytates and uh, when you are taking the iron tablets it is always better to take one hour or empty stomach in the morning or one hour before meal or two hours after the meal not during or do not combine it with the calcium calcium that is needed taken separately so it's a routine for me that i always say take calcium after 6 hours or 8 hours or yeah. the, during lunch and one thing after or uh, 2 hours after dinner or something like that and uh, one thing avoid over cooking of the food which is very important because yeah, that is yeah. going to kill all the nutrients which you are most of the nutrients which you wa- really want for this pregnancy and use iron vessels for mm-hmm. cooking that would be the best thing uh, just adapt these things yeah supriya so wants to tell something yes ma'am so right from the beginning i counsel them for the green vegetables fruits clean them properly and food fortification very important madam and helminthic control i take the history or i always counsel them for better food so this is all in all cases yeah. so you have and to the, put the charts as uh, we were discussing you have to put the chart which are the iron rich food what is there what they should eat and uh, uh, the dietary requirements of uh, daily how much is the required they will not know na so regular consumption of these green leafy vegetables uh, simple one banana or gava 
these things are very uh, rich uh, in uh, iron uh, and uh, definitely tea drinking many of the women they are in a habit uh, of uh, drinking yeah. tea yeah uh, dr vidya i usually uh, tell every patient one recipe of beetroot Mm. just grate the beetroot put the little bit the orange pieces with the dates and figs yeah that's so, a very good so story. you have a recipe chart also after um, day in your clinic that is very good and this is another uh, new thing that is iron from a lucky iron fish or as you told you have to cook in the iron vessel and this is a lucky iron fish you can just boil in the water for 10 minutes it will release a lo lot of iron in the water and that water you can use for cooking and there are various uh, things uh, they have taken up like food fortification and uh, like in rice in philippines which is fortified with iron sulfate mix then even wheat and maize they have also uh, uh, stored for a long time they have a metallic iron used in uk usa and uh, various iron uh, these are molecules like uh, iron ferrate that can be successfully it has been successfully fortified in condiments such as curry powder in south africa and sugar in guatemala so these things have been uh, tried and uh, we know about the various iron salts i am not going to discuss these uh, iron salts they are many and uh, recently they have uh, modified them also they have increased their absorption capacity all those uh, molecules we have we are not going to discuss because we are only concentrating on nutrition nutrition along with this iron supplementation definitely will lead us uh, for uh, defeating anemia so there are iron sprinklers Uh, they have also come in the market, and we know about the modification, dietary modification, iron supplementation, treatment of hookworm manifestation, control of malaria, iron supplementation in pregnant women. These things uh, definitely will take us a long way. Uh, so eat various green leafy vegetables. Uh, eat vitamin C rich food that will also help you in the absorption of iron. What are the challenges, uh, Dr. Shobha, in the management of iron deficiency anemia? And the most important thing is, as everybody suggest uh, told already, our food is very much rich in phytates, and so the absorption of iron is uh, delayed because of phytates. And uh, our ladies have a, a habit of taking coffee tea along with food, which also and decreases the absorption so it is very important to tell them all that and most yeah. of the times our iron uh, tablets cause a lot of gastric irritation so we uh, ladies usually don't take it they tell they take but they don't take it so yeah it but newer molecules have come up sucrosomal uh, ions they have come up so yeah. that can even be used in first trimester so most of the challenges what we face is one is finding the cause of anemia addressing the underlying cause and selecting the iron replacement product that meets the needs of the patient you have to counsel a lot even in uh, our place at villages they won't take this iron tablets they feel that the baby will grow and uh, that they will land up in cesarean so we have to do lot of counseling also whenever we are treating anemic patient so this is one chart you can put it at your clinic that is iron you the next slide Uh, and uh, i just want to add they will say the baby will become black black <laughs> also <laughs> yeah komal really so uh, we can put various colorful charts as uh, was suggested by various speakers so apna hemoglobin sthir rakhne ke liye nimn iron yukta aahar le so you can put this and uh, we have to tell them to cook in the iron pot eat well and uh, what are the complications uh, we have uh, already discussed about the anemia definitely they have to uh, take care of those uh, if they are anemic okay khane mein le vitamin c yukt aahar so this chart you can put and just be free from anemia One like that thing yeah. with the ma'am if you allow there is a thing which happens in our uh, uh, most of the cities is uh, the patients they walk barefoot and that yeah. is one of the most common cause for worm infestation that's what so, malaria and hookworm uh, worm infestation yes, yes. these two things uh, are most important they are the other causes of anemia and one thing is all anemias are not nutritional that nutritional that is also very important yes, always yes. we do only hemoglobin but a complete blood count should be done and you have to trace what is the cause so root cause of anemia is also very important to detect many times it doesn't 
respond date that can be a thalassemia or hemolytic anemia you have to find out so all the anemias also are not nutritional but whenever possible you have to start investigating uh, at uh, maybe you, it may not be available you can refer the cases to a higher uh, center if you cannot find the cause uh, so i'll hand over to dr komal uh, for uh, uh, other other causes of nutritional anemia so over to komal uh, she will discuss the further if she wants to share the um, slides later or uh, yeah, mr venkat uh, mr venkat because it is very difficult i'm sharing, to I'm sharing the screen so no, mr venkat no you can stop ha huh, you can stop no no i am only sharing the screen you are only no. sharing okay no problem thank so you so there is no problem so i think it was a fabulous discussion and the overview of anemia i think dr vidya has given it so well and we have spoken all panelists have contributed immense for iron deficiency anemia and uh, now we go a step ahead because we don't know that it is not only related to iron nutritional anemia has come like mixed and all so we have a case this is mrs fiona 22 year 19 week of uh, gravidus with abortion she suffers from chilosis gastritis glossitis on and off a very common thing in the you know uh, uh, not malnourished patient or something and whenever uh, she says yeah my hemoglobin is, was always between 9 or 10 it was never high or anything so uh, we know what, what what would be the work up for the iron or supplement so this would be our forte of discussion but before that uh, dr supriya i want you to address about acquired anemia so we spoke about iron deficiency but there are other mixed to the other varieties of anemia so, dr supriya yeah actually am <clears throat> one second yes supriya the yeah, dr supriya hello can you see hear me yes, yes i can hear you yes yes oh. yes okay one second i don't know Oops. screen madam can i tell but but yeah yeah, yeah hearing yeah, you we can listen are am i I can't hear actually. Okay, I, I can. We can hear you very well. Very well. So can okay, any, maybe someone else can take. Yeah, it. somebody else no, can I take. Take, madam. I will take. Yes. Yeah, we all know that uh, to know, make blood, we need many ingredients along with iron, like uh, folic acid, vitamin B12, vitamin C, zinc. vitamin d and uh, many proteins and other things so uh, this lady has a hemoglobin of 9 to 10% and she also has glossitis and uh, chilosis so maybe she has either folate deficiency or vitamin b12 deficiency folate is very much needed for dna synthesis so uh, whenever there is a folate deficiency it is similar to exposure to a ionization uh, like uh, the cells undergo same changes dna undergoes destruction as it uh, happens uh, when it is uh, having ionization uh, exposure so in these patient in these patients rbcs will be megaloblastic so they undergo uh, damage very fast they don't last for 3 months they get destroyed very early so these people will always have anemia of around 8 to 9% and even with only iron if you supplement only with iron they don't respond yes yes So we know this. Can I can I say? Yes. Ah, uh, you yes. asked me about acquired anemia. I still I can't hear you, but I want to answer. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, there are many types of acquired anemia. Not only the iron. Of course, iron deficiency is the most common. But then along with that, we get to see vitamin B twelve deficiency. In that case, also we uh, the iron absorption is uh, hampered. we in that case we get all that uh, partial or total gastro anomalies or those uh, taking portion pump inhibitors these things are there for with vitamin b12 then folate deficiency really impairs the um, yes uh, acquired anemia other you have autoimmune hemolysis then we have got so many of chronic diseases like chronic kidney disease leads to different type of uh, anemia those things are we usually say acquired anemias so here we have a different case with this so is it okay so these are the acquired types of anemias hello yes yes supriya yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> dr komal please unmute yourself ma'am okay uh, 
Dr. Supriya has covered it very well. And uh, now uh, I would ask Dr. Shobha uh, specifically about folic acid and B12 deficiency. I think whenever we talk about anemia in India, it is never solely an iron deficiency. It's always a mixed variety. You know, the folic acid deficiency is always existing. So uh, can you just talk about the folic acid B12 anemia? What are the causes and how do we prevent it? Shobha, uh, Dr. Shobha, this is for you, I think. Yes, yes, madam. Yes. Madam's voice was not uh, audible for me. <laughs> Folic acid deficiency is very common. Uh, as madam said, most of the times anemia is not just uh, iron deficiency. It is also associated with other nutritional deficiencies. In folic acid uh, and vitamin B12, both we see megaloblastic anemia. Uh, where the cells are uh, larger than usual. So in any case of anemia, it's very important to do a peripheral smear and see whether the cells are microcytic or macrocytic. Uh, it is usually associated, uh, folate deficiency is usually seen in... Uh, as uh, Madam told, uh, with nutritional deficiency, and also absorption uh, problems like uh, Crohn's disease and all. And even with uh, people with autoimmune disease also, we see folate deficiency and also uh, intake of certain drugs can cause uh, folate uh, deficiency. Yes, and we are re really worried about the folate deficiency because most of our neural tube defects or something congenital anomalies are related to folic acid. So when we talk about pregnancy, Supplementing a folic acid is something which we do it preconception, and it is a must. So uh, something which we should remember is that the folic acid deficiency along with iron is going to really go a long way in correcting that anemia than solely just giving iron. So iron and folic acid is the recommendation which is given universal even by our government. So we stick to it and we should also remember that uh, the uh, uh, neither the folate nor the folic acid is metabolically active. So both must be reduced to L-methyl folate, that is the predominant micronutrient form that circulates in the plasma. And that is involved in the biological process. So the L-methyl folate is a more active form and that is the preferred variant. So these are the dietary sources that is they said, but suppose somebody is taking a strict veg diet, they are more yeah. prone to the deficiency, uh, one having a chronic infection, and you know, even cooking too much, if you're cooking too much of the food, like overcooking, it will destroy the folic acid. Destroys, yeah. yeah. So that is something which we should uh, uh, take into account uh, when we are giving, uh, taking, taking our diet, when we want dietary modifications to improve the folic acid. Madam, your voice is not audible, madam. Komal, madam. Okay, sorry. It is cracking. It is cracking, Komal. It is cracking. I think I should. Actually, the... Now you can hear me. Yeah, now better, yeah. madam. Yeah, you know, I, I was using a headphones because I was in the hospital place. Mm -hmm. I think I will go on my laptop speaker. So, so when we spoke now about folic acid and everything, uh, let's uh, we. I think we have spoken about the absorption, about the way the folic acid deficiency is going to predominantly affect the DNA synthesis. Also, you know, and then it can lead to megaloblastic anemia, and definitely. With a cyanocobalamin deficiency, it can cause demyelination and neurological problems also. So there are a lot much is there is a relationship between cobalamin and folate deficiency. Yeah, one thing I just want to add: the people who are or the patients who are vegan or who are vegetarian, they are much more prone for the uh, vitamin B12 deficiency. Yes. So those patients we can easily promote to have the fermented trickles socket or kimchi it, it is easily available mm -hmm. or the little amount of the yeast yeast is a very very good source of vitamin b12 b12 yeah yes so little bit of the yeast the vegan or the vegetarian people they can have because uh, other source of vitamin b12 which we are taking the tablet that is not much beneficial and the injections are of no use the vegetarians can have this by taking of the little amount of the yeast or the fermented achar. Achar is very good, very good. Yes. in a very healthy way. Yeah, it has a probiotic property. You see no, that no, it's, it's having your... the vitamin B12 also, B12. maximum, yes. B12. 
Yeah. Yes. So you're talking about the absorption of nutrients. Like I have seen many food talks and all. Even doc, that uh, Rujuta Divekar, she just says to have an achar. I think it corrects the balance in your. You know the absorption no, no, no. of nutrients becomes. But better. this is also having the B B twelve for B twelve. We can right. have little bit the and the yeast. Yeast is very good. So we can tell the vegetarian uh, patients to have the little bit the yeast powder. Yes. I I know now that there there are certain companies which are manufacturing vegetarian meat. You know there are some food <laughs> fats. So there are so many food fats coming ma- market. <laughs> Wherein they are they are selling. I think some celebrities they are doing it and they are giving you all the uh, plant based or something in a in a like. Like a chicken tikka or some like non-veg uh, recipes. Even the holy is coming in our UP. We used to have that kanji ka pani. Kanji ah. ka pani is a very good source of vitamin B12. Yes, yes. yes. In both in folate and vitamin B12, B12. diet plays a very important role. In Karnataka, we have something called amli. We make it out of yeah, amli. Yeah, amli, right? amli. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, yes. We take amli. it along with the curds. It's curds. a very good source yes, of vitamin yes. B12. So I think I, we should learn our traditional food habits better. Exactly. Yes. Totally, yes. I get it. I think the traditional food habits of combining the two are yes. actually yes. made to balance, you know, the nutrients. So I think we should go in a traditional. And every region has their speciality, wherein okay. we talk about folate, folic acid, and B12. Because it almost seems like in our region, we can even have. Yes. Yes. Yes, <laughs> Doctor Kiran. Yes, it's too late. Actually, are we concluding? Actually, yeah, we yeah, all yeah. are enjoying it, now. Yeah, I think we are overshooting the time. Uh, just about forty-five minutes is over. Okay, so let's. Uh, I, I think we have spoken about B twelve also. Let's <laughs> conclude faster. Okay. Yeah, sure. And uh, uh, we can just uh, switch in because B twelve. We know that we need to supplement the. Uh, we need to do dietary modification and supplementation. That is the key of treatment. Uh, anybody can talk about vitamin D and role of hemopoiesis, Dr. Priyanka. I think this yes, is see something you, which is not discussed. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am, for this question, ma'am. Uh, the role of vitamin D has recently come up in the uh, def- uh, nutritional anemia. Basically, what vitamin D is doing is uh, it is decreasing the pro-inflammatory cytokines in our body, and it's a which suppresses basically the hepcidin mRNA transcription. So this is what actually leading to uh, it decreasing the erythropoiesis and decreasing the erythropoietin hormone. So I, when we give vitamin D, it gives anti-inflammatory uh, properties, and so this uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines decreases and the amount of hepcidin increases. Basically, if we say hepcidin or ferroportin axis, it acts on it, this. So that was uh, very beautifully described in your slide in the initial introduction part. Yes, yes, yes. Hepcidin was discussed very well, and I think uh, as majority of the Indians, you know, when we do our vitamin D testings, most of them will come deficiency. So yes, I think ma'am. this is the uh, uh, inherent inside cause which is causing an ineffective erythropoiesis. Yes, ma'am. And one of in chronic diseases as well, due to deficiency of vitamin D, uh, also it ha- yes. helps in chronic diseases as well. This yeah, and pregnancy D. and lactation. What we recommend is the uh, uh, fifteen uh, fifteen hundred to two thousand international uh, units, units per day. That is the re- requirement. So we just move ahead, and these are the food which are rich in vitamin D. I think everybody knows. Even I think now nutrition is so well. Vitamin A also has a role, Doctor. Renu, just add in uh, a few points. I think we are winding up in next two minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, vitamin A also it is quite important in the iron metabolism as it helps in the enhancement of growth of the cells and it ha- it improves your immunity as well and it helps in the mobilization of iron stores from the tissues. As we have discussed initially, also vitamin A helps in the absorption of uh, non heme. with um, source of iron like vegetables because heme source of iron it is absorbed directly but non heme source of iron it needs certain things like vitamin c vitamin a for the absorption so uh, vitamin a also is very good uh, i mean nutrient we should add in the diet of the patients and this uh, we can get from uh, many foods like uh, we can get from the carrots and we can get from the Uh, I mean, many uh, iron supplements also they have this sort of thing in the vitamin A is there in that. 
Yes, thank you. Thank you for highlighting that vitamin A will definitely increase the absorption uh, faster than only giving iron. And Dr. Bina, just uh, a few seconds on zinc or and vitamin yeah, C. Yeah, zinc, zinc is very important because uh, it's a cofactor for many enzymes which are used in the iron metabolism. And the vitamin C, as it is immun immunity booster as well as ascorbic acid, which really needs for the maximum absorption of iron. Yes. I think vitamin C is something which we definitely recommend our anemic patients to take iron along with vitamin C, I think, this, uh, or iron along with the lemon juice or something. So vitamin C is definitely going to enhance the absorption of iron. Definitely. So with that, I think uh, we can wind up. We will not talk about dosage and supplements. Uh -huh. and we all know the food items. I think the whole uh, today day has been discussed with uh, lovely preparations of food and the whole platter has been set today. So uh, uh, about proteins, I know proteins are important, but I think uh, anemia with a nutritional deficiency along with protein is also really, really common. So when we are correcting our nutrition, we should never forget protein and adequate protein is really, really very important. So I think we'll just uh, go uh, conclude it. Copper, riboflavin, all I think micronutrients have a role because when we target nutrition, we have to give it as a whole and uh, we can individualize the patient also try to arrive at a diagnosis, whether it is a nutritional anemia, whether it is other form of anemia, but diet for a pregnant patient is the most important one. Important. Eat healthy and eat balanced diet. And a tiranga thali, I think the thali which Dr. Uh, the thali was, is very cute. So very that cute. was the best thali. So that I think best thali. that was a thali which shows you how much portion of each to take. You know, that is really, really very important when we have a uh, we have it in that format, that proportion of every food in our diet is very important. And in this also, when we have talk about greens, the greens should be the more than your white uh, and the orange second and then the white. The carbohydrate content should not be the high in your meal because Indian diet is more carbohydrate uh, oriented. So with that uh, note that eat right, stay fit, stay healthy. And health is a result of investing in good nutrition. And we all strive to be healthy and let everybody be healthy. And with that, I conclude the panel and I thank Dr. Shanta Kumari, Madam, uh, Dr. Madhuri Patel, uh, Dr. Krishna Kumari, Dr. Kiran Mai for organizing such a lovely, lovely, lovely. Uh, it was real a treat, you know. And we felt like uh, we <laughs> spoke so much about food and uh, we are like, like it's like uh, uh, really, really <laughs> meeting each other. I think I am getting that gastronomic feeling of being in Hyderabad. Uh, with food. <laughs> so I think it was lovely what you have planned. So thank you so much for inviting me. I thank Dr. Vidya uh, It was a real pleasure uh, moderating a panel of, on nutrition today. And thank you all the lovely panelists who have been so active, you know, and sharing their experience, small, small things, what you have added into the panel is really going to take a long way when we try to advise dietary to our patients in our clinical practice. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank Dr. You, thank, thank you, Dr. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, all the panelists. Thank, thank you. And thank a you big thanks much. to Dr. Kirna, Yes, yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Vidya and Dr. Komal, you have made it entirely different. We have had it nutritional anemia so many times. Yeah. That you have brought yes, the yes. We have just made nutrition, you know. Yeah, yeah. We have not added anything. <laughs> yeah. So, anemia very is so practical. practical. Yeah. Everything was just very practical. Just wanted to focus only on nutrition. So yeah. I think, and all the panelists have done the wonderful job. Kiran, my... Yeah, madam. Thank you. Thank, thank, you, thank, you, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very I think much. we are not... I finished before it. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you Dr. Komal and Dr. Vidya, ma'am. Thank, thank you, Dr. Vidya. Thank you. the time you like doing injustice. Yeah. And so much is there to cover, but still, uh, thank you again. Thank you, Dr. Kirna, my. Thank you, Dr. Kiran. Thanks a lot for inviting. Bye bye. Yeah, bye. bye. Thank you. Thank you. So now again, uh, another very, very interesting session we, which we added for quest series. Uh, this is favorite of Krishna, madam. Uh, she was the one who has put this segment into this quest series, the scientific research article. So again, this is the third time that we are uh, doing. So for this, I hand over to Krishna, madam. Madam, you have again very two uh, very important and wonderful uh, speaker and uh, moderator for this.
Over to you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kiran. I think I should thank Vidya Komal and all the panelists for the wonderful job they have done. They made it so interesting. I don't know, today, the, in, in spite of it, just food, food everywhere, but not food enough to eat. So I think it's like we should we have such a restricted notion of what to eating, what to, uh, what to eat, uh, that uh, I don't know how much we can connect with our patients regarding uh, uh, the same, hopefully. Uh, this uh, will help us to balance what we eat, how we talk to the patients and what we exactly advise our patients. Thank you very much for Thank the you. panel. And I think we'll move on to the uh, something which is very much uh, close to my heart, the article review. And uh, uh, and uh, actually when we were quite uh, surprised by others when we and when I read this uh, topic on nutrigenomics and nutrigenetics, I never knew that there's a difference between nutrigenomics and uh, uh, nutrigenetics. There is a difference. And uh, for that, I have we have uh, Dr. Shehla Jamal, a young uh, obstetrician and gynecologist who's going to talk to us. And for this session, I would like to invite Dr. Meena Saman to moderate the session. She, we all know, is a senior consultant and HOD department of OBGYN GYN, Holy Family Hospital. And she has been the chairperson of, uh, she's a chairperson of Foxy Clinical Research Committee. And very appropriately, she is going to moderate this session. She's also been the secretary general ISOPAP, executive committee member, partner of OBGYN. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Krishna Kumari. Uh, thank you, Dr. Meena. It would be wonderful. I know you would make it very interesting. Please take it over from here. And uh, um, uh, Dr. Shaila slide yeah. in the introduction. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Meena will introduce Dr. Okay. Shaila. Okay. okay. Thank you. So, uh, uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Shanta Kumari, Dr. Krishna, and Dr. Kiran Mai for you know including me in this program. And uh, we've been hearing about nutrition all along. And now we have something called nutrigenomics and genetics. And, you know, the topic itself sort of gives you goosebumps. But let me assure you, by the time we've heard Dr. Shela, we'll realize how interesting it is. And to introduce Dr. Shela, can I have a slide, please? So she's one of the uh, very dynamic uh, I can say young dynamic leaders we have. She's associate professor in RMRI Bareilly, founder president Society of Menstrual Disorders and Hygiene Management, chief editor, journal of reproductive and menstrual sciences. I mean, she has many publications in national and international journals, contributed chapters. And like I can say, and not count all her rewards, but I can say she is a leader of tomorrow. Whether award or no award, we're going to see her for a long, long time. So over to you, Dr. Shela. Thank you so much, Meena ma'am, for those kind words. Thank you so much, Kiran, my ma'am, and Krishna Kumari ma'am for giving me this opportunity. And thank you so much for all the respected and esteemed faculty for staying uh, till last for this uh, particular session. So I would like to take permission to share my slides. Uh, Ma'am, are they visible? Yeah. Yes, yes. Make it a slideshow. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Okay. So thank you so much. Hello is very informal, but yes, a warm hello. I'm Dr. Sharon. Welcome to my article review, which in itself will be a very different kind of review. Uh, Krishna, ma'am, I searched thoroughly for all the articles they were so different i couldn't find one single article to present my views on that and as you already said it will it has given goosebumps certainly it has and it has given chills down the spine also to know so much is happening about food so let us start with the hippocrates who long long before said that leave your drug in the chemist pot if you can heal the patient with food and wow, verily, today also it stands the acid uh, test of the times. Till now, what was our concept of food and health? Let's start very quickly. Beta khana khalo. So the, all the love has been poured through the food into the family. But we all know this also that eating more leads to obesity, hypertension, eating less leads to nutritional deficiencies. And he may have us talked about right now. We all know green vegetables are rich in nutrition. Good diet means balanced diet. 
and our common villain is junk food and fruits are dry fruits are believed to be superfoods ancients were also quite sure about the hot and cold cold properties of certain foods they believed that some foods do uh, are passed through a breast milk which can have deleterious effect on the infant they believed healing benefits of haldi and milk although there was no formal research in that and they warned us against certain food combinations which should not be had and we were like laughing over them so what has uh, differently and what has changed now all of a sudden it's a huge paradigm shift about belief research and insights into nutrigenetics and nutrigenomics if we go through research articles we have huge number of research published in different journals over past 11 years if we look at country wise research on nutrigenomics or nutritional sciences united states takes the lead and nobody is you know even uh, close to them in researching this particular thing and india is still a baby when we talk about research articles associated with nutrigenomics and nutrigenetics so the learning objectives for today's session will be to understand relation between nutrition and genetics to compare nutrigenomics and nutrigenetics and to know what is meant by personalized medicine and why it is important so nutritional genome is a title which encompasses nutrigenomics which means the study of different how they study uh, how different foods can interact with particular genes to increase the risk of diseases such as type 2 diabetes obesity heart disease and some cancers whereas nutrigenetics explores how genetic makeup of a particular individual coordinates his or her response to various dietary nutrients confused let us make it make it clear so suppose we have a guest at 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 her house and suppose this lady with a red wine in her hand is our guest right so this guest has affected the behavior of other people in the house you know we are behaving we are smiling we are sitting in living room we are not talking to each other rather we are interested in entertaining her more so this is how this food has expressed this uh, sorry affected alteration uh, uh, or expression of these genes how they will behave right when we talk of nutritional genetics it is the interaction between these house people see they decided that they will not have food right now they decided that they will not watch tv right now they decided that yes let us make this guest more comfortable so this is how these genes are interacting amongst themselves and this is what nutrigenetics is so now i think uh, with this example we are pretty clear how, what is the difference between nutrigenomics and nutrigenetics let us catch up a few more words which are important epigenetics it is the study of changes in organisms caused by changes in gene expression rather than changing their genetic code so easy give some drug give some food give anything which leads to change expression of genes then comes phytochemicals which is mother of nutraceuticals and phytonutrients so phytochemicals are biologically active compounds found in plants they may be poisonous they may be medicinals also so from that we form nutraceuticals these are products which other than nutrition are also used as medicines and it is essentially coming from food and phytonutrients these are phytochemicals having positive effects on our body and it does not necessarily mean that we are consuming that thing from food it may be extracted say from some root we are not uh, consuming that root in our food form and thus we are using that extract to uh, give benefits to our body so it is analyzing the effect of bioactive food components which may be nutrient or non nutrient on gene expression it seeks to examine these dietary signatures in a specific cells so diet is modifying genotype which is affecting phenotype and thus resulting in certain health or disease condition so let us make ourselves more clear with this regarding phenotypic variations so uh, this particular thing is coming from paleolithic age and this hunk is from our age how it has changed so huge science huge research says that a huge change of a gross change in paleolithic diet and modern diet see the composition of carbohydrates how it has changed we blame india that indian diet is composed of carbohydrates no the whole planet has adopted something very different we have changed ourselves and thus we have changed our looks so that is one thing second is chronic diseases over not they uh, happening earlier they were happening earlier also but our genes are also 
maturing and mutating. Thus, we are expressing a different kind of response to the stress, uh, stressors to the food nutrients that we are consuming. So we see this Indian study, diabetic subjects in India were close to 30 million in 2000 and expected to rise to 80 million by 2030. So careful we must be. Estimated mortality from CHDs is also expected to rise in leaps and bounds. So uh, one short example regarding this is when we I have identified this gene, ep a2, which is cool when it is exposed to low saturated fats. But as soon as it is exposed to high uh, saturated fatty acid diet, there is huge increase in weight, obesity, and thus the consequences of uh, uh, obesity like hypertension and diabetes. So emergence of omic science, which determines nutrient intake, which affect genomics, which affect DNA, RNA and protein uh, expression and thus metabolite expression and thus we are having disease either prevention or having a disease and positive health outcome. So this nutrigenomics that is a part of omic science is exploring nutrient intake, intake which is identifying which nutrient or which food particle or phytochemical is causing disease thus changing it and stopping it and pausing it, it over there so that we prevent that particular disease and bring about positive health outcome. So that is the whole idea of understanding nutrigenomics. We all know malnutrition, you know, deficiency diseases are caused and since time and ages, we have been knowing about them. So what about uh, like deficiencies malnutrition, overnutrition. So we should understand that we have an optimum dietary dose. Neither a low dietary dose nor a high dietary dose is doing good to us. So we are supposed to have this nutrium along with us so that we take uh, the good benefits from our diet and the positive effects are exhibited. So this nutrium should be coordinating with genome to produce effects and thus deficiency of this nutrium may cause disease and vice versa also. Fetal malnutrition, uh, Parikshit sir has already talked about it. We know Barker's hypothesis and we, when we dissect environmental cues, we know nutritional state takes the lead role on the stage. So nutritional state has to be optimal if we expect that this genotype is an optimum phenotype when the uterus, uh, sorry, fetus is growing inside the uterus. Carcinogenesis, we are fascinated about exploring roles, but let me stick to female cancers, uterine, cervical, and breast cancer. And even this thing, uh, this thing has been new even to me right now. So uh, what is on the block? What can we do about exploring this much? We know about curcumin, haldi. As I said earlier also, uh, ancients knew, knew about them. So when we talk of cancer cervix, HPV, and the uh, in, uh, like effects, and it is affecting its carcinogenetic effects by E6 and E7 protein expression. So it is inhibiting these, thus CS cervix prevention. Second is it inhibits MMP2 and MMP9, which are associated with endometrial cancer. And it is inhibiting P53 independent pathways, which are non-signatured and thus cause apoptosis in ovarian cancer cells. So, wow, if we consume haldi, we can prevent all these cancers which are killing millions of females. So, when we put these two keywords, phytochemicals and cancer, your laptop will be hacked with the amount of data that internet gives you. So, another uh, like a food, party, uh, food uh, uh, phytonutrients coming from chili and pepper, green tea, other beverages, tomatoes, and other medicinal plants, they prevent cancer. The problem is, aren't we consuming haldi? Aren't we eating these green vegetables and whatnot, whatnot? Then why are we having cancer? So go back to that nutrium concept. We all are genetically designed to respond in a particular way to that amount of nutrition that we are consuming. So some people say, for example, me, I'm genetically predisposed to exert a positive and protective, uh, like derive a protective benefit from the amount of haldi that I'm consuming daily in my food. But XYZ person is not genetically designed to exhibit or derive that positive benefit from that amount of haldi, maybe pinch, pinch, whatever we use. So that is why that XYZ can have cancer. 
So this is how we have to understand and how we can modify XYZ's response through genetic modification or other intervention so that she does not develop these cancers. Oh. Right, so interesting. So we can predict individuals response to certain risk or interventions. We can see susceptibility Die. to environmental toxins and thus develop diseases and track inheritance of familial and genetic disease and it can form future of heart disease, diabetes and cancer. So personalized nutrition, um, Uday sir talked about that. It is a diet. Uh, he talked about having a nutritionist and it will be an awesome concept if we have a nutritionist who is trained to get genotypic type of diet designed for us. So they can take in account into our, uh, our genotype nutrition requirement and other factors like age and gender. So it is going to bring a boom in our healthcare scenario. Nutrigenetics, yes, the genes, how are they interacting? And it, it serves the platform to explain allergies, intolerance, and certain malabsorptions that we are dealing with. So the main thing that we have to understand when we are trying to understand nutrigenetics is single nucleotide polymorphism. And this is one single thing which is setting apart Krishna Kumari ma'am from uh, Kiran Mai ma'am, from <laughs> Simina Samant ma'am from me. So these are the uh, polymorphisms which are exhibiting the differences that makes us individual. So when they are changed, when they are affected, disease do occur. And gender is a very, very important variant changing disease patterns associated with SNPs. If we see a single nucleotide polymorphism, classic example is MTFHR gene, right? If we have this variant C6770, colon cancer, spina bifida, oral cleft, these complications of pregnancies can occur. But if it is a variant which is named as A1298C, only spina bifida and leukemia are predisposed. So we have to look, not every MTFHR gene genetic mutation will have complications of pregnancy, which we know preeclampsia, hypertension, IUGR and whatnot. So we have to target our therapy based on this variant. So if we find out variant, which is the baby of uh, nutrigenetics, we can find out what we have to treat. So it is also having certain role, like if we determine the genotype based on single nucleotide polymorphism, we can identify the genes and thus we can prevent these diseases because we know now that this particular genotype person will be having more response for inflammatory conditions. Thus target uh, therapies can be designed. So single gene disorders, classic examples, sickle cell disease, we know fetal hemoglobin goes to sleep after a child is born. But if the patient is having sickle cell disease and sickling episodes are occurring and we are giving hydroxyurea butyrate, what we are doing? We are sort of awaking that fetal hemoglobin that produce it more so that sickling, uh, sickle cell hemoglobin is diluted and sickling episodes are stopped. So Lactose intolerance, I would like to bring kind attention of the esteemed audience towards this. Lactose intolerance, see if a person is having lactose intolerance, she will not have milk and dairy product. And if we are uh, like all lacto lactose tolerant, we will be having uh, adequate dairy uh, mineral intake, which will make us uh, non-osteoporotic and it will make uh, uh, have reduced chances of bone fractures in us. Thus, lactose intolerant people have increased risk of osteoporosis and bone fractures. So that is one important thing that we have to remember. Newborn screening, especially for congenital uh, hypothyroidism, aging. Now we all dread that wrinkling, kisko chahiye nahi chahiye, osteoporosis nahi chahiye. So nutrigenetics is a concept which understands these proteomic expression. And if we apply it intelligently, we can have a healthy aging also. So this is the number of CHD obesity and cancers which can be prevented by wise application of nutrigenetics, maybe in future. And especially for us, process becomes easy when we have something to look for, menopause and perimenopausal women, pregnancy and newborns and have personalized nutrition so that we stop it. We stop at epigenetic level so that disease are not expressed only. So thank you so much. That was all for today. And for question, I would like to hand over the dice to Meena Samant, ma'am. That was a really great, uh, Dr. Shela. We all are born with our own sets of genes. 
yet we have the capacity to certain extent you know to modify you know we can make some positive effect by suppressing the genes which are doing harms and which can act we can activate some of the genes which can do good to our body and that's how nutrition come in, comes into play and you have tried to simplify it telling us how in certain kinds of genetic this thing which nutrition will have a positive effect what we can do to avoid the negative effect of our genes so epigenetics is important we are they say we are what we eat and like what dr uday thanawala said we are what our mothers ate when they were pregnant so our it's not just the genes but it's the epigenetics also which we can modify i i think these are exciting times where a lot of uh, you know uh, work is being done to understand uh, how the both environment and our genes they work together yeah our ancestors like i think dr um, uh, i'm forgetting somebody just mentioned in the chat box our ancestors knew and this program it goes by the name quest and actually it is that quest of that knowledge and the mystery behind all that that we are after and i think in times to come we'll be a lot more wiser thank you dr shella that was a wonderful presentation and you try to simplify and you know to take us uh, to the depth and the breadth of the subject which is sort of new to most of us thank you thank you ma'am yes has kind of demystified yeah. and really thank related. you thank you dr shehla it was really 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 fascinating listening to you and uh, really loved your the way you brought the try to make it as simple as possible and uh, make us understand the difference between all of this and always we have been wondering if when personalized uh, yeah, personalized when comes on because yeah, we are talking about personalized care in malignancies so now we know that we can bring in the personalized care even for our neonates that's very very important lot of uh, research in uh, nutrition and anti cancer uh, uh, diets and all like yes, yeah. we have heard everything in relation to cancers but uh, i think uh, the concept of bringing it forth for uh, uh, the issues fetal issues you know that's very very useful and i i think we are really i loved your talk thank you and Thanks, of course dr yeah. shela Nina, shela yeah dr shela shela, shela jamal is always a uh, person of difference yes. she brings us uh, something different than others yeah. thank and uh, she brought the although I've, i i we thought of an article review but the way she brought out i think this is more useful to us yes, other than uh, knowing our reading an article in this particular aspect because the knowledge regarding this particular topic is so less so we are very yeah. happy that yes, you brought it out a that. kind of a uh, you know wide topic and she has she has really done justice to it yeah, meanwhile we, before 2 3 years one japanese scientist got nobel prize for this yeah, fasting nobel therapy prize. and nutrition and the fasting therapy he says in the summary in his case that 23 days or 24 days a year having a proper fasting not having itna sa bada sabudana itna alu and everything that is not fasting that is over eating but proper fasting with this three uh, these uh, 23 days or 24 days a year will prevent uh, 57 to 67% from uh, cancer developing cancer and that is given in old ayurveda that is ekadashi yes. uh, only 23 ekadashis are there in one year so having a fast on ekadashi is uh, equal to that japanese scientist who got nobel prize first thing and second so thing he has given ran, it is not continuous it is random it is in between yeah obviously obviously okay. yes so he he told you 23 days not in continuation it is random basically and the nutrition part he has also given so good things today we have discussed all the things and uh, it is uh, good that we are going back to our basics indian uh, food is always yeah indian food is always better Uh, than the whole world because we are uh, enough with our food we don't need any medicine or any drug our food has got our own uh, uh, medicine properties first thing and second thing our body is there to cure everything but we don't give time our to our body to cure and that can be done with the nutrition thank you thank you very much actually according to tradition in ek anaik ekadashi day you don't eat anything 
Yes, but obviously. the next day, Dwadashi day, you eat only green leafy vegetables, which yes, are rich in folate and vitamin yes, B12. It is, it so is you true. get all the doses needed. Yeah, and seasoning. Basically, fasting to heavy meals, it is seasoning. Yeah, we are stepping we down the Post fasting. Shivaratri also, we do that. We don't... Yes, uh, yes, 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 correct. Before the change of any season, there are Navaratras. They are also for fasting because correct. your body correct. gets adjusted to new season. Yes. That is the scientific basis yeah, of all our... Delicacies in every region and yes and so, what sela ma'am told now just now it is given in ayurved all the yeah. nutrition facts yeah curcumin right. and all everything mm. everything everything yeah, yeah. dr shela last time also for menstrual year also you had done very well presented so this time also very nice way of presentation everybody liked it and she was scientist basically from foxy mm. yes so actually the Thank three you. talks, the past two also, we had uh, really young, wow. wonderful uh, presentations. I we remember actually this is coming up really well, ma'am, this segment of article. Yeah. yeah. Thank, Thank you. you, Thank you. Madam, uh, you were busy, but still you joined us today. Mm -hmm. And I thank uh, all the, I mean, our guests of honor. It was so 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 uh, you know inspiring to listen to both of them today shanta madam madhuri madam also and the entire uh, foxy team our vice presidents dr B uh, basab and dr bipin and all the faculty all the six speakers of the fast track and the chairpersons and then the three uh, very important talks by very senior foxians uh, and then the wonderful panel that we had and the scientific uh, research article uh, today, many we have we are getting a lot of uh, feedback and responses from so many uh, groups and people that it was wonderful. So thank you all once again. Uh, I have gratitude and thank you Shanta Madam and Foxy for uh, giving us this opportunity to be conveners for this quest series. Krishna Ma'am. Yeah. yeah, thank you. I think uh, somehow we, the quest was started because there was no, suddenly the COVID, uh, the third wave has come and nobody could, uh, I mean, we couldn't meet in person. After the indoor program was postponed, then only we thought of this quest and uh, I'm, I'm so happy that it is going on. It went very wonderfully well. And uh, I think uh, today I'm really happy. Like you said, I echo what all you have said uh, uh, Kiran, I think we have taken a long time. We shouldn't uh, spend more of uh, other people's uh, time. We value your time very much. Thank you all so much. Thank you, faculty. Thank you, our guests. And most importantly, thank you, delegates. And we hope that we could add something to the everybody's, uh, the whole uh, faculty has added to your uh, uh, knowledge. Thank Not you. Knowledge and thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Krishna Kumar and Kiran. Me. It was a really wonderful. wonderful never event. thought that nutrition will come out yeah. so yeah. well. It, it is always well. Uh, it is always. It is always a different aspect, and really, Shaila has put in. I had heard uh, Dr. Sanjay Gupta talking on uh, this topic, but this is another journal she presented. It was very wonderful one. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, the whole Foxy team, uh, Dr. Shanta Kumari, Dr. Madhuri Patel, all the VPs, and mainly it was the effort of Dr. Krishna Kumar and Kiran May. They brought in so many uh, nice faculties in, and uh, the interaction was so good. It was really nice. Yes, so, ma'am, you expressed all our feelings. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes, thank, you. thank you. Thank you so much for sitting to the best. All the best. Yeah, yeah. Waiting for the next Foxy. Yes, ma'am. Next Foxy. Next Foxy uh, people. In yeah. the... All the best to all of us, I think. And so yeah. good that you could join finally. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I answer only for a brief time. I, I could. Yeah, yeah, and just, just out of interest, I'll tell one thing that uh, in uh, World Forum, now they are treating the Alzheimer's disease with the coconut oil. Yes. It is yes. on the... Coconut oil is a new thing, sir. They are cooking. I not know. new thing, ma'am. We are using since 5,000 years. I know, no, no. But again, people have, we have avoided it saying it as... Fat high fat cholesterol. Fat high fat cholesterol. Fat because fat. they wanted to promote the soybean oil and the, their, uh, uh, what fat that, uh, olive fat. oil. So fat. they decided that. It is not in fat. It is a no, unsaturated um, fat. It is very safe for uh, human beings. Mm.
but we need to have a tailor made uh, nutritional uh, this thing for each person i think no i think <laughs> the whole problem is because we in india are not presenting enough papers yes yeah. uh, so mm -hmm. if we have uh, present our papers brief else brief, says that the curcumin is good or yeah put in our stamp in the international world saying what we are doing is right agreed and agreed like yes yes because correct, the correct. numbers are huge we are our numbers are huge they they in america basically what they have the, given the huge number no, of papers they are uh, pharma company motivated people all the papers maximum papers are pharma motivated company people sure. one time they will say that almonds are good uh, maybe after having all profit they will say that almonds are not good now they are started saying that the cholesterol is good for health and uh, since 50 years they were saying that cholesterol was bad for health likewise they do and they present the papers mm -hmm. i know we are lacking there it should, it should not be pharma driven true yeah obviously yeah. Yeah. we have to i mean uh, take the grain from the husk and then take what is real thank you ma'am thank, thank you ma'am thank, thank, thank you great thank, thank you, you and thank you all good night thank you sir good night namaste okay. Namaste. 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 You are so busy yet you stayed throughout the webinar. Ah, that's surprising. <laughs> yeah. It's like you all went to the webinar. You are there everywhere and still you sat through the whole program. I'm surprised. No, nutrition is my very favorite topic basically. Nice. Nice. <laughs> thank, nice. You, thank, thank you ma'am. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.